is not just financial burden, but they result in the disability of our patients. If we treat them quite well and diagnose properly, uh, the disability will go down and our patient will uh, recover. I wish you uh, very fruitful work, uh, hot discussions, exchange of experience, uh, their presentation of difficult cases where we won or we didn't win because uh, the exchange of experience allows us to improve the treatment of our patients. I'd like to say that despite the fact that this pandemic of COVID-19 introduced some changes in our life, mostly we are online in our communication, but there are some advantages. We can be at the same place at the same time, be at different conferences and to listen to different distinguished, revered professors uh, and uh, doctorate holders, international professors. It was not possible before when you are in one place and you have to uh, visit different conferences and it was not possible. IT technologies allow to do this. I hope that today we will have and we can listen to uh, listen to our colleagues, we can uh, exchange our experience. I wish everybody a very good day, good mood, good health. We are waiting for you here in St. Petersburg. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, we are opening the scientific program of our conference. With great pleasure, I introduce the first talk of co-chair of uh, the committee of our conference to the professor Yelena Kornienko, the senior children specialist on gastroenterology and endoscopy of St. Petersburg. 
Good morning, dear colleagues. I'm very happy uh, to this distinguished day, uh, the Day of Protection of Children, to start this conference talking about children-related problems, children IBD diseases. In gastroenterology, is uh, the most uh, hazardous problem. The number of children is going up. The slide shows the date of new cases in absolute figures. For 20 years that we have been following up uh, children suffering from Crohn's disease at a blue line and rose line ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis has the tendency to the growth, but quite moderate. Crohn's disease is going up rapidly. During the last 10 years, the number of children with IBD has increased fivefold, and it uh, correspond to Western country data. The incidence rate of adolescents and children amounts to 10 per uh, 100,000, and the same figures uh, correlates with European figures. In children, IBD has more severe course comparing to adults, and mortality during the 20 years uh, of those who manifest the disease in childhood three times higher comparing to those who uh, didn't have IBD. All in all, we see the increase in IBD in children. We should point out that uh, uh, this disease has become younger. During 10 years, we have seen uh, the increase in IBD in very young, early manifestation. And the same is true throughout the world. Uh, their growth uh, uh, in children before 10 years of age is higher by threefold, and after 10 years of age, uh, the figure has increased twofold. It amounts 7% per year in children before 10 years of age, but older 10 years of age, uh, the growth of incidence rate of the disease to 2.5%. We see the disease has become younger, has become more severe, and we have seen this in our patients. What's the difference between those who develop the disease in young age, before six years of age? Uh, we use the term IBD with very early onset. And the specificities for ulcerative colitis it's always fatal, it's always severe. In children at this age, children may have intact rectum, and the activity of the disease we may see proximally, and even we can see backwash ileitis. And specific antibodies, nuclear uh, antineutrophil cyt cytoplasmatic cells, we can see only in 10% of children. For Crohn's disease, it's also typical to have the involvement of the colon, uh, and it made it difficult to give diagnose between the ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Endoscopically, in the very, in very beginning, they may look similar. In children in early age, we can see a very uh, rapid development of anemia, the loss of uh, protein. Uh, the retardation of growth and all in all more severe cause of the disease. And also specific uh, antibody saccharomyces we can see quite rarely, not more than in 10% of children. When we are talking about IBD, uh, they manifest differently. Uh, this phenotypic landscape may be very different. It speaks about the fact that mostly in the uh, background of this disease, there may be some uh, different factors combined together, hyperinflammation, autoimmunity, immunodeficiency, and this heterogeneity in phenotype and mostly heterogenic uh, of genes uh, that are in the basis of this disease made this disease difficult. 
at the edging uh, the great number of genes that predispose to the development of IBD among those there are genes that predispose mostly to the development of Crohn's disease to ulcerative colitis or to the both uh, these genes are regulated mostly uh, by immune function they regulate regeneration of epithelium epithelium barrier and uh, the activity of the inflammatory reactions as well as inflammatory stress what can be changed in different mutations where no we according to the certain program more than 3000 children with ibd uh, it this work was finished in 2009 we found out five unique local loc loci and these loci they are genes uh, they were not different from adults and when we started to investigate what kind of uh, mutations we see in uh, what genes mostly we see uh, the genes uh, that are typical of adults as well but uh, to be a car nine uh, this most typical of children of adolescent of school children the younger the child before six years of age uh, this uh, predisposition, genetic disposition to the development of the disease uh, is more important. At this age, we can see monogenetic IBD mutation in one gene, according to Mendel's law. Mostly it's autosomal recessive or uh, related to uh, X chromosome. A hereditary factor that leads to the development of the disease younger younger the child the more important the role of the genetic mutations when we started to uh, study children uh, before six years of age who developed the disease they had more than 50 different genes that are responsible for the beginning of the disease uh, why gene study more than 200 genes more than 368 children with IBD showed that uh, the function of neutral cells uh, is impaired apoptosis maybe cytotoxic effect there may be impairment of extracellular matrix these impairments that we mostly see in children if we speak about the fact that mostly they see the impairment of neutrophil function in immunogenetic IBD, there may be the cause of the disease uh, with the impairment of function of neutrophils. In case of the chronic granulomatosis disease, in the heterozygotic mutations, in the oxidative complex, in the defects of ad, uh, uh, adhesion of leukocytes, and so on. All this impairs the function of neutrophiles, and these children clinically, and we see infections in the history of the disease, abscesses, osteomyelitis, TB cases and uh, quite frequently we see neutrophilia we have to take this into account among our patients we also saw these father sites dysfunction uh, in two of 36 children we saw uh, the granulomatosis disease uh, this disease uh, we saw together with severe infections in one patient we saw TB diagnosed together with this disease we saw the forming formation of the stenosis with the thickness of their wall of their short bowels with a great number of granulomes uh, that were uh, saw we saw in different places and we saw the impairment of motility of the bowels the next group 
of such diseases that in the basis has monogenetic defect, it's a impairment of immunological tolerance. It's known that mostly T cells, they regulate this with FOXP3 and with the STAT1 and STAT3 molecules, and also uh, the function of interleukin-10 uh, with uh, the function of its receptor to ensure this immunological tolerancy. All these genes are important, and we usually see autoimmune diseases. There may be not one disease, but several diseases, uh, it's typical of endocrine party, autoimmune proliferation, cytopenia in one of 36 children with early onset of the disease with FOXP3 mutation and the development of polyendocrine party with the immune dysregulation, so-called IPEX, IPEX syndrome. Uh, this child, in, uh, we saw severe diarrhea with blood, uh, severe atopic dermatitis. For these children, it's typical to have diabetes mellitus, autoimmune thyroiditis. In early onset, we can see just uh, antibodies to the eyelids of the pancreas without severe symptoms of uh, endocrinopathy. Uh, the impairment of the axis of interleukin-10, it's one of the factors of immunotolerance. Uh, it's typical of this disease. In case of this mutation, there is no suppression, uh, suppression of uh, cells. Uh, CD act, uh, activation of CD4, the development of inflammatory, di inflammatory process is not uh, retarded. Uh, the mutation in the gene IL10 uh, we see in very early onset in the first uh, three months of life is typical to have the involvement of the uh, whole column, a mutation in the gene of the receptor of IL-10. Here uh, we have the involvement of the CV involvement of the column, arthritis and folliculitis. Uh, next group of the diseases with monogenetic defects is impairment of the epithelial barrier. It's always typical to have skin involvement, infection uh, related to the barrier function impairment and the development of this type of enterocolitis. It may be related to a number of different mutations, maybe uh, inherited dyskeratosis, uh, um, impairment of elongations to calamere, syndrome Kindler and variants of hereditary or family diarrhea. Among our children, in two children out of 36, we saw this type of monogenic defect. It was the syndrome uh, diarrhea, and in one children we have inheritory uh, dyskeratosis. We saw pathological pigmentation of the skin early onset at the age of 2.5, like a plaque here, dystrophy, these ulcers. He was admitted to with this unclear ulcers in the mouth, in the esophagus, granulomatosis. Uh, the first diagnosis was Crohn's disease, but then we saw uh, dysfunction of uh, blood, maturation, uh, leukopenia, and we found homozygotic gene mutation, DKS, and we diagnosed uh, congenital dyskeratosis, trichogeta. Uh, Gepata enteral syndrome, 
uh, the child has watery stool. Uh, he uh, had uh, the retardation in development. But histologically, we didn't find any extensive uh, atrophy of mucosa or inflammation in the bowel. But this severe diarrhea, we can see Kang's mutation, uh, but uh, the liver was not involved. All in all, this child unfortunately died of sepsis. Hyper inflammatory syndrome. There may be manifestation of the genetic uh, determined uh, IBD. As a rule, they have high fever, rash, paraclinic activity of uh, the blood cells. The most important syndrome there is uh, lymphoproliferative syndrome re related to CR mutation. Uh, there may be other uh, points. Uh, the similar diseases may have the similar symptoms with IBD and the syndrome of the German forelimbs uh, that uh, develop, uh, that manifested as granulomatosis, colitis, and predisposition to infection. Among our patients, we found lymphoproliferative syndrome of the second time de de related to CR mutation. In development of inflammasomes, for these children, uh, as well as in Crohn's disease, uh, there may be the development of uh, uh, lymphomasomes, but in this case it's more prominent. These children may have lymphoproliferative diseases, namely in our case we saw after uh, Epstein-Barr infection the syndrome of chronophagal activation. Since one month, uh, uh, we saw fever, uh, water race to hepatosplenum megalia, and then uh, we saw symptoms of IBD at six years of age, pararectal fistula, the, the exacerbation of anemia, and the involvement of the all uh, column. Perianally, we saw this inflammatory reaction, and on the skin, unclear rash. Genetically, we found this mutation. Uh, this uh, disease is more typical of boys. Uh, defects in T and B lymphocytes we saw in four children with early onset of IBD. It's autoimmune polyendocrinal syndrome that may develop as enteropathy with the involvement of column. Uh, syndrome of Scott Aldrich and other combined immunodeficiency defects, uh, the defects in glucosolitis, the Biscott Aldrich syndrome, eczema, thrombocytopenia, uh, fair uh, hair, and impairment of the bowels. Uh, the majority of children uh, were children with TNB lymphocytes with autoimmune dysregulation and with the impairment of phagocyte uh, cell function. Out of 36 children with early onset in 12 children, we saw monogenetic variants of the primary immunodeficiency conditions. Oh, shall we study the immune status in children with IBD? Yes, in case of early onset, it's necessary. Among children, uh, in 72 children, that we studied uh, this immune status and we found out that in early onset uh, nearly always we see this or that immunological dysfunction mostly it's a phagocyte cells impairment and the reduction in the neutral killers. Uh, well, shall we think about primary immunodeficiency as a basis for the development of severe IBD? If we see since young children persistent chronic diarrhea, if we saw severe total colitis with early onset, if there is a family marriage or other symptoms in SIPS, 
if uh, the skin uh, is involved, if we saw the immune impairment of other organs, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, severe infections in the history, in the background, unexplained fever, and all this requires immunological testing. If there are risk factors of primary immunodeficiency conditions, we do recommend immuno status testing. There may be different variants. The reduction in TNB lymphocytes. Uh, we saw, we recommend here this kind of algorithm of target genetic testing with the gene uh, genes uh, that are uh, mostly responsible for this impairment. Phagocyte uh, function. Uh, we should exclude granuloma, uh, granuloma formation disease and uh, other impairment of neutrophilic function. Uh, the reduction in the neutral kill killers, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, uh, and sequencing we do to find CR and uh, other mutations. Uh, when we saw interleukin 10 uh, reduction, uh, we should make diagnosis to find uh, immunological uh, tolerance, interleukin-2, uh, interleukin-10 receptor, start one in case of frequent infections, it's necessary to assess humoral uh, immunity, D19, immunoglobulin level, uh, and we have to include a number of uh, immunodeficiency states. Immunological testing, when we do, we analyze clinical symptoms, we can suggest a different variants of primary immunodeficiency that uh, is in basis of IBD, and we can conduct target sequencing of genes reducing uh, financial burden for testing. If you find uh, primary immunodeficiency of this or that type in this or that group, this group in TNB uh, lymphocytes impairment, granulomatosis disease, uh, lymphoproliferative syndrome, auto-inflammatory apex syndrome, uh, or a general immunodeficiency state, the treatment should be aimed at, first and foremost, uh, taking into account this immunodeficiency defect. For example, in the case of granulomatosis disease, we can use uh, uh, the medications, the block antibodies to interleukin-1 or uh, uh, antibodies to interleukin-1 and 10 antibodies. We can use intracralinus and steralimus cytostatics. If we have the general general immunodeficiency, we can introduce intravenously immunoglobulin G. Can we treat completely a child? Unfortunately not. The radical treatment for the most of immunodeficiency cases is allergenic transplantation of stem cells of the marrow bone. If we find the primary immunodeficiency state, uh, we refer children compulsory to the centers that deal with the allergenic transplantation of the bone marrow for consultation and for operation. Among our children, we have several children who were successfully treated and who are now under our follow-up and uh, under the surveillance of hematologists who conducted this manipulation. In case uh, if we didn't find during target sequencing any suggested, any uh, mutation of the suggested gene, or we do zoom sequencing or wide gene sequencing, 
uh, we may find new genes, new mutations. We found out uh, the gene that was not described previously, and it was proved that this gene is responsible for the manifestation of IBD. It's a uh, difficult problem, but if the algorithm is uh, clearly made, uh, we can make a diagnosis and we can uh, manage these severe uh, patients uh, going regularly to each uh, Thank you very much, Elena. Let us move on. And I would like to give the floor to our next speaker about the risks uh, that apply to patients with IBD. Professor Olga Barosheva. Olga is the main extra staff specialist in transplantology of the Republic of Karelia. Olga, thank you very much. You're welcome. Good morning, dear colleagues. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of this workshop for inviting me to take part and to present my paper on a highly relevant problem of the risks faced by a patient with IBD and how to avoid them. One of the most memorable moments in the life of any expert specializing in IBD is the ECHO Congress on IBD and Crohn's disease. IBD is a, indeed a global disease. There are about 5 million patients affected worldwide. And this is only a preliminary estimate. What risks are associated with this condition? Risk number one is late diagnosis. 
the data available to Russian researchers uh, today that come from studies ESCAPE and ESCAPE-2 indicate that the ulcerative colitis is diagnosed um, during the main time of 16.8 months, um, Crohn's disease 44 months, there are some patients that fail to obtain a diagnosis for as long as four years. Why does it happen? Some of the causes are clinical. The non-specificity of the symptoms, the variety of clinical manif uh, manifestations, including extra intestinal manifestations. Some causes are uh, instrument related. Endoscopy is not always routinely performed, even though it should be mandatory, it should be compulsory for any patient with intestinal diseases. There are organizational causes as well. Patients sometimes report too late if um, the disease form is mild. As you remember, in many cases, when patients reported too late, in a number of cases, our analysis of the patient situation is a retrospective one. The debut is associated with the pain syndrome. It all starts with abdominal pains, which is a highly non-specific sign. Another sign is diarrhea. Other symptoms include fever, anemia, extraintestinal manifestations, paraproctitis, anal fissures, appendectomy, non-patent bowel. So, Patients often have to wait for a long, long time before they can be diagnosed. How can we overcome this risk? By using the universal questionnaire to identify signs of OBD. You can see this questionnaire on screen. It is published online for public access. It was developed by gastroenterologists. It has a set of major and minor questions. If the patient answers affirmatively to all the major questions, this patient should be referred to a gastroenterologist and should also receive some counseling for immune inflammatory disease. The second risk is associated with the clinical table. A very brief demonstration, a patient aged 38, the debu is a recurrent fasciitis of the right shin. Um, then uh, the patient presented with purulent Achilles um, bursitis, a sepsis developed. Despite treatment, the patient still retained leukocytosis and fever. The patient then travels from one hospital to another, including a 90 hospital, a surgical hospital, and an emergency hospital. None of the institutions provide a definitive diagnosis until somebody noticed that the patient had purulent, had had purulent paraproctitis.
выглядела локально у пациента голень это гангренозная пиодермия прикола на And is currently on remission. This disease is multidisciplinary, and we need to understand that the disease may have a number, a vast number of extra intestinal manifestations. And of course, a multidisciplinary approach is required to diagnosis and treatment. I would like to describe how the medical care to such patients is organized in my Republic, Republic of Karelia. On different levels, um, such as um, medical student um, um, education, uh, gastroenterology, nephrology, therapeutics, and of course, we need to network with different healthcare institutions. We need to organize patient registers. And this work has been started. Um, a center uh, for um, patients with IBD has been created that takes a multidisciplinary approach to this disease. Another risk is the risk of exacerbation and progression. Our patients should understand um, that IBD is a chronic disease. Alternative colitis may develop in um, every seventh patient with IBD. In terms of progression, what is known is that if um, ulcerative colitis is not properly treated, progression may occur within a brief, uh, a brief period of time. So it can progress from mild to very severe forms. So inflammatory activity needs to be controlled, strictly controlled. Therapy needs to um, uh, needs to be started. To prevent progression of the disease um, and the involvement of the whole colon. The same applies to patients with Crohn's disease, because if we start treating the patient early. We use the window of the opportunity that is available to us, preventing surgical sequelae, preventing surgical complications. Mesolazin is the first line medication in treating IBD. And of course, the medications uh, need to be carefully chosen and titrated. Rectal forms of mesalazine enable us to optimize our treatment. Adequate dosage um, must be provided to patients on supporting treatment. The patient on remission must have discontinued therapy because this will help to prevent disease progression and relapse. Recommendations of the European consensus and the Russian guidelines indicate that the effective uh, mesalazine dose is um, over 2 grams per day um, per os and three grams per week for rectal therapy. Patients uh, with um, five SCA um, adherents are less prone to risks of remission. Remission should be treated for um, as long as two years uh, in case of ulcerative colitis and for uh, two to four years 
um, for Crohn's disease. However, prolonged, even lifelong therapy sometimes is indicated for cancer prevention. The next risk is the risk of colorectal cancer, which is fairly high in patients with ulcerative colitis, reaching 18% in five years. The cumulative risk of colorectal um, cancer over 25 years reaches 34%, which is absolutely enormous. The factors of high risk include um, disseminated colitis forms, combination with primary sclerosing cholangitis. And the patients should um, receive treatment with five um, ASC. At present, the effects of biological therapy are still under discussion. This brings us to the recommendations of the guidelines on cancer prevention. The next risk is the risk of surgical intervention. Surgical treatment is not often administered to patients with ulcerative colitis. Modern approaches and the access to genetically engineered biological therapy minimizes surgical intervention risks. However, for Crohn's disease, um, one in two patients will be eligible for surgical treatment over the period of 10 years. And that brings us back again to the issue of adhering to guidelines in terms of dosage, therapy duration, and risk assessment. The risk of inadequate therapy during the onset of the disease is associated with the disease prognosis. We should prevent irreversible damage to bowels at the very early stage and to reduce the risk of comorbidities. If we reach clinical and endoscopic remission, this will translate into more favorable uh, prognosis in terms of um, colectomy prevention, surgical intervention prevention. For Crohn's disease, the same considerations apply. If the patient achieve good mucosa repair at the early stage, they may not require surgical treatment at all. It is highly important to stratify risks in patients with Crohn's disease. If the patient are young, if they require systemic steroids, if they have perianal damage, all those risks have been specified in the guidelines. And of course, to prevent inadequate therapy, the physicians need to assess, carefully assess the, uh, the risk factors and to um, consider prescribing genetically engineered medications. Cardiovascular risks are also typical of patients with IBD. There is a little bit paradox with some patients displaying low levels of cholesterol, LDL, 
low um, body mass index. However, their risk is reliably uh, the risk of CVD is reliably higher than in the general population. So the cardiovascular risk with uh, in patients with um, IBD needs to be carefully assessed on an individual basis, including the risk associated with the uh, treatment. Thank you very much, Olga, for your exciting presentation, where you considered all the risks affecting patients with IBD. I do believe that this topic has not left our participants are at indeed indifferent because it has very wide branching ramifications for anyone dealing with issues of IBD. So thank you very much for your detailed report. Thank you. Okay, dear colleagues, we move forward. Отлично, дорогие коллеги, будем двигаться дальше. И я рад представить вам нашего следующего докладчика, который представит сообщение, приглашенный доклад. Приглашаем профессора Себастьяна Цайсига. Он работает в Дрездене. И Работает он в специальном центре, который... Um, and the and the kind of introducing words. So let me um, share my screen um, and uh, you let me know whether this um, works. Okay. Um, yep. I'm trying at the moment. Yes. And you should be seeing my full screen now. Okay. Perfect. So. Um, Thanks again um, for the for the invitation. So I'm based in Dresden, as initially said, and so um, we have a pretty large outpatient center here, um, uh, roughly a thousand patients, of which uh, most actually, so seventy percent are Crohn's disease um, and thirty percent um, roughly are ulcerative colitis. Um, the way this works um, here in particular um, in, in, in Dresden is that we see patients only by reference uh, from gastroenterologists. So in other words, um, typically see patients pre-treated and so have the vast majority of our patients on, on biologicals, um, so, uh, probably more than um, 90% in fact. And so I was asked to give a little bit of the, of the German uh, perspective or so certainly the local perspective of how we do things um, here. Um, this is a, a Johnson & Johnson uh, sponsored um, talk. So thank you very much for the, for the support. And so um, we have been able to deal with the, with the with the next generation biologicals, so to speak, such as ustekinumab for quite a few years now. Ustekinumab for Crohn's disease was approved in 2016. Um, and an ulcerative colitis in 2018. So we've collected quite a few years now of experience and I'd like to show you a little bit of practical um, experience of, of, of what we've encountered in the past years um, and how we, how we do it locally. So this is my um, um, disclosures um, and then I was asked to include this slide um, as well. So this is a very nice overview slide uh, from uh, Catherine Leber um, in Rorong Perang Barulets Group uh, in, in, in France and Nancy. 
Um, and I think it highlights a couple of very important points for the treatment of, of IBD. Um, a couple of things which you often see on slides, but which I think we don't do for all patients and which would be important um, um, to do. So first, we should, I think, do a baseline assessment for all of our patients, essentially evaluate um, whether our patients fall into risk categories, as for example, perianal Crohn's disease, very young onset, uh, smokers, fistulizing, stricturing disease, patients we may treat differently um, from those who don't have these risk factors. Then we need to um, assign for each patient uh, an individual treatment uh, target. Uh, and that's something that I often in clinical practice see uh, not happening. Um, you'll see what these treatment targets look like in the in the stride uh, guidelines in, in 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 just a moment and i have to say not for all of my patients these treatment targets indeed apply but you should have a treatment target for all of your patients um what i often see is that patients receive a medication and then the physicians are watching are things getting better but they don't really have a plan of where they would like to get um, and that's a little bit like entering your car and starting to drive without knowing um, where you want to drive. And so what's tried to find um, uh, a number of years ago is that within three months, all your patients should be in clinical remission. Within three to nine months, depending on whether it's UC or Crohn's disease, a patient should um, see mucosal healing, um, which would mean that you have to do endoscopy for all patients. And then you should monitor every half year to year um, whether patients have indeed um, reached these goals and, and, and remain to be uh, in remission. Now, depending on how large your outpatient center is and, and how well patients are pre-treated, um, for some of your patients, this may be out of scope. I have patients who come who've seen um, three lines of biological treatment. And for many of those, I will not be able to get them into remission. I have patients where any improvement uh, is appreciated. But what I'm saying is for each of these patients, you should, before you start your, your therapy, um, clearly define that individual um, target. And then it needs monitoring. Ideally, you reach your goals. And if you don't, um, then you should optimize um, 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 treatment. And that should typically not be hopping from one biological to the next one, but indeed optimization um, of the different um, biologicals. Now this was uh, theory, um, uh, but the and, and theory is never difficult. Um, difficult is always uh, the the clinical practice. And so, um, I'd like to highlight um, or show you one uh, case to to illustrate the, the different difficulties. And I've intentionally chosen a patient which I have not seen um, last year, but which I've seen um, who I've seen uh, four years ago now. And I'll show you in a moment why I chose this um, old case. Now we're talking about a Crohn's disease patient, um, ileal disease, a left-sided colonic disease, an occasional smoker who presented um, uh, in 2017 uh, with like increase in leukocytes, increase in CRP, um, uh, a fairly substantial increase in calprotectin, had um, a steroid-dependent course of disease um, initially uh, had received azathioprine. So I have to say like back in the days, we've seen a lot of patients where azathioprine was used as a monotherapy. This is something that's disappearing um, uh, in Germany gradually uh, because of the, of the bad side effects profile of azathioprine. So you see it in combination with anti-TNF, but very infrequently nowadays um, in, in monotherapy. It's not very efficacious um, uh, and it comes with a number of different risks. And so when I saw this patient uh, in, in May 17, um, we, the patient had a pain in the lower left abdomen, had three to five stools per day um, without um, blood. So moderate symptoms, um, high uh, fecal um, calpro. And this is what the endoscopy of this patient looked like. I would always recommend when you see a patient for the first time to either have like convincing external scoping that you can take a look at, at the pictures, um, or really do it yourself to get an impression of what things look like. And what you see here, of course, um, are snail track ulcers throughout the, the colon, um, the left colon, I should add, um, and uh, we had a similar picture in the ileum. So quite a, um, a pronounced uh, endoscopic uh, disease uh, burden. And so how did we do it um, in 2017? And I'm, I'm showing 2017 because I will show you in a moment that we do things differently um, nowadays. 
So in 2017, this was the early um, era of what we were um, drugs such as and uh, vedalizumab or ustekinumab had uh, essentially just entered the clinic. We were still essentially always going first line uh, with anti-TNFs. And so in this case, patient received adalimumab was induced with 180, uh, 160 and then 80 um, uh, milligrams. And so patient um, was then scheduled uh, three months later for the next visit. And just a typical, um, not picture perfect uh, patient. Patient felt a lot better after the initial adalimumab treatment, reported two soft stools, only occasional left sided lower abdominal pain, had a low CRP. And then we would always um, uh, essentially schedule patients for ultrasound to check after three months and after six months how patients uh, respond objectively by ultrasound because it's often just easier to do an ultrasound than to do um, a, a colonoscopy. Now, often enough, as you see for this patient, patient was feeling better, actually didn't appear for his ultrasound appointment. Um, and when I asked him, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling well, I really don't need an ultrasound, like what could be seen there, uh, I'm, I'm good. Um, at every visit, visit in the outpatient center, patients um, are asked to bring a fecal sample for Calpro, patient hadn't a broader fecal sample, explanation was the same, I'm feeling well, um, I, I just really need um, a prescription um, and that's all I need from you. Okay, so ask the patient um, to, um, um, you know, support us a little more uh, in what we're doing. Um, we had another appointment uh, three days later and the patient indeed didn't wait for that, but um, returned early. And so he came two months later. Um, he explained that he had been feeling worse uh, for a couple of weeks now, uh, more soft stools, uh, more abdominal pain, Calpro. We, so we didn't have a Calpro after um, three months into treatment. Um, but clearly this was now um, five months into treatment um, and for five months into treatment was too high um, as a CalPro. Um, COP was elevated um, as well. Now suddenly patient was doing not so well anymore and for this reason was happy to undergo um, ultrasound suddenly and we do a lot of ultrasound as initially said, so typically at least every half year even for patients um, in remission. Um, it's accessible. We have the ultrasound um, um, department within our clinic and so easily get um, appointments. And so what you can appreciate here in the left colon um, is a massive uh, thickening of the, of the bowel wall, eight millimeters, and some mild um, hyperperfusion indicative of, of endoscopic activity. Now then, um, what I'm often trying to preach to my uh, clinical colleagues is, is before you give up on a biological, please do optimize it and please check particularly for the anti-TNFs uh, why they are failing. Um, um, that would be reactive therapeutic drug monitoring, um, in essence, checking for trough levels and for people with low trough levels for anti-drug antibodies. Um, and then for adalimumab, at least escalating to weekly treatment because I often see patients who come on reference then um, by gastroenterologists who have seen three different biologicals. And when you then read at a limo map, try it, did not work, primary failure, secondary failure, and you don't have any of this information, you're really wondering um, whether the drug failed, was it an immunogenic failure, was it a non-immunogenic failure, and all of this would affect your, your um, decisions. So the patient had moderate um, trough levels, so five is kind of the, the lowest level you'd like to see. Um, the patient did not have any um, anti-drug antibodies, um, and so we escalated the patient uh, to uh, a weekly treatment. And so the patient um, uh, came again, um, essentially two months later, had still abdominal pain, had roughly the same CRP, had an even increased um, uh, calprotectin. So not a major effect. I would say that typically we can get 20 to 30 patients back when we escalate them to weekly um, treatment. If it's not an immunogenic failure, if it's immunogenic, you see high anti-drug antibodies, I would um, essentially stop the, the treatment. Now, in this case, no improvement. And then um, that's my next recommendation, or at least the way I, I personally do it. We have only a handful of different biological treatments. So whenever I give up on a treatment, um, I would typically take a look um, endoscopically, certainly in any ulcerative colitis, certainly in any colonic Crohn's disease for a patient with only like terminal ileitis, 
we have a long way actually and you have to do a full colonoscopy not um always but so just to get an objective readout uh, and you can see what this objective readout looks like here you still have these snail track ulcers perhaps it's a little bit increased but it's in for a patient who's on his first line biological that's not enough um and and so we should aim for more so we did um, start this patient then um, on ustekinumab as a second line um, biological treatment. Um, it's March uh, 2018 now, and the patient um, uh, reported, or I saw the patient again two months later, um, he reported an improvement starting two weeks after the infusion. That's typical. Um, it's, it's perhaps not always so super fast as you sometimes see for infliximab, uh, but with it, within a, a couple of weeks, you should clearly see um, a response. So it doesn't take as long as vedolizumab, for example, would often take um, for Crohn's disease. Well, often enough, you have to wait for like 14 weeks or so to see a response. Um, patient had only occasional left-sided lower abdominal pain, still twice a day, CRP still moderately or slightly uh, increased, um, and uh, a low but not yet normalized uh, calprotectin. Then the question is, so I don't know what the, what the, what the, um, what the approval in, in Russia looks like in, in, in the EU. Um, you essentially have the choice between an eight-weekly subcutaneous treatment or a 12-weekly will likely be the same in, in, in Russia. Um, and so um, that's a, when you talk to 10 German colleagues, um, you, will get, um, you will get 10 different responses of how people do it. Um, for me, whenever a patient has failed, has had a difficult course before, I would always start on an eight-weekly treatment and then de-escalate to a 12-weekly treatment. I only start with 12-weekly for those patients who are um, uh, in remission um, at that, uh, in, in complete clinical endoscopic remission at that time. So typically people who you've switched um, are in remission. Um, for all others, I start eight weekly. And so what the patient uh, reported then um, um, eight weeks later was that he feels well, stool essentially completely normalized, form stools um, uh, once uh, to twice a, um, a day, CRP really low, Calpro um, really low. So a nice response. And, and with this response, I would then, um, uh, and did so later on, de-escalate the patient to a 12 weekly um, subcutaneous treatment. I have to say that, um, I mean, you've seen the stride guidelines, you've seen the recommendation um, for actually the need for an endoscopy um, after a couple of months into treatment. I don't know how you um, individually do it. I have to say um, it's sometimes hard to convince a patient uh, in clinical remission to undergo another colonoscopy. Again, that's easier for ulcerative colitis or for distal colonic Crohn's disease, where you can just do a sigmoidoscopy. But for a patient with an ileal Crohn's disease who's in remission, who would have to go uh, undergo full bowel cleansing, um, it's often hard to convince them. Now, in this case, we did it because the patient had failed before. Um, and this is the picture you see left in the ileum right in the colon with a very nice um, um, uh, disease in uh, remission, essentially. Now, the patient is fine um, and, and, and you can ask like, everything's perfect, right? Um, so patient is doing well, endoscopy uh, is, is looking well and we've done everything right. Um, and so the reason um, I showed you this um, um, outdated essentially or four years old um, case because, is because I'm not so sure we did everything right um, in the past. If you critically review what we've done, you have to say this patient came into or had a diagnosis in July 2016. And the first time that patient was in remission was in July 18. So essentially, if you want to be negative, you can say two years lost, two years with disease symptoms, two years not in a stable treatment, two years of life quality that was lost. And so um, critically, we would have had, uh, would have liked to have this patient in remission uh, three months after the initial uh, diagnosis and not two years after the initial diagnosis. And so you can ask, like, how would we do it um, um, in, 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 in 2021, uh, so Savonia. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and so I'd like to show you a little bit of the rational or the considerations of, of why we do things differently um, nowadays. 
So if you go back and you have this case in mind, uh, so this is the this is the essentially the palette or the the repertoire of options you would have um, at hand uh, here uh, in Germany and likely the same um, uh, in in Russia. You have for IBD two um, biologicals, ustekinumab as an IL twenty uh, IL twelve IL twenty three blocker, vedolizumab as an integrin blocker. You have a whole range of anti TNFs, infliximab and adalimumab both for UC and CD. Golimumab in Germany, at least only for UC and sertilizumab, we actually don't have anymore. And then you have these old small molecules, is a thioprint for both diseases. Uh, I mentioned initially that we're not using it a lot anymore in monotherapy for Crohn's, metotrexate, for UC cyclosporin, and then you have tofacitinib, which um, uh, in Germany has been around for two years now, and really because of the side effects profile, um, sort of remains. Um, for most um, physicians, I know um, a third line or last line treatment. So you have all these options um, uh, at hand. And so the question is, when you saw that same patient again, what would you do um, in, in 2021? And I guess the, the, the answer to this is always a very simple one. You'd like to go for the most efficacious uh, and safest drug. And so if you try to get information on these two things, efficacy and safety, um, it's not actually so easy to get valuable information. We have very few, uh, in, in terms of efficacy, we have very few head-to-head um, -head comparisons still of biologicals uh, in, uh, in Crohn's disease, um, as well as in ulcerative colitis. In ulcerative colitis, um, you um, have the direct comparison of vedolizumab and adalimumab. Um, and in Crohn's disease, I will just show you some news. But all of what you have beyond that uh, is really meta-analysis such as this one, which is based on the clinical uh, trials. Um, and you can see that uh, for most drugs and anti-TNF um, naive Crohn's, of course the drug works better than the placebo. But when you look at the into the different drugs, infliximab, adalimumab, vedolizumab, ustekinumab, you don't really see major differences. So it's hard to conclude anything from that. Um, really looks like these drugs are uh, equal. Of course, you have to take this with a grain of salt because these were different patients' populations and you could not um, directly compare them, actually. When you look into anti-TNF uh, um, uh, experienced patients, uh, things look um, uh, a little bit different. There you really have ustekinumab and perhaps adalimumab um, as, as first uh, choices. Now, again, a lack of head-to-head of -head trials. We're seeing more and more of those. Or we will be seeing more and more of those coming in the next few years. And the first one, and I'm sure you've seen this, um, has, uh, has just been shown at the DDW. It's essentially the first head-to-head -head, uh, in, um, in biologic naive Crohn's disease, and it compared ustekinumab versus adalimumab in moderate to severe Crohn's disease with the CVU. Um, uh, study. And so um, it was, um, or the, 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 um, the study looked into patients with moderately uh, to severely active CD, patients who had failed either ster uh, steroids or uh, immunomodulators, but had not received um, biologics before. It had endoscopically active disease, of course. And so what you can see um, is the, is the, uh, is the um, primary and secondary endpoints. Clinical remission at week 52 was the primary endpoint. Um, and there were a number of secondary endpoints, such as clinical remission at week 16. Well, I'm showing you these data because you can see that in these matched patient populations, um, um, you see within 16 weeks, which was again a secondary endpoint, uh, no statistically significant difference um, between um, patients in clinical remission under ustekinumab versus adalimumab. If anything, ustekinumab is perhaps a little lower than adalimumab. So you could say, well, um, then for primary treatment of a biologic naive patient, um, adalimumab um, could as well be my uh, first choice. It's uh, at least in Germany, uh, it's a little uh, um, less expensive than ustekinumab. But what you see over time. Um, and this is shown even within just one year of this study, is when you look into patients who had an initial clinical um, um, response and, and maintained clinical remission, um, you can see that these numbers are essentially changing uh, and you see that over time you see more of a response um, or, or higher percentages of clinical remission uh, in patients treated with ustekinumab. Um, and I'll show you more of this um, in a second. When you look into historic data, and that's the clinical trials, comparing them um, 
uh, or showing them next to each other, you see the clinical dilemma, which all of you are well aware of. And this is the fact that uh, both for infliximab and adalimumab, uh, you essentially see a substantial secondary loss of response. So patients show a nice initial response, but then lose this response. And for adalimumab, this was going down from 60 to 36% within a year for infliximab, roughly the same 55 to 28. So half of the patients in these studies lost response or lost remission within the first year um, of uh, a treatment. And so you see that these curves look different for betalizumab and ustikinumab. Um, there's less or no immunogenicity and so a considerably less secondary loss of response. And this is what you can also see in the in the C-view study. Uh, and this is looking into patients who had a clinical response um, at uh, week 16, and you're looking into those who remained this response at week 52. And there you can see that these bars start looking uh, different. And unfortunately, the study um, um, results only show you one year, uh, but um, I would expect that the longer you go, uh, the bigger this difference um, uh, will get. And nominally, this is a statistically significant result. So in the long run, and that's something important, if you start a treatment today, you not only want that it works in three months, uh, you still want it to work in one year and, and two years. And what we've seen um, uh, in switching patients, biological naive patients to ustikinumab first in our clinic is you really see patients very stably. If they respond, they run smoothly um, over the years with very little secondary loss of response. The other important consideration to bear in mind is that the efficacy of your ustikinumab will look very different if you're treating anti-TNF naive patients compared to patients who are anti-TNF experienced or have failed anti-TNF. And so I'll show you these different data in, in this and the next slide. And this is five-year data, intention to treat analysis. So a hard analysis where everyone who dropped out was seen as a as a failure, you can see that still um, over these five years, you see very little secondary loss of response. But let me show you, the, or let me compare these data. This is anti-TNF naive patients. Look where we are, 65% remission um, uh, in, in year one. And this is anti-TNF experienced patients. And I can go back and forth and you see the dramatic difference um, this makes. Now, we don't know um, uh, exactly why patients who have failed or who have uh, who are anti TNF experience show less of a response to essentially most biologicals and small molecules, including ustikinumab. There's nice data by Marcus Neurath um, showing um, that maybe anti TNFs are indeed inducing um, a remodeling of the immune system that actively promotes the, the failure then um, of other drugs such as ustikinumab. Um, but it could simply also be that this is a more difficult um, a patient population to treat, you know, these patients who fail on essentially everything. But it's important for your expectation management if you start a patient with an anti, who's anti-TNF naive, you can expect something like this, um, two thirds going in remission. If you treat patients who have started on anti-TNFs, your expectation is it will be less um, uh, successful. Again, a reason for us, um, uh, together with the other data to go for ustikinumab uh, first, uh, and I should add, we do the same um, for betalizumab. The second key point um, is, uh, is safety. Um, and um, since we're seeing more and more efficacious drugs, um, the discussion is shifting a little bit from uh, efficacy to safety, uh, which um, also the patients are really aware of these days and are asking um, about side effects profiles. And now I think it's fair to say that our drugs overall are relatively safe, um, most or all of the options, but you do see differences. And so this is nicely um, um, shown in this uh, very large French population-based study um, in which incidence rates um, per 10,000 people are shown here for serious infections or opportunistic infections in patients on monotherapy with diopurins on monotherapy with anti-TNF or in combination therapy. And you can, a couple of, of take home messages here. The, the first one is, it's really the anti-TNF driving the serious infections um, rather than the thiopurins. But if you combine them, and often enough, of course, you will combine them, um, you, um, these, these serious infections further increase 
uh, in uh, incidents. And I'll show you some data on, on elderly people in a moment when it really becomes um, um, uh, an issue. For opportunistic infections, the picture is a little bit different. It kind of looks the same for patients on thiopurine, uh, purine monotherapy and anti-TNF monotherapy. But once you combine, you really see an increase in opportunistic infections. Now, depending on how many patients you treat, you will see these things or you may not see these things. Uh, but if you have a large outpatient center uh, and a large clinic, you do see um, uh, these clinical problems. And I just like to show you two of those. This was a, a patient from uh, Greece, um, had initially um, uh, an interferon or a negative uh, interferon release assay, so was tested negative for tuberculosis, then suddenly appeared with fever under infliximab. You see these um, infiltrates here, um, these classical ones, and this is taken a little bit later, three months um, into the disease where you see um, caverna uh, forming. So this, is, this was a reactivation of, or right, likely a reactivation, maybe a primary infection with tuberculosis. I don't show you all the data, the details of this patient for the sake of time. This patient ultimately developed miliary tuberculosis under infliximab. It was a nightmare um, and um, the patient suffered for years um, from this event. This was a young student, um, 21 years, um, who came uh, to our outpatient center was under infliximab and, and came with this little bit of a finger lesion and said like my doctor says it's a pyoderma gangrenosum it really hurts like uh, what are you making out of this um and um and so we did ask him the one key question for that one which is do you have an aquarium um and the patient um indeed <laughs> nicely described that he cleaned his aquarium uh, without uh, gloves. And so a couple of such cases reported. This was a mycobacterium marinum infection um, under infliximab. And you saw like we immediately started with triple therapy. This is the way this developed still. You see these lesions throughout the lymphatic pathways. And again, similar to this other patient, like the patient um, essentially um, this all uh, got into remission after roughly a year. Uh, but you can imagine what this meant for this young patient. So only a few examples, but showing you what an opportunistic infection can look like. And so um, in this French study, this was quantified, um, and particularly um, in elderly people, which was seen here as people above 65, and this is incidence rates per 1,000 patients, serious infections were seen on combination therapy in 50 of a thousand, so essentially 5% of patients you treat with combo therapy above the age of 65 will per year develop serious um, infections. So it is a problem, I think. Now, when you look at the same data um, um, uh, for um, ustekinumab, you see a very different uh, picture. Um, it's a complicated slide. You see different diseases, psoriasis, psoriasis, arthritis, Crohn's disease, and, and here the sum of all patients. And what you always see is to the left, um, a placebo-treated patients, to the right, ustekinumab patients. And this is adverse events. This is serious adverse events. This is infections. This is infections requiring treatment and the serious infections. And if you just focus on the, on the entire subset of 6,000 um, patients, you can appreciate that for any adverse event, you're looking at um, the, the complications are lower indeed for patients under ustekinumab compared to those who have received placebo. And that's the clinical experience as well. You essentially don't see much of infectious complications or side effects at all. Second important point is ustekinumab, and I should say the same applies to vedolizumab, come with very little immunogenicity. Essentially, you don't see this as a clinical problem. This is data after five years of ustekinumab treatment, anti-drug antibodies in less than 5% of patients. And there's no evidence that this would influence um, the course of disease, very different um, compared to uh, infliximab or adalimumab. And so, um, this comes with a big advantage, and this is shown here. It does not matter whether you treat patients in combo therapy with ustekinumab plus azathioprine or ustekinumab alone. Um, there's no immunogenicity. Patients don't benefit from azathioprine, so you don't have to do combo therapy. And so for all patients I have on azathioprine who then go on to ustekinumab, I discontinue azathioprine. 
So um, all of this um, has led uh, in the past years, um, at least in, the, in, 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 in Germany, to kind of a reconsideration of the treatment sequence. Um, just some five years ago, we would have started the typical Crohn's disease patients on azathioprine. We would have then gone to the, to the first anti-TNF. If it failed, then we go to the second um, anti-TNF and then to um, ustekinumab or vedolizumab. And so that has dramatically um, uh, changed. And so we see very little um, azathioprine monotherapy these days. Um, and, um, and often enough, we would see that patients are switched on or started on a newer biologicals and then upon failure um, uh, would be switched to an anti-TNF. Um, it's not universal. You uh, like for a severe ulcerative colitis, for example, you would clearly start with infliximab for patients with a high risk profile in Crohn's. Um, young patient, a perianal disease, smoker, fistula, I would still start with combo therapy with anti-TNF and azathioprine. Um, but for those who don't bring these risk profiles, um, I would nowadays typically start um, on uh, the, the second generation biologicals. Now, just very briefly in the last two or three minutes, um, uh, will this look different when you talk about ulcerative colitis? And this is like a typical uh, a patient with a high fecal calpro, a substantial endoscopic um, activity. And so the bottom line is nothing of what we discussed really changes when we're talking about UC um, uh, compared to Crohn's disease. The treatment goals are the same. You want to go into steroid free clinical remission. You want to prevent hospital admission and surgery. You want to avoid um, a disability. The treatment landscape largely looks the same with the difference to Crohn's disease that you have tofacitinib as a small molecule. Um, but uh, at least uh, in, 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 in Germany, would tofacitinib will typically be considered um, a third line therapy um, because of in, like severe um, infectious complications um, occasionally. Um, and, um, uh, and you're aware of the uh, Trump embolism data. Uh, which have also raised concerns about tofacitinib. The same considerations as you've seen for Crohn's disease um, with regard to ustekinumab hold true for UC, durable clinical remission, that is two-year data. We now also have five-year data showing that once a patient responds, you essentially, you essentially see them running smoothly and well. Um, and so what we've seen in the past, where you put patients on their first anti-TNF, they show a nice response, then they lose this, then they go on to the second anti-TNF, and then they lose response. So the switching from drug to drug is something we don't really see so much anymore. Patients run very stably under the newer um, biologicals. Um, Anti-drug antibodies, the same for UC. Uh, it does not matter. Um, uh, so low rates and no difference. Um, uh, whether you treat or don't treat patients with immunomodulators, no difference either for um, the trough levels of ustekinumab. It's the same uh, for those receiving or not receiving um, immunomodulators. And the same holds true for the clinical data. If you're looking um, into patients uh, in clinical remission and uh, in, the, in, in the trials, you can see that, um, uh, that uh, whether patients were receiving or not receiving uh, immunomodulators did not make a difference for the response to ustekinumab. So the recommendation would be to not combine ustekinumab with any of these immunomodulators. And if patients are coming on immunomodulators, I would typically discontinue them um, later on. So it's a potential to avoid immunomodulator associated adverse events. And so this brings me to the conclusion on um, the, the treatment goal should typically uh, be um, a steroid-free clinical and endoscopic remission and the prevention um, of disability for all patients. For some patients, this will still be a challenge, particularly those treated with two or three um, biologicals in the past. It will be very difficult uh, to get them into steroid-free uh, remission. We should try to adhere to treat the target and tight control, um, um, tight control um, principles. So make sure you have a target um, and make sure you check whether you reach this target. Um, and there are certain advantages of second generation uh, biologicals. You, I've shown you the, the low rates of antigenicity, the low rates of secondary loss of response, um, some data on the safety profile. And so for these reasons, um, uh, and also given the lower 
rates of response to ustekinumab and anti-TNF experience patients, we try to, or we've seen a little bit of a paradigm shift uh, in, in past years um, uh, in, in, in our outpatient center and see more and more first-line therapy with ustekinumab and vedolizumab. And I guess if, the, if, there, if there wasn't a discussion about finances, um, I, I would expect that most patients indeed would be started on ustekinumab or vedolizumab nowadays um, first. And so with this, I'd uh, like to thank you um, um, for the opportunity to um, uh, discuss uh, this data with you, and I'm happy to take uh, the questions. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for a great talk. Уважаемые коллеги, мы двигаемся дальше, и я с большим удовольствием объявляю следующий доклад, который сделает сопредседатель Let's move on to our next presentation, which will be made by Professor Yuspensky, who uh, will be talking about organizational frameworks relating to IBD patients and patient routing in the um, uh, megapolis of St. Petersburg. Dear colleagues, we are continuing our work. Let's uh, look back in the history, in our recent history, if before the 90s, 70s, 90s, 60s, our IBDs were quite rare in our clinical practice. We saw them not frequently. Now we can see that uh, during 50, 70 years of age throughout the world, uh, mostly in uh, developed countries, in the Northern America, Europe, Scandinavia, we have seen the extraterritorial tendency with the increase in the incidence rate of this disease, both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, namely, we have seen a clear development, uh, clear presence of these pathologies in the regions where they were not present before. What's the reason for this? If we take into account that IBDs, yeah, uh, the line, uh, bright example of an uh, autoimmune complex pathology, we can see a clear and close connection with the increase in the number of autoimmune diseases uh, that amounts to 5-10% of incidence rate. Each uh, fifth Americans, each seventh uh, Russian citizen suffers from autoimmune disease. We are talking about pandemics of autoimmune disease, non-infectious disease. From our point of view, what's uh, the reason for this? Why do we see this uh, increase and upsurge? What's behind this? What are the catalyzers? Uh, I think we think that there is a genetic predisposition and there are triggers uh, that influence such as external uh, environment, radiation, uh, contamination of food, microorganism, viruses, uh, such things uh, that are increasing in our technogenic environment. And now throughout out of the world, the leading countries, they discuss the problems of environment and other ecological problems. A number of medications, new medications, there are variation of them. On the one hand, improves the management of different diseases, but on the other hand, impairs the immunity. We have the uh, other side of the coin. 
we see the dysfunction of the homo hormones. All these predispositions, uh, they lead to the growth, or growth of autoimmune disease and namely of IBD. The hypothesis that IBD uh, in the developing countries happen due to their Western diet and Western lifestyle. Uh, this hypothesis is more prominent, more important now. Let's look at what we take in, what we eat, what kind of products. They contain uh, thickeners, uh, they contain uh, coloring agents, antibiotics. We stepped aside from the uh, consuming natural products. We consume the products with a great number of ingredients uh, that initiate uh, autoimmune processes. Antibiotics uh, that are usually prescribed due to medical indications, but uh, they are widely used in uh, uh, cattle breeding. And we to take in, we consume this kind of food. As a result, we see a deep disturbances, evolutionary, um, evolutional disturbances between the relationship between macroorganisms and microbiota of a human being that amounts to from one to four kilos of a body weight and the potential of microbiota is similar to liver potential. It's considered as an extracorporeal organ. If microbiota of the gut is disturbed uh, when there are different symptoms, uh, when there are uh, deformation, when there is meteorism, uh, it uh, means uh, the metabolic disturbances increase in the metabolism of fatty acids, obesity, one of the non-infectious pandemics. Unlike infectious pandemics, it has no chances for reduction or regression. In this respect, I'd like to express my negative attitude to some uh, tricky terms uh, that I used. Uh, as to the conditionally healthy, overweight people. For example, metabolic healthy obesity or body positivity is a tricky term. And this trickery, this sensate, this strife to hide uh, their head into the sand, uh, we uh, close our eyes to the fight of pandemics. And this family on the photo that now is conditionally healthy may result in the fatal problems with health. In children, in adolescents, we see the spread of metabolic syndrome, we see obesity increasing five, seven, ten folds recently. We see a direct correlation between, and uh, Yelena Karnienka mentioned this, we have seen for ten, year, for ten years five-fold increase in the IBDs in children, and uh, as well as uh, uh, overweight children. It's a direct correlation between obesity, metabolic syndrome, and IBDs. They are intertwined with each other. They are pathogenically similar. Uh, it's impairment of uh, the specific, non-specific inflammatory response. It's impairment of secretion of adipokines. It's an increase in the cardiovascular risk. In metabolic syndrome, it's non phenomenon. In IBDs, we see a great number of cardiovascular risks. Uh, the changes in adipokines, in metabolic syndrome, in IBDs, they are concordant 
they uh, are going in one direction. In the pathogenesis of IBDs, the main mechanism is impairment of the balance between inflammatory and pro-inflammatory cytokines. In the case of overweight people, adipose tissue is a source of a chronic low-level uh, inflammation uh, with a great number of adipokines and lipokines. Uh, they lead to the increase of the permeability of the gut and spread of the inflammatory uh, bowel disease. The problem is very relevant. Uh, the city of St. Petersburg, with the population 5.5 million, huge city, in 2020, the Healthcare Committee of St. Petersburg ordered me to carry out monitoring of the primary care uh, medical establishment and hospitals as to gastroenterology. It was done, uh, namely in case of IBDs, to create a population regional register of IBDs that was set up in different regions of Russia. And practically, we haven't had uh, this register in St. Petersburg. We didn't know the incidence rate of IBDs in St. Petersburg. The measures to uh, establish uh, this register, they included not only site monitoring, but different uh, meetings with participation of uh, medical uh, and information center of St. Petersburg we have to systematize IBD data to collect the data for this register. It's an ongoing upgrading of the number of patients. We have to develop the uh, uh, proper register, uh, namely including patients with a Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Uh, the number of Crohn's diseases is going up in childhood uh, uh, and in children's hospitals and in adult hospitals. Please notice uh, that activity of ulcerative colitis among the patients who we monitored is rather high. Uh, nearly half patients with ulcerative colitis, so they have the active disease currently. Nearly half patients suffering from Crohn's disease, they suffer, they have the severe or moderate severe forms. Uh, their primary diagnosis, uh, the times of diagnosis, uh, there is still a very long ulcerative colitis more than 10 months a chrono disease more than two years requires to uh, make a diagnosis it's obvious uh, the later the diagnosis is made uh, the later uh, the treatment is prescribed and it will lead to extra intestinal manifestations of alternative colitis including eye impairment uh, skin diseases, and professor from Germany mentioned this. Patients with ulcerative colitis in half cases, uh, they have extra intestinal manifestations with the involvement of the arthritis, uh, uh, the spine, uh, the skin, and the same is true for Crohn's disease, where eyes are involved, uh, uh, aptosis of the mouth, are formed arthritis uh, manifest and arthritis and other extra intestinal manifestations, namely uh, the uh, defects in the mouth on uh, the uh, skin diseases. Uh, they are br uh, they are clearly seen. More than 10 percent of uh, of uh, patients uh, they have complicated diseases in case of ulcerative colitis and in case of Crohn disease, uh, 25 percent disease diseases, uh, they uh, have these uh, extra intestinal manifestations resulting on fistulas, arthritis, and other complications. 10% of patients with ulcerative colitis, uh, they require colectomy during 10 years. Uh, St. Petersburg data, uh, the date of our register, of our analysis, also prove 
the fact that not less than 10% of patients with the IBDs, they had had operation in the past. Uh, the uh, genetic engineering biological therapy uh, that is in the regional quarter of reimbursed uh, medical provisions, reimbursed drugs, allows to minimize the number of complications, the number of non esophageal uh, complications, reduce the number of cases that require surgical treatment of this disease. But for this therapy to be effective, it's necessary to detect the patients, to register them, to follow them up and uh, gastroenterological service as to do a great work. The register will help this. Behind these dry figures, we see real life histories of uh, grief, sorrow. We are all responsible for the help of these patients as early as possible, at maximum. Tom McCarthy said once that any great deal is the issue of organization. It's not a gen genius, it's not uh, inspiration, it's not a flight of our fantasy, it's not our skills and trickery. Everything depends on organization. Everything depends on our primary healthcare system and hospital system. This year, in this year, we opened the center uh, that manage IBD patients apart from the hospital number 31. We have the center of IBD in the hospital named by Elizabeth that uh, will help to root this patient to increase continuity in our medical care and to improve highly specialized medical care system. And this hospital named by Elizabeth the Great is, is symbolic because of the Saint Elizabeth, she her was uh, the number, member of Romanov's family. She gave them medical help. She worked as a nurse. She worked uh, during uh, the first uh, war, patriotic war. She contributed greatly uh, to the improvement of uh, the healthcare system and to uh, their life of patients. Thank you for your attention, dear colleagues.
Уважаемые коллеги, прежде чем передать слово Юлия Фоменек, I would like to respond to the question that I have received about the studies that confirm the connection between IBD and obesity. The answer is yes. Um, there have been a number of publications in peer-reviewed journals establishing this connection. However, those publications are experimental. There are very few publications about the routine clinical practice. However, we are conducting a study to the subject and we plan to present the data to you shortly. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Yule Fomenik, who uh, is going to focus on ulcerative colitis and the presentation of clinical care. Dear colleagues, allow me to thank you for joining us and to thank our scientific and techn uh, technical organizers who created this project that, have, uh, that has enabled um, Russian and international expert um, community to present some of the novel data and to discuss the problems, challenges, and sometimes errors associated with this disciplinary field. Um, today I would like to um, report one situation, uh, one case that could be, uh, that was observed, that was followed up in St. Petersburg. Female patient, age 35, who presented at a multidisciplinary hospital in St. Petersburg that conducts differential diagnosis of patients with IBD. The patient was referred from an obstetric um, clinic. Uh, the patient complained of loose um, stool um, up to six to um, eight times a week. The patient had stool um, at night time, and the stool had a high blood content. She practically never had fecal stool. She had no other specific complaints, but uh, dizziness, fatigue, and vertigo when she attempted to um, get up from her bed. The patient had had symptoms for um, five years. Following pregnancy, um, she had a suspected intestinal infection caused by food poisoning, as she believed. In some time, the patient um, did uh, develop stronger symptoms. Um, the patient received um, outpatient treatment um, on results of endoscopy and diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. The um, patient uh, discontinued um, therapy soon after the symptoms were detected. The patient was prescribed with methalazine at one gram um, per uh, day um, per os and um, one gram per day rectally. The patient received therapy for um, six months and did not achieve 
remission. During the post-pregnancy and gestation um, week 11-12, the patient developed a more frequent stool. The patient did not receive any treatment at that, by, um, at that point. And um, the um, patient requested care, but she um, was told that um, her uh, GAT um, complaints would be dealt with after pregnancy. The patient um, had a stillborn fetus, um, which was evacuated surgically. Upon which the patient was referred to um, our inpatient uh, gastroenterology department. She had a moderate severity condition. The patient was undernourished and um, very pale. She developed a tachycardia. Her stomach was sensitive to palpation. The patient's clinical data signaled that the patient had anemia. The genesis of anemia um, will be discussed later. The patient also had um, leukocytosis. Accelerated C-reactive um, protein and hypoproteinemia. Instrumental examination established. The following colonoscopy shows that the patient's large intestine was involved. Professor Barishova um, has um, talked about this dynamic as um, being common. The uh, process, in other words, um, became more extensive in the absence of treatment. The patient had ulcerative colitis and abscess. Her clinical diagnosis could be formulated as follows. Ulcerative colitis, chronic and recurrent, total involvement of the large intestine, severe attack, aggravated by anemia and electrolyte disruptions. I'm absolutely sure that our speakers, notably Professor Bogdanov, will focus on anemia in detail. But for now, uh, let me remind you that um, the um, anemia in case of IBD can be associated with chronic blood loss. And um, this is something that is extremely relevant to our patient because uh, she had had a stillborn child. Anemia of chronic diseases. The malabsorption of um, various nutrients. Negative effects associated with um, medications that are routinely prescribed to this group of patients, autoimmune mechanisms, myelodysplastic syndrome and aplasia, typical of IBD patients aged over 60. 
and we are aware of the fact that the onset of IBD peaks um, at this age bracket and hereditary hemolytic anemias. And issues that is currently studied very actively. Most frequently, patients with um, IBD um, are affected by a combination of um, iron deficiency and anemia of chronic diseases. Talking about clinical affinities, we understand that the patient does show signs of clinical anemia with a number of non-specific symptoms, such as fatigue, vertigo, Sideropenic um, syndrome, tissue deficit um, of iron that manifests itself in the paleness of the uh, mucosal tissues and skin. Patient management requires diet, lifestyle, um, regulations, administering mesalazin at 4 grams per day per os as well as rectory, infusion um, therapy with electrolyte issues, antibacterial therapy parenterally, iron supplements, glucocorticosteroids parenterally because the patient was underweight. On therapy, the patient's state of health improved. The patient developed a fecal stool. Even though small admixtures of blood were present in the stool, the anemic syndrome was relieved. The clinical data were confirmed by the patient's blood tests. CBC as well as biochemistry. The patient was referred to uh, referred uh, for um, outpatient treatment at the IBD Center at Clinical Hospital 31 and St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Mesalazin was continued at 40 grams per day. Glucocorticosteroids were gradually cancelled, discontinued, because uh, Russian and international um, recommendations call for a deadline of 12 weeks for corticosteroids, which we try to adhere to to restore the patient's iron levels, sucrosomal iron per os orally was recommended. To conclude, I would like to emphasize that clinical recommendations generated by the Russian Gastroenterological Association and the Rishik Proctology need to be um, adhered to. The um, physician is ultimately responsible for the choice of treatment. Let us be competent. 
let us be aware, stay aware of the existing Russian and international recommendations and guidelines for IBD treatment. And let us understand, let us be aware of the fact that the ultimate responsibility lies on us and that we need to take a strictly individual approach to every patient. Thank you for your attention, dear colleagues. Distinguished uh, Mikhail, good morning. We have had one more, one more talk. Professor from uh, the university named by Mechnikov. Mikhail, we will listen to you. Uh, the title of the topic Intestinal candid uh, Candidosis in Patients with IBDs. Thank you, distinguished chairperson. For me, it's a great pleasure to speak at this Congress. Because I work in a mycology, medical mycology institute. Uh, the topic of my talk is mycosis. Uh, a great number of fungi uh, may cause infectious or allergic diseases in patients, in patients with IBD. It's a great problem. Uh, the most frequent mycosis is candidosis. In brief, if we characterize uh, this pathogen, uh, we should say these three uh, unusual words, ubiquitous, uh, demorphous, opportunists. Uh, the fungi candida, they are ubiquitous, uh, they are spread throughout the world, they are demorphous uh, depending on their uh, way of reproduction. We can see them uh, in a form of uh, kidney cells or in a form of filamentous threads, pseudomyces. Opportunist uh, rooted from uh, the English word opportunity that can be translated like opportunity. If there is uh, the impairment of resistance happens, these fungi, they can cause the disease. If there is no if it's not a case, uh, no disease may happen. What else I'd like to remind you? In all the cases of candidosis, lab 
test is needed to prove the diagnosis. It ne it's needed not to confuse candida carriage and candidosis. Uh, one of the signs of candidosis is thread-like forms of fungus that is called pseudomyces. Uh, we can also detect the type of a fungus is sensitivity to antifungus medications. We will see why is it important. The clinical importance uh, to detect uh, the candida genus. There may be different sensitivity to antibiotics. The examples of fungi they don't respond to many antimycotic drugs, such as polyresistant candida aureus and candida cruzae. We should say that classical methods of uh, genus detection, taking into account uh, the type of uh, glucose fermentation. They are labor-intensive, slow and not infective. Currently in labs, such molecular methods are used, like Maldi-Tov mass spectrometry, DNA, DNA sequencing, and uh, with great pleasure I'd like to say that in our institute, our lab uses these kind of methods and it doesn't exclude it excludes any mistakes in diagnosis if candidosis of git is caused not albicans candida there may be three negative consequences first of all this patient can be treated with fluconazole this patient may have a septic septic condition or azole-resistant can, candididemia. We have very, very small time for therapy. And also, there may be nosocomial outbreaks when uh, the whole units in hospitals, uh, they uh, have the uh, outbreak of this fungi. Candidosis in IBD's patients. In what cases candida fungi may cause uh, the disease? Of course, if uh, there are some dysfunctions in factors of antifungal resistance, for example, impairment secretorial immunoglobulin A, or when there is uh, the impairment of such genus as bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, if there is a better defensive problems, alpha defenses, defensive problems, if uh, there is a reduction in the number of stromal uh, mast cells and uh, when the, we have the uh, problems with interleukin-9. What kind of mycosis patients with IBD have? The systematic overview that has been made recently with the results of 14 trials, with the overall number of patients more than 1,500, it demonstrated that the majority of mycoses, uh, they were candidosis, 60% of cases, and mostly we saw the, uh, the involvement of the upper part of G, GIT. Uh, the esophagus uh, candidosis and urophoriginal candidosis, but there may be cryptococcosis, uh, it may be involvement in mycosis, not only uh, the bowels, but the liver as well. It was shown that the majority of mycotic infections, uh, they started during the first 12 months after the onset of the therapy with glucocorticoid 
steroids and more rapidly during first six months if uh, you treat a patient with GEBT. What kind of characteristics do we have in case of candidose dysbiosis of uh, uh, bowels in IBDs or when uh, fungi uh, they don't invade the tissue and candidosis colitis when pseudomycelium invade uh, their wall of the bowel. It was shown that by a genome sequencing in the group of patients with IBD, they have the Candida albica genus elevation, and they are the uh, uh, push out Saccharomyces arabica. And we see uh, the disbalance of normal microflora of the bowel. Let's look at the histology. Uh, you can see that cells of candida fungi, cells, they dominate in bio film. They are adhesive, they adhesis at uh, the surface of the bowel, but there is no inversion, no pseudomycelium, and you can see this uh, on the uh, specimen. When fungi, uh, fungi, they start their pathogenic properties. Candida lysine is a peptide toxin that, rele that is released by candida. It causes uh, their damage of a zonulin system. It's a protein of close contacts. It invades uh, their uh, bowel cells, ensuring further translocation of fungi and other pathogens via uh, the barrier, epithelial barrier. Bifidum bacteria and lactobacilla are pressed, pushed out of the bowel, causing invasive infection. If these tight connections are disturbed in the the fragments of food toxins or bacteria and viruses, they can enter the organism, causing inflammatory response, and it's uh, very damaging for IBD patients. All in all, the influence of candida in case of these bios can be presented under the following sayings. Candida fungi uh, Having become dominant in the biofilm, they form their uh, IBD. They suppress normal microflora. They cause mixed infection. They impair the permeability of the bowel barrier uh, that became permeable for toxin allergens and bacteria and viruses. Pathological influence of metabolite of micromycete uh, via priming uh, leads to this, uh, dysfunction of uh, T1, T2, T17 uh, that cause a negative cause of the disease of IBDs and immunodeficient syndrome. Candida fungi, they prevent healing of uh, the tissue defects in case of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. They create the condition for invasion of micromycetes and uh, causing septic conditions. GBT increases the risk of visceral 
Candy Doses lesions, different uh, papers, uh, they describe the cases. Uh, in a child with a Crohn disease, after the TNF treatment uh, blockers, uh, he uh, uh, complains of their uh, back pain. MRI revealed osteomyelitis of the spondylus and uh, during the lab test, candida parapsilosis uh, pseudomycelium were found. Uh, in other case, a girl, uh, adolescent uh, with a Crohn disease, after their treatment of the TNF blocker in a peripheral blood smear, will found candida albicans cells. Uh, their fungi can travel inside of macrophages. They can use macrophages as a taxi drivers. They can deliver them to any uh, organ, to any part of the body, causing different uh, disease conditions. Here, we, it's an adopted table. Uh, the document of EORTS published in 2019, the seven reasons of immunodeficiency can lead to a fungi invasion. It's a long therapy of corticosteroids, a granulocytosis, transplantation of hemopoietic stem cells, the primary immunodeficiency, the use of immunosuppressants, uh, namely the factors of blockers of key cytokines, Act, uh, AIDS and active hematological disease. In case of this patient, uh, there may be the invasive candidose enterocolitis. Here we see pseudomycelium and invasion into the bowels. Uh, the uh, candidose colitis has uh, intensive diarrhea and intensive uh, abdomen pain. CT reveals thickness of the wall and in colonoscopy you can see a very serious colitis that may require operative treatment. Micromycet of candida can penetrate uh, into the blood flow causing candidemia. That may be the main reason for death in patients of ICU. This slide shows uh, the invasive candidose colitis. Uh, it's more than 50 years old from the book of our uh, revered scientist, Oleg Khmelnytsky. We celebrated his uh, anniversary the previous year. This scientist uh, wrote a lot about my causes. It's black and white light, but we see the tenth and thousand filaments of candida that invade the whole tissue of the bowel. In this situation, a patient is in a very, very severe condition. Uh, the death rate in case of invasive candidosis is very high. Survival rate only 43%. All in all, the phases of the candidosis of, uh, in, uh, of uh, bowel in case of IBD may be look like the algorithm. First of all, contamination happened. Uh, it's inevitable because candida fungi, they are ubiquitous. Uh, they are present on the skin, in the muco, on the mucous layer, uh, domestically. Uh, one can't avoid the contact with this fungi. In hospital, strains are more dangerous than next phase, candidose dysbiosis, especially if a patient receives antibiotics. There is a reduction in number of normal bacteria, the disruption of the normal contacts, and the next phase, phase invasive candidosis of uh, the bowel uh, that uh, 
has the features of serious colitis uh, with the danger of sepsis. Current tendency of the treatment of candida dysbiosis of, of intestines. Now we don't use the systemic azole medications, antibiotics, because uh, they, uh, are express, uh, they are expressed with urine, they are not concentrated in biofilm. It's better to use nystatin and natamycin tablets to prevent and correct dysbiosis. We can use a long regimen of current prebiotics with a great number of CFI. Also, the long courses, the long reg regimen of uh, current modern prebiotics and probiotics. Probiotics in case of IBDs may be dangerous. dangerous. There are cases with invasive mycosis caused by saccharomyces. Uh, there are uh, cases of sepsis uh, with lactobacillus. When uh, GEBT are used in IBD and large doses of steroids causing iatrogenic immune deficit, to use uh, medications with live probiotic strains are counterindicated. At the uh, level of, um, uh, in case of immune deficiency, probiotics, they are prohibited. Only prebiotics can be used. Therapeutic regimen in patients with a different candidosis of uh, bowels using immunosuppressors are the following. In case of candida carriage, there is no treatment only following up. If candidose, candidose dysbiosis, uh, there is no correction with polyenoic, antimycotic, and prebiotics. In case of invasive colitis or candidus colitis, it's necessary to use effective urgent therapy with the use of systemic azole-based medication, fluconazole, boriconazole, or henocandine antibiotics, caspapundin and micapundin, anigalapundin. In. Or if you if there is no else left anti uh, anti pheromestine B, but. Um, uh, this kind of antimycotic is very poorly tolerated. Thank you for your attention. I think that uh, my uh, presentation has been interesting. It's how our institute looks like. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, distinguished Mikhail. Thank you for a brilliant lecture. I'd like to express my, the words of gratitude to Michael. Uh, it's a brilliant scientist, uh, uh, the outstanding lector, lecturer. He has always supported our events. I am very grateful to you, Mikhail, for uh, the knowledge uh, that you have given to us as to mycology. Uh, we have our own postgraduate students. Uh, and uh, in the 1960s, uh, their theses were defended on the topic of uh, mycotic and when we are talking about uh, fungi that uh, built in, uh, they uh, may become paired uh, with, uh, uh, with a very bad person that uh, attracts other bad guys. The question is, what do you think, Mikhail, uh, when a patient is prescribed antibiotics, 
Three or probiotics are to be administered in each case. Yes, it's relevant. In this case, we can prevent candidos related these bacteria uh, in case if a patient is immunocompetent. But if a patient uh, at the time of uh, AB has already received high doses of uh, corticosteroids or GEBT, we, should, uh, we shouldn't use probiotics in this case. For example, if there are signs of Анатомицина. Нужно ли ему, тем не менее, при этом еще назначать пробиотики, или можно ограничиться только назначением натомицина? Обычно эти два класса препаратов комбинируются. У них разные задачи. Натомицин произведет эрадикацию грибов рода кандида, а пробиотики простимулируют эубиоз, то есть восстановление нормального количества нормальных бактерий, на местах адгезии. Выступление вызвало шквал вопросов. Еще один есть вопрос. Он не имеет отношения к воспалительным заболеваниям кишечника. Вот Вопрос следующий. Считаете ли вы, что в схемы эрадикационной терапии нужно для профилактики кандидоза включать натомицин? Это делают, но не у всех пациентов, а только с так, называемым, с так называемым анамнестическим прецедентом. То есть, если ваш пациент вам сообщает, что в прошлом, когда он получал антибиотики, у него развился кандидозный дисбиоз или кандидозное поражение другой локализации, вот в этом случае, когда мы понимаем, что система антифунгальной резистентности у пациента не действует, лучше применить натомицин вместе с компонентами радикационной схемы. А, Михаил Александрович, я от себя тогда еще спрошу, а скажите, пожалуйста, вот мы назначаем радикационную терапию в таких ситуациях, ну, стандарт это 10 дней, а натомицин тоже на 10 дней или дольше? Тоже на 10 дней, он Пожалуйста. хорошо переносится. Михаил Александрович, спасибо огромное, мы очень благодарны вам и до новых встреч с вами и с представителями вашей замечательной уже медицинской научной династии. Спасибо. Благодарю вас, Юрий Павлович. Я буду очень рад, если вы снова меня позовете. Для меня это большая честь. Спасибо. Уважаемые коллеги, мы продолжаем нашу работу, и э, вопросы поступили в том числе и по сути э, моего сообщения. Вопрос касается того, э, какие э, районы э, города теперь по новому распоряжению Комитета здравоохранения э, замкнуты э, на 31-ю больницу, а какие на Елизаветинскую больницу. Уважаемые коллеги, подробная информация имеется на сайте spb.ru, spb, gastro.spb.ru. Gastro.spb.ru – это гастропортал, который был создан по указанию Комитета здравоохранения и отражает мероприятия, деятельность, распоряжение, нормативную базу службы главного специалиста нештатного гастроэнтеролога по Санкт-Петербургу. И вот на этом портале gastrospb.ru содержится текст распоряжения Комитета здравоохранения, где прописаны те районы, города, которые остаются по-прежнему маршрутизируемы в 31-ю больницу и те, которые вновь маршрутизируются в Елизаветинскую больницу, где 13 апреля текущего года был открыт центр воспалительных заболеваний кишечника, где в настоящий момент функционирует и колл-центр, и имеются все необходимые тарифы для э, оказания помощи этому очень сложному контингенту пациентов, больных с воспалительными заболеваниями кишечника. На самом деле, э, открытием этого дополнительного центра наши планы, которые мы активно обсуждаем с руководством комитета, 
with the federal establishments, namely with uh, the first St. Petersburg Medical University named by Pavlov, where uh, there are all necessary conditions are created to ensure medical care uh, of IBDs of both regional and federal level. We cooperate with the university named by Mechnikov. In, uh, we cooperate with uh, the senior therapist, uh, Professor Bakulin. In the future, uh, the administration of our city is considering uh, the additional additional medical centers for routing of uh, IBD's patients because St. Petersburg is a large city and one of the candidates, one of the centers uh, there is likely to be open. It's at the hospital number 26, or it may called and may be called the hospital named by Kostyushka, with an extensive experience, well-equipped hospital, with their skilled and uh, qualified doctors to ensure health care for these difficult patients of IBDs of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's patients. Also, we have patients. Uh, also, there are questions to Yulia Fominich. Uh, these are the questions. Please answer, Yulia. Is it possible to prescribe for two patients with IBD, pregnant IBD, patients, uh, GEBTs for life-saving purposes, and what are the risks and benefits ratio of this GEBT? Next question. Maybe it's not related to gastroenterology, but uh, this question has been asked. If a female patient suffering from IBD, is it possible to permit her natural labor or a caesarean session should be used in this case? Distinguished Yuri, distinguished colleagues, thank you for the questions. It's a very good uh, that the audience is very active, very interesting. Uh, it means uh, that this event has been organized not in vain. It's necessary. And now let's answer the questions. The first question was about the genetically engineered biological treatments that are recommended to this vulnerable group of patients. The patient, uh, the patient is compromised immunocompromised uh, and physiologically compromised um, due to um, IBD and pregnancy. So what are the legitimate treatments that we can have recourse to? It's important to understand uh, that the um, genetically engineered biological treatments that are available in this country the only medication from this class is Simsia or Sertilizumab Virgo. We have had much experience with this medication. We started working with this um, medication initially as 
клинического исследования по нозологии ревматоидной артрита. Ревматоид, um, uh, for rheumatoid arthritis in the context of a trial rather than um, uh, gastroenterological practice. Официально в рамках нашей страны Российской Федерации зарегистрированы три показания. This medication has three registered um, indications, including Crohn's disease. Rheumatoid arthritis that has been mentioned several times today and a fairly novel indication is dermatological. So the medication medications to be um, initiated um, to IBD um, patients need to take multiple conditions into consideration. And um, the patient in question um, was pregnant, hence the choice of the medication. As far as my second question is concerned, we need to be aware that every case is unique. I concluded my presentation of the clinical case of a young woman with terminated second pregnancy. By quoting uh, recommendations that were issued in 2020 and that summarized our clinical and, uh, and practical um, experience accumulated in the country including the um, Akademischen Ivashkin and Akademischen uh, Schligen centers specializing in IBD. The recommendations spell uh, that the um, cases need to be approached on an individual basis and that the physician bears ultimate responsibility for the, um, the choice of treatment. And it's not possible to uh, make any prescriptions um, as, uh, any prescriptions as to um, cesarean section or vaginal delivery for all the patients. Every patient needs to be approached on an individual basis. As far as uh, Crohn uh, disease and um, ulcerative colitis are concerned, the onset of the disease if it's not um, a complex fulminant form, is associated with um, diarrhea. However, diarrhea um, can um, depend on a number of factors, including secretory, exudative. So for differential diagnosis, we need to rely on consensus from different physicians because the urodistal um, symptoms such as um, uh, pass, the presence of pus or blood um, are possible uh, in case of uh, infection um, related associated uh, intestinal diseases. So um, similar um, manifestations can occur in the irritable bowel um, syndrome. So this problem must be resolved through a dialogue of highly qualified gastroenterologists. It's um, unfeasible because the number of our patients is growing. 
адекватной трактовки симптомов Вадим Витальевич. Мы не так давно выпустили с ним э, учебное э, пособие по игранным вопросам гастроэнтерологии в технической практике, которое было утверждено диагностики. The book contains the diagnosis and routing of patients with IBD, with Crohn's disease and uh, ulcerative colitis. Education of GPs um, and ID physicians. The physicians and endoscopy specialists, um, those experts that are more likely to um, receive patients for primary visits, is of great importance. It's important to educate them. It's important to, ha uh, to have algorithms for differential diagnosis in place. Количество гастроэнтерологических in the functioning of um, different health care um, providers, starting from primary care institutions to um, specialized um, institutions of the federal level that employ a vast number of highly qualified experts, such as uh, the Pediatrics um, Institute, um, or the first medical university, also offering the services of highly qualified morphologists, gastroenterologists, and um, an IBD um, center headed by Professor Oksana Shukina. So our interdisciplinary dialogue is tantamount to the um, effectiveness of um, our treatment diagnosis and uh, to reducing the lead time between the diagnosis and the adequate treatment. So it will translate um, in um, the in disability and patient mortality. Уважаемые коллеги, ну вот okay, после э, нашей с вами э, дискуссии, ответов на вопросы, мы уже устали, поэтому я думаю, что э, перерыв, I который think, по нашему um, времени, заявлен, tired, предусмотрен, and... он будет э, весьма уместен. Итак, э, перерыв до 12 часов. Will be, часов um, uh, so a coffee break will be welcome. At 12 o'clock we will... Um, resume our um, workshop and enjoy the presentation by Professor Danese, Italy.
so uh, 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 dear Silvio, dear yes, Silvio, hello. dear Silvio, uh, I am absolutely thrilled to greet you. Uh, it's not a secret that Italy is my favorite country, but for Russia. There could be a number of reasons, but uh, the first five solution, uh, it is a um, uh, real combination, antique uh, and uh, modern tradition. Uh, so, uh, uh, please, Silvio, uh, your lecture will come. Uh, the treatment of uh, ulcerative colitis of mild to moderate severity evolution of algorithms. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction, but also for me, Russia is one of my favorite country. So let's hope that everybody is safe and very soon we will start to meet again together in person. So I will, uh, I will give a small overview in the next uh, uh, 15, uh, 20 minutes or so about how the situation has evolved for the treatment of our patients. And uh, this is uh, uh, a proposed algorithm. And I will uh, go deep into this, just to summarize why we got to this paper uh, now four years ago. So every time that we have a patient with mild and moderate, 5-SA is the major drug that you use. And what is very important is that we should use oral and topical, always, all the time. And then, of course, if the patient is in remission, we can continue with oral, with or without topical, this is a matter of discussion. And the other important aspect is down in the relapse. We need to push 5-SA as much as we can to bring the patient into remission. And if, if this is not happening, now we have uh, budesonide MMX, that is a very effective drug before going then to systemic steroids and then biologics. Let's look together how we have built this algorithm. And uh, this is uh, the first step, 5-SA, as you know, is the standard of care for the treatment and maintenance of our patients. But 5-SA is a drug that has been there for many, many years. So the key question is, in 2021, how to teach an old dog new tricks? And I think that there are three major aspects that we should take into account for which 5-SA is still a very valuable option for our patients. Well, first of all, we need to think about the best dose, high dose as optimal dose. Second is improvement of adherence and compliance for our patients. And once a day is the major breakthrough of 5-SA. And then, of course, also the concept of chemo prevention. This is something that we are using more and more in our clinical practice. So let's go back to this study that now has appeared since quite a bit of time. The MOTUS study, the MOTUS study is very relevant. This is a multi-center control randomized investigator blind comparative study looking at the demonstration that four grams, so high dose of pentaza once a day for eight weeks is non-inferior to two milligram uh, pentaza twice a day in terms of remission. And what is key is also the definition of remission with a UCDI score defined as at least uh, one point or below than one inactive patients with UC. Let's look at the data. The data show robust high remission rates. You see that overall 50% of patients uh, get into remission. But what I like very much is that for the consistent time in the literature, there is always a 10% better efficacy in getting all the 5SA once a day. Why this is happening? Honestly, I don't have the explanation. Maybe because giving more drug altogether brings more shutting down of inflammation. But this has been quite consistent. But what we know is that half of the patient can be in remission. And of course, when you look at remission rates for mucosal healing, defined as a UCDI score below than two, also here, you see the once a day is superior of at least 15 points. So I think that this is also a valuable option because confirm that today in 2021, when we want to give five SA to our patients, we just need to make it simple. I always tell to my patient, take it once a day and it will be the best. And I will show you 
this. So the first bulk is that high dose. This is key because you bring more patients into remission. The second is that, uh, you know, patients complain all the time and they trick about uh, their adherence. If you ask to a patient, are you taking the tablets? They will tell you yes, but we know that unfortunately patients are lying. Why is that? Well, it's very well reported in the literature that, for instance, if you ask the patients, how do you rate yourself? They will tell you I'm very good. But then at the end, when you measure in their, um, in their uh, urines, the 5SA secretion, the reality is the following. Look at this. Very few patients are really taking the full dose, but the majority of the patients are uh, not taking their tablets the way they should. So it means that most of the time, if a patient is relapsing, maybe it's simply because it's not taking enough 5SA to control the disease. Now, this is one of many papers that are present in the literature. We have seen this in multiple data sets, and I think that uh, this is a, a very relevant point. Why? Simply because it has been reported that patients that are not adherent as you see here in the orange line, are the ones that lose remission over time as compared to the patients that are adherent. This means that we need to educate our patients because an adherent patient is the patient that maintains remission over time. And this is my jingle. You know, you say one apple a day takes the doctor away. I always take, tell to my patients, Take your tablets once a day and we'll take the doctors away. So this is uh, the first step for 5SA. And I think that uh, is, uh, as I mentioned, very well known that we must combine high dose with integration of uh, um, topical. And this could be enough to maintain a lot of patients. But if we cannot achieve that, we have now a new steroid formulation, which is budesonide MMX. And of course, in 2021, which is the era of biologics, we don't want to use steroids, but of course, we can improve the type of steroids that we use for our patients. And in fact, I have to admit that I still use steroids in 2021, but why is uh, is happening simply because this is probably one of the most effective drugs that still we have of course we want to minimize as much as possible the exposure of steroids for our patients and they always uh, uh, think that steroids are angels or devils they are angels because they put us in uh, uh, in the safe space uh, when we have patients that are very uh, problematic, so they are very effective in uh, active disease, but they are devils because they have so many side effects for safety and because patients can become steroid dependent. And this brings to the long-term safety issues that we all recognize with steroids. Now, I'm sure, and we can discuss that most of you have seen the clinical picture that I'm going to show in a in a moment. But before that, I want to take this uh, image. This is British Medical Journal in 1965. So over 50, almost 60 years ago, look at the sentence that I've highlighted. During the 10 years of experience, remember steroids were used from uh, 1950 for the first time. And this is uh, telling that in BMJ, a drug lacking the potentially disastrous side effects of these agents has become increasingly necessary. Probably still the case because still I see a lot of patients like this. Look at the complications. You see patients with osteoporosis. I'm sure each one of you have seen patients with hip fracture, with vertebral fracture, and this should not happen in 2021. We know that patients bear high risk of infections. We know about edema. Cushing syndrome, cataracts, growth retardation in children, so the behavioral change. I've had so many patients that tell me I cannot sleep at night. Uh, I develop uh, cardiovascular complication besides the cosmetic side effects of patients, particularly women. So the issue is uh, that steroids have a lot of medically recognized side effects, but I think uh, there was a specific moment in the literature that we became particularly scared 
as gastroenterology about steroid use. And this happened uh, like in, the, uh, in, uh, in this painting of Munch, when we saw for the first time that steroids bear mortality much more than anti-TNF for immune suppressants. And I think this was the moment in which we switch our brain to minimize as much as possible the use of steroids for our patients and with the need of new medications that uh, reduce the risk of side effects, keeping the same efficacy. And this is the narrative that has been developed with Crohn's disease, with budesonide. You know very well that these uh, uh, low systemic bioavailable steroids. And of course, this has been uh, successfully used in our clinical practice in Crohn's disease for many years. How we can benefit of this also for ulcerative colitis. And this is the concept of uh, uh, targeting the colon with uh, budesonide with a colonic formulation. And this has been actually the new steroid formulation that is now available in most of the countries uh, that have uh, uh, similar or even higher uh, efficacy, but less toxicity. This is the MMX technology bringing the active compound towards the colon. And actually, you see this in the uh, scintigraphy pharmacokinetic of our patients looking at uh, uh, the distribution from the tablets towards the entire colon that is targeted within 24 hours. And when you look at this, you can clearly see that this is a drug that works. In fact, two major clinical trials have been uh, uh, reported recently, the core one and core two. And you see that this is a typical registration study, placebo, Cortiment or to reference arm, the classical budesonide formulation or azacol, 2.4 grams as a reference arm for eight weeks. This is the time that is uh, used. And when you look at efficacy, the results are very consistent. 18% overall of remission rates in the European study versus placebo, highly statistically significant. And the same is for the American study. So very consistent figures with robust efficacy for induction with an excellent um, safety profile. Now, what is key is that, of course, some colleagues will say, why so low efficacy bar with uh, uh, steroids, even though colonic and so on? Well, because in this case, the remission rates are always more and more robust as an point, and this will bring the placebo down, but will bring also the uh, active uh, drug uh, there uh, in, uh, into the... Um, into the uh, lower bars. And here, when you look at the uh, safety, this is a super safe drug. As you see, there are no major side effects when you compare to, uh, to placebo and does not inhibit the uh, corticolinia of our patients. This brings to a um, uh, key question. Should we taper with the MMX? The answer is no because um, if cortisolinia is not inhibited, then we should not uh, do that in our practice. But in my practice, I do every other day for a couple of weeks. I don't know what the other do, but we can discuss later on. So how do we put the new steroids in the, in the algorithm? Well, this was the old algorithm that we were using. And here we incorporate budesonide MMX before using systemic steroids. I think it's quite simple. And it's also important to think that we can also combine budesonide MMX. And this has been shown by this paper. This is from uh, David Rubin, the Contribute trial, in which it was clearly shown that add-on of budesonide plus 5SA versus placebo or 5SA alone brings to better efficacy rates in terms of uh, clinical remission, in terms of histologic killing. And of course, these are uh, all relevant endpoints for our patients with the excellent safety profile that you see here in this uh, table. What about comparing the different steroids formulation? Can we do that? Yes, we can do because simply you can uh, show with a network meta-analysis that budesonide MMX is the safest steroid formulation that we have in our practice uh, when you compare to placebo, of course, or uh, the other steroid formulation available as in this graph. And this shows that budesonide MMX 
is the best steroid that we have in terms of, uh, of safety profile. Now, there is a new story. The new story has been uh, recently reported uh, with the contribute uh, with the uh, core practice study, sorry, from theory to real life. This is the cover actually that the study got in UEG journal, uh, looking at uh, how the drug performs in real life. And when you look at this, this was uh, uh, real life use of, uh, of Budezone at MMX, looking at patient symptoms, uh, including proctitis. This is something that we use in practice, but we do not have data. And actually, I like very much the fact that uh, uh, this is a, a typical patient population that we have in our daily practice. And when you look at overall uh, patients, these are patients that can have monotherapy or combination, early or late with 5-SA optimization. And when you look at the data of core practice, I think that the bars for uh, response are very robust in terms of clinical benefit, clinical remission, symptomatic resolution or full symptom resolution. So in my view, this is uh, something very important because it uh, gives us the perception on how the drug from clinical studies will perform in clinical practice. So this is, uh, I think, the overall recap about this new steroid formulation. And I think that we should be happy to use it for our patients with mild to moderate ulcerative colitis. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention and I will be very happy to take any question. Dear Silvia, um, uh, we are more than absolutely pleased with uh, your brilliant lecture. Uh, and uh, uh, two questions, please. The first, have you got any own uh, experience uh, of administration uh, probiotics in complex treatment of patients with uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn disease? And uh, have you got uh, some uh, advantages or disadvantages, achievements due to? Uh, I would say that for colonic, this works very well, no matter what is the extension of the disease. And I've tried also with some patients with Crohn's disease, but in general in Crohn's disease, I tend to use uh, uh, more uh, different drugs simply because uh, in UC steroids works quite well. In Crohn's, not that effective. And, and the second question, second question, uh, are there any uh, uh, peculiarities um, uh, of treatment uh, people with Crohn disease or ulcerative colitis uh, who are suffering uh, from a new coronavirus infection? I would say that, uh, you know, for coronavirus and exposure of steroids, this has been recognized as one of the major issues, particularly in patients with chronic steroid exposure. But we also know that steroids can be used for pneumonia in uh, coronavirus. So I think it's a tricky situation, even though the rule is always the same. We should minimize as much as we can the use of steroids for our patients. Thank you very much, uh, dear Silvia. Uh, and uh, our respect uh, from uh, Windy, uh, from uh, Run, uh, from Saint Petersburg, Saint Petersburg, and we hope to meet you next time. Thank you very much. Yes, with pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care. Be safe. Bye. Thank you. Уважаемые коллеги, ну вот после нашего глубоко уважаемого международного
профессору Галагудзе Михаилу Михайловичу, Михаил Михайлович, лекцию на the lecture, тему новые возможности new, в рамках симпозиума новые возможности ведения IBD patient. The topic is the role of increased permeability of epithelial barrier and intestinal dysbiosis in the pathogenesis of IBD. Dear colleagues, good afternoon. We have started our symposium devoted to new approaches of management patients with IBD. In this presentation, I will show new data as to pathogenesis and etiology of IBD. We all know quite well that IBD is represented by two forms, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. In case of Crohn's disease, uh, there will be any part of a GIT involved. Inflammation is characterized by segmental impairment. Uh, we can see a deep linear ulcers in the wall of the bowel. In many cases, fissures are formed, and it is accompanied by the narrowing on the lumen of the GIT uh, strictures developed. In, our, uh, in case of ulcerative colitis, it's a diffuse superficial inflammation mostly involves uh, jejunum from uh, rectum to sigmoid up to the transverse colon. Here we see uh, uh, we see a uh, superficial ulcers in a chronic condition, thinning of the wall of uh, the bowel. Let's discuss the pathology. In case of Crohn's disease, uh, the disease may happen during the whole length of GIT. The wall is thickened, hypertrophy of muscular uh, terminal is a transmural inflammation with the development of granulomas. Uh, there will be the fatty layer. Uh, there are deep tissues, but uh, uh, cobalt uh, cells are intact. In case of colitis, mostly the rectum, the thinning of the wall, only mucosa layer is involved in form of diffuse inflammation. Sometimes there may be pseudo polyps. It's a part of a retained uh, parts of mucosa, and we can see uh, the condition, uh, the changes in the uh, cobalt cells. In 1920s, the epidemiology results were published throughout the world. 30 years were analyzed uh, from na the 1990s up to current days. We can see the increase in the number of cases of uh, IBDs. Now there are more than 4 million of women with IBD and 3 million of men. Mostly the incidence rate is higher in the developed countries, in the UK, in the USA, in Norway. Let's talk about etiology and pathogenesis of IBD. Today, inflammatory bowel diseases are considered as a classical multifactorial disease. The etiology is uh, genetic factors and environmental factors. Genetic predisposition is based on the carriage of more than 230 loci of the predisposition genes uh, that are connected with the uh, congenital and adaptive immunity. Uh, they code antimicrobial peptide and regulate epithelium function of GIT. Uh, the environmental factors, uh, they involve uh, of food uh, behavior, stress, smoking, deficiency of vitamin D, appendectomy, and some drugs. When environmental factors uh, they impact uh, unfavorable genetic environment, two consequences: dysbiosis and uh, increase in uh, barrier, gut barrier permeability. Uh, there is a loss of tolerance to common cell bacteria and we can see the 
uh, activation of uh, inheritance immunity activated. Luca said uh, they start, uh, start to infiltrate uh, their uh, gut. Here we can see the genetic basis of IBD. You can see that inflammatory diseases are heterogeneous. In the majority of cases, in adults, we can see domination of polygenic form, or multifactorial form that is based on uh, the combination of different factors. The, it's, uh, the instrument of the genetic factors is wide uh, genomic uh, sequencing. There may be monogenic forms of IBD. It's a classical Mendel's forms of inheritance. Uh, there are such number of diseases, uh, more than 50. They are more rare, and to detect them, we use uh, their new generation sequencing. Uh, their environmental factors, they are high in case of polygenic forms. And here we consider external factors and changes in microbiota. I'd like to cite one example of the monogenic form of IBD mutation in the gene of the gene NOD that code uh, the uh, PANET cells. Muramyl dipeptide stimulates the receptors node 2. Uh, we can see the sentence of antimicrobial peptides. They are released in the lumen of the bowel, and they retard their commensal bacteria growth. In case of monogenic uh, disease uh, with mutation of NOD and OD2, there are no receptors, no definizines are released, we can see extensive uh, dysbiosis that triggers chronic inflammation, and we see the involvement of uh, mesenterial uh, lymph nodes. To find new mutation, to detect new mutations in IBD, uh, clinic genomics is used. We speak about predictive genomics. It considers a great deal. Of, we study a great deal of patients uh, with a short uh, history of the disease. Uh, we used to have analytic genomics predominant. Uh, we studied sequencing bioinformative analysis, and we found either no mutation or, if we are lucky, we can find new mutation associated with IBD. It's very interesting, because on the basis of predictive genetics, we can not only describe new mutations and connect them with IBD, but can uh, customize the therapy with uh, the severe monogenic forms. Here we can see the example of situations where genes uh, coding T cells response and uh, result in dysfunction of T regulators can be corrected with the transplantation of uh, uh, stem cells. Uh, but uh, it's a uh, personal, personalized approach. As to polygenic IBD, it's very difficult to discuss uh, the role of each out of 230 loci. Uh, now, uh, this uh, NET diagram is used to illustrate genetic uh, landscape in polygenetic form. We see several large herbs, for example, to recognize microbes, adaptive Im immunity, regulation of epithelial barrier, and then some, uh, minor functions as to great ovals. And the, on the lines uh, that are connecting these functions, we can see the genes uh, that have the positive IBD variants. Here the phenotype is being formed. And the last point as to genetic basis of IBG, sometimes we underestimate the coexistence of mutation of the genes and an uh, unfavorable uh, set of candidate genes. The number of unfavorable candidate genes defines the expression of the clinical phenotype. Sometimes patients with the mutation of NCF1, they may not manifest uh, IBD 
because the threshold of phenotype is not reached. But if there is a mutation plus unfavorable candidate genes, we see the chronic granulomatosic disease. And this, uh, uh, this is a polygenic form of uh, IBD. And concluding this part of uh, genetic part of the lecture, I'd like to give you the slide. It's a uh, customizing of therapy of IBD in 10, 15 years when we will have more clear indications related to the phenotype of this or that patient. Then question is the immunopathogenesis of IBD and the role of a gut microbiota in triggering of IBD. Here the slide shows a good variant, favorable variant with the activation of the immune mechanisms in IBD. Uh, the ex environmental factors, they act at the unfavorable genetic uh, background. These biosis happened. The activation happens of both macrophages and they are congenital immunity and dendrite cells that are the first part of adaptive immunity. Activated macrophages, they release a set of pro-inflammatory cytokines, NAT, interleukin-1, interleukin 2, 6, uh, 23, dendrite, dendrite cells after consuming antigen uh, they represent them to naive T helper. T helpers zero, zero. Then they develop to T helpers one, two, three. They are the cells of adaptive immunity. They release uh, their pro inflammatory cytokines that are different interferon gamma, interleukin 4, 13, 17. There may be crossing of TNF. A TNF may be secreted in congenital and adaptive immunity cells. This cytokine response lead to the loss of tolerance of the immune system to bacteria commensal and uh, triggers inflammatory, chronic inflammatory. Much uh, uh, intention is played to the role of uh, food consumption. It's uh, proved uh, that uh, Mediterranean diet uh, rich in fiber, fruit, uh, seafood, nuts, results in the biodiversity of microbiota, normal function of uh, uh, gut barrier, and the Western diet accompanied uh, with a great number of unfavorable factors by these biosis increase in permeability of a gut barrier with translocation of bacteria and the disturbance of immunity tolerance. Let's look at uh, the slide how the pattern of food consumption of Western diet is being changed. Uh, uh, we can see the increase in popularity and the increase in the portion, size of the portion for the last 50 years. It's very concerning in case of IBD. I am microbiota role. In the mucosa of the small and large bowels, there is a multi-level defense from penetration of uh, bacteria into the mucosa layer. This defense system some authors compares with the access control uh, that we have at uh, enterprises. The first access control is related to the mechanical removal of uh, these pathogens from uh, the mucous barrier. It's uh, immunoglobulin R that prevents adhesion of the bacteria. The second level of the axis is reduction in the accumulation of symbionts in the mucous terminal. Here we see a different mechanism, mechanism of cellular immunity, uh, killing by neutrophils, cytokine induction of the death of bacteria, lymphocytes of congenital immunity started to act, and dendrite cells. The third level of protection uh, starts activating if bacteria gets into the blood flow for this. 
Uh, we have a reticular endothelial system or the system of the monio, mo, uh, uh, mononuclear phagocyte. Uh, they protect the body from the bacteria. It's a Kupfer cells that captures foreign particles. This is a multi-level protection, uh, uh, protection, uh, may malfunction in case of IBD. It leads to dysbiosis. Uh, there are two types of dysbiosis, early and late. Early dysbiosis happens uh, at the phase of induction. It's characterized by acute inflammatory uh, when some uh, but we have the penetration through bar uh, barrier and inflammatory cells started to develop its congenital immunity. Then uh, the second part, chronic inflammatory late dysbiosis that is characterized by the reduction in biodiversity of microbiota, expansion of some patabioids, uh, there is increase in proteobacteria and reduction in promycotobacteria. Late dysbiosis is characterized by the loss of useful bacteria. We see the chronic inflammation with infiltration of mucosa by the cells of adaptive immunity, lymphocytes of congenital uh, in, uh, immunity, uh, till helpers and interleukins. Everything is based on the influence of uh, gut microbiota. Slide shows different approaches related to microbiota. Uh, it's both transplantation of gut microbiota uh, that by direct indirect mechanisms can ensure favorable effect. The use of antibiotics uh, that have direct and indirect mechanism of action. The use of pro and prebiotics, uh, medications. Very interesting aspect to use uh, genetically modified microorganisms that can modulate the immunity of the host, ensuring pro inflammatory effect. And of course, uh, the uh, effect of diets. Then oh, we start uh, talking about therapeutic targets in case of IBD. Here I'd like to show the main blocks uh, that we target. Uh, there are three blocks. The first block, uh, the mostly developed aspect, uh, the suppression of cytokine secretion and prevention of immune activation. At the second level, uh, we shall regulate accumulation of leukocyte in the mucous layer. It's a dynamic process. We can influence the inflow of leukocytes and we can influence the uh, exiting of leukocytes from their um, gut. The slide shows different medications uh, that have already been approved for the use. They are in blue and medications that are in the uh, pipeline and at the level of clinical trials. Medication blocked pro-inflammatory cytokines, pro-NTF factors, interleukin-12, 23, and uh, ankinized uh, pathway. There are a great number of pipeline uh, that uh, block the cytokine signaling. As to, we will be talking about vedalizumab, anti-antigrine medication that is approved for medical use. It reduces the, the entering of lymphocyte into the mucous layer. Very interesting approach uh, that is being uh, that is not been used in practice in our country. It's a removal of the immune cells from the mucous layer and sequestration of lymph nodes to prevent uh, the leukocytes entering into the lumen of the gut. The pipe life, or the uh, antagonists of uh, mucros uh, TNF factors. And uh, we will be talking about this medication SMART. Uh, the, uh, it's a heterogeneous group. They are different as uh, to their functions. The majority of them, they have the capability to act and the soluble NTF alpha. Uh, they may be the action at the FC receptors. 
uh, the cytotoxic mechanism and all the mechanisms of biological medications uh, antagonists of TNF. As two mechanisms, blocking T cells and uh, T cell signaling in IVC, there are medications that block signaling via receptors of interleukin-23, interleukin-12. There are some prospects of the use of blockers of receptors interleukin-6 and interleukin-1. Glucocorticoids, uh, they are still a basic therapy of IBD, uh, causing non-specific pro-inflammatory action. Uh, start uh, inhibitors of signaling pathway and blockers of cytokines, uh, TNF-alpha, golimumab, and in the, in the pipeline we have the blockers of IL-17. Aprilax is not used, immunosuppressant is not used, present is not used for active therapy of IBD. One more pathogenic slide that illustrates the mechanism of accumulation of leukocyte in mucosa and targets for medications, so they act at this. On the left, you can see the exiting of leukocytes into the tissue. Uh, they are encoding by lig ligand receptors. You can see a great number of medications that are in a pipeline and approved for medical use. On the top, a huge leukocyte. On its surface, the different ligands, different receptors. We block integrins. MATCOM, ECOM-1, with alikafarsen that is in the, at the stage of development. Next point, uh, the block, uh, block from, uh, from uh, uh, leukocyte from lympho nodes. It's very interesting group of medication, Trasimod, Amisalimod, and then retaining leukocyte in the mucous layer. We can prevent this. Hemoattractant can be blocked to prevent this. And we can act on chemokine and chemokine receptors. Let's talk about the current status of treatment of IBD and look into the future. I'd like to say that apart from medications that block accumulation of leukocyte into the, in the mucosa, only one medication is approved. In Tibio, Vedolizumab, it's a good example of this selective interfering and preventing side effect. Vedolizumab acts only on one protein, one tagging, alpha-4-7 integrin. And selectivity is ensured because Alpha-4, beta-7, integrin is expressed at the surface of lymphocyte in GIT. Alpha-4, beta-7, integrin integrates only with MATCOM-1 that usually express on the endothelium of the cells, of the vessels of the gut. Two meta-analysis of clinical trials showed that the use of verdalizumab didn't lead to the increase in post-operative complications. I'd like to show you transcellular action of uh, the dolizumab. On the top, there's a real time. It shows transcellular migration of mononuclear leukocyte. With mononuclear. Uh, marked with a white arrow adhered to the surface of endothelia of microvessel of the gut, then in perinuclear area there is a deepening of leukocyte in the cytoplasm of endothelium and then it enters at the opposite side. Vedalizumab acts at this point of pathogenesis, blocking interaction of lymph leukocyte with the surface of endothelium. And then leukocyte, they can't cross through the capillary barrier and can't be accumulated into the mucosa. Current trial 
four medications, anti-integrins inhibitors of in IL-23, inhibitors of JAK-STAT, and modulators of CIP. There are two aspects in this table. First, there is no similar effectiveness in case of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Tofa CT NIP approved in um, uh, ulcerative colitis, it has been removed from the second phase. Anti antigreen medications, some of them, they are not effective in a Crohn's disease. And that's one more point. Some of these medications, they are approved by FDA in case of psoriatic, uh, psoriasis, uh, multiple sclerosis, and ru rheumato uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we still uh, the look into the future. The system, systemic biology and multi-omics data. By the time in clinici clinicians will have more and more data, new mass of data will be available, not only clinical trial data, not only literature data, but a huge data related to genetic, to genetic epigenome, transcriptome, and even cytokinome. The cytokines that are typical of the certain patient in at certain time, and microbiomic, these multiomic data that form an individual phenotype with IBD, and this individual phenotype will lay the foundation of a customized therapy of this serious disease. Of course, we are not talking about a real customized approach. We are talking about forming a group of patients that are similar. Uh, by these data. Then we will do molecular profiling, and this approach will open up new biomarkers of IBD. At this point, I will finish. Thank you for, for your attention. Mikhail has left us for a moment on urgent business and delegated the question on the session to me. The, um, I will deal with the question that we have received, which is, is it advisable to administer step-down therapy to all patients with ulcerative colitis, uh, colitis using high selective medications such as vetolizumab. The question is about step-down and step-up therapy, including gastroenterology, and this is a difficult question, a question that is open to many interpretations and discussions. I remember how 20 years ago, when the consensus was adopted on um, Proton pump inhibitors um, being um, the safest, uh, the most um, effective for um, gastric reflux diseases. And this concept was adopted and extrapolated to clinical practice. And then a number of trials confirmed that long term use of uh, proton pump inhibitors due to the low efficacy of um, acid um, barrier is accompanied, is associated with 
increased numbers of intestinal infections, such as yersiniosis. It was also proved that long-term acid suppression was also associated with the increased rate of uh, pneumonia and um, hip fractures. Due to um, the suppression of uh, phagocytary activity in neutrophils, which causes pneumonia, and um, suppression of um, osteoclast maturation it's associated with osteoporosis. A similar situation can be observed in the use of GEBD. It is absolutely evident that a sensible consensus between standard therapy, including 5-ASA, along with other treatments such as probiotics and GBD must be sensible, it must be comprehensive, and it must be cost-effective. As the country authorities, the city authorities, the regional budgets, cover part of the cost associated with providing treatments to IBD patients. And GBD is a very expensive form of treatment. But there is no country that um, would encourage healthcare providers to um, administer GBD as the starting initial um, therapy, not only because of the cost considerations, but also because GBD um, are not free from serious side effects. So it is our goal in our clinical practice to navigate between the silly and the charybdis and to prescribe GBD only to such patients who need it. Are there clinical cases when GBD should be administered at the initial stage of treatment? Yes, there are clinical situations when we prescribe GBD to patients at the very start, but the number of such cases is very low. And we also use an individualized approach to every patient. Next, dear colleagues, let us proceed. And I would like to give the floor to Professor Vasilenko. Nogora the Great, who will focus on his, ex on his, uh, <coughs> sorry, on his experience of um, providing um, patients in Nogora Oblast with um, uh, the IBD medications. Hello, dear colleagues. I am not a gastroenterologist. I am a rheumatologist, and I will be focusing on GBD targeted therapy as a rheumatologist. Nogora region is one of the parts um, within the Northwest Federal District. In terms of funding through the um, federal programs, the Novgorod uh, region is um, seriously underfunded. Demographically, the smallest region within the North Federal District. 
We have less than um, 600,000 people residing here. We have good poorer uh, birth rates, but high mortality rates. And the mortality uh, rate is um, associated uh, largely with um, cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases. The health care expenditures um, are unfortunately quite low. The budget allocations um, are just 17, um, um, used to be just 17 percent a few um, years ago and have reduced to 15 percent. Um, in um, 2020. The key source of funding is uh, the um, governmental subsidies. A regional funding accounts for just a small proportion of the funding at 21%. In terms of funding through the uh, state guarantees uh, national uh, funding program, you will see that the funding per um, hospitalization are lower than the national average. In terms of um, pharmaceuticals and um, available for these. You see that GBD and target therapy are procured largely by healthcare providers themselves. Federal and regional concessions are very low. Если вы посмотрите на северо-западный федеральный округ, мы с вами прекрасно видим на слайде, совпадает практически во всех регионах северо-западного федерального округа с теми препаратами, которые входят в список жизненно важных лекарств. Да, на сегодняшний день мы сами прекрасно понимаем, что пришла эра лечения больных с инженерных биологических и селективных a number of areas where um, this type of therapy can be used, including rheumatology and gastroenterology, cardiology, pulmonology. All of these medications are used, but selective immunodepressants in rheumatology are the uh, most widely spread medications. The Russian Healthcare Ministry Назначение селективных иммунодепрессантов при артропатиях и спондилопатиях и, естественно, Мы прекрасно понимаем, что для того, чтобы эта сцепка получилась правильно, для того, чтобы случай у нас был оплачен, мы должны правильно поставить деньги и правильно зашифровать болезнь, которая будет совпадать с первичным. Дальше мы Кроме этого, есть много, что я сегодня 
то в данном случае regulations. есть и uh, коды услуги, которые характерны для больных, которые получают терапию, uh, в гастроэнтерологическом профиле. Это назначение лекарственных хематологического профиля, что искать uh, препараты терапии не нужно препаратов для лечения болезни Заболеваний, которых If you look at the list of rheumatic diseases using GBT group, target therapy, there are five groups, five codes of services. That include, that cover a large number of diseases. Is treated with medications that um, can um, be described with four codes for different groups of diseases. For gastroenterology, случаи, которые встречаются в лечении у гастроэнтеролога, здесь значительно меньше чем в гематологии. Available compared to rheumatology. You need to be aware that if you have two codes, you need to correctly um, document the uh, case and to indicate two diagnosis codes for every patient eligible for GEBD. препараты и селективные иммунодепрессанты, которые закуплены за счет пациент должен получать либо в круглосуточном или в дневном стационаре. И те препараты, которые закуплены в стационаре, to outpatient patients and outpatient care. At uh, the country or for a particular territory within a country to be able to get the minimal federal rate the um, state coverage is 60% um, of the cost of the medication um, in inpatient treatment used in inpatient treatment уровень федеральной ставки. Но тем не менее, все мы работаем в системе КСГ и прекрасно понимаем, что э, для того, чтобы получить больному терапию, get access to GBD treatment. The um, high cost must be made, uh, must be met. And you need to uh, submit the um, right applications to um, obtain uh, the um, coverage of the cost. Different functions can be able to um, obtain the funding, functions, the... Uh, Governance quotient 
или учет региональных особенностей оказания медицинской помощи. Новгородскую область в 2020 году мы должны были иметь вот эти и за счет управленческого коэффициента, как видите, вот, он здесь поставлен 0, может быть, administrative administrative quotient, which may vary around 1.8. Due to the low tariff, the territorial regulator identified the, um, established the quotient at uh, 1.8. In 2021, the quotient is uh, now uh, labeled specificity quotient. The basic rates for uh, take care centers have um, grown in Novgorod Oblast as well as elsewhere. Regards to the um, cost of daycare and um, inpatient care, the need of GBD, the regulators created ideal conditions, unique conditions, whereby we can hospitalize a patient for one or three days and um, obtain the full amount of cost coverage. И вот посмотрите, в принципе, моя гордость, наша гордость на региона. У нас маленькое количество жителей. На секундочку я напомню. Regions in the Russian Federation, and we have 336 patients, rheumatological, rheumatology patients that are receiving GBD and target therapy. So at present, our patients can get access to any GBD registered in Russia. And um, patient routing is uh, taken care of. The patient uh, is received by a rheumatologist who, who diagnoses the um, disease and administers the correct therapy. And if the validated um, indicators um, of activity for um, the patient, the target indicators of activity are not met, the patient uh, is referred to the chief rheumatologist who selects patients for um, GBD, the patient is hospitalized. After which, the multidisciplinary team uh, meets and makes a decision um, on uh, the necessity of administering GBD to the patient. In this case, if the uh, decision is made against um, the um, patient continuous treatment, um, we the um, initial course of treatment, uh, if the uh, consent is given, the patient receives GBD at their place of residence. Unfortunately, in 2017, the uh, program supplying patients with GBD uh, through um, compulsory uh, medical insurance has collapsed. 
Да, на сегодняшний день все специалисты, которые работают с генеральными препаратами, должны... Physicians uh, uh, prescribing GBD must uh, be aware of the fact that there are several funding sources um, that can cover for uh, this expensive treatment. Last year, we were able to administer GBD, even if GBD was not included in the um, federal list of crucial vital medication. In addition, there is a large group of outpatient centers where patients may receive concessions uh, for, uh, and uh, be reimbursed for part of their treatment costs. In rheumatology, it is also possible to obtain GBD for uh, diseases included into the list of orphan uh, conditions and complaints. The uh, compulsory medical insurance system makes it possible to uh, provide patients with um, uh, GBD using a very simple uh, calculation formula for the reimbursement. There are subgroups within um, different clinical groups of patients that um, are eligible to um, different quotients that can also be included into calculations. The subgroups of patients are identified. We need to provide funding only upon a close assessment of each patient case. Because if we identify groups we where just a small number of patients uh, receive GBD, it will not be feasible, it will not be rational. We can identify subgroups using MKB-10 uh, reference or additional classification criteria. If the latter, classification criteria must be included into the register negotiated by um, medical decision makers. The criteria need to be standardized and documented. If you decide to identify those subgroups, the subgroups must be um, fairly sizable. One or two or three patients is not enough. Препарат, который стоит дороже, чем законченный случай, это можно, в принципе, растворять среди тех дополнительных маржинальностей, которые мы получаем на других препаратах. So let us uh, look at the situation using a specific example. For example, we have selective immunodepressants such as vegilizumab, which is reimbursed using the basic rate. The, um, we need to look at the total number of patients who will be eligible to um, obtain this medication, um, the GBD receivers, recipients. We select all the expensive medications. We see the number of cases which require treatment with these medications. And for every costly medicine, we can uh, calculate the quotient. 
the sum will remain identical. Uh, uh, so if we have a basic rate of 535, the uh, completed case cost is 7.21. So we get the medication, uh, add the margin, and uh, get the quotient of 7.21. Uh, we divide the initial sum using the basic rate, and we get this quotient, 7.21. Let us take a look what is happening today. If we have another a more expensive medication, we increase this value to marginal, divide the sum by the basic rate, and get the quotient 9.662. But if you look at all the other cases, less costly ones, the quotient is much less. We have the quotient, it's 3.51, and if the medication costs uh, 60,000 um, to 50,000 rubles, um, this will help us to um, fall within the um, established um, allocation of 70,000. If the group is uh, quite large and virtually map is used in large amounts, the share of ITNF um, patients um, will uh, go down. So these decisions are made by the local medical community, by the territorial funds. The decisions are approached on a one-to-one -one basis. In Novgorod district, we don't identify subgroups. The, do not use medications that cost um, more than the completed case. Because owing to the margin that we obtain, we can cover isolated cases of therapy, for example, using vatulizumab in uh, gastroenterology and rheumatology. So at present, the obligatory medical insurance system provides opportunities for gastroenterologists and rheumatologists to use GBD. And um, that leads to improvements in the patient's quality of life, as well as control over disease activity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. I loved your presentation. For two reasons. One, because I have a special feeling towards Novgorod district, because this is where my ancestors come from, this is where my mother comes from, she still lives there. And because Novgorod Pediatric um, University is my um, uh, my main place of residence, collaborates with Novgorod um, District and uh, its healthcare decision makers on a number of medical issues. Um, and I conducted a screening in um, a town in Novgorod District. Second, I appreciate your ideas about 
the fact that we shouldn't consider um, healthcare expenditure primitively. We need to view them in context of a complex formula that includes better sequelae profile, uh, the reduction in the number of risk hospitalization, decreasing disability, decreasing mortality, ultimately. And all of these are highly important issues. Quality of life is also crucial because um, quality of life is um, a term that is not only applicable to functional diseases. Quality of life is a term that is applicable to patients with inflammatory diseases as well. So this approach should be hailed and your logic in calculating the direct and indirect as well as associated costs of treatment is really very valuable for the whole healthcare system. There was one question from our attendees, and I would like to read it in full. When conducting therapy with GBD, it is required to uh, control immunological and histochemical indicators. You, you can't um, go about um, administering endoscopy after each case. So how do you handle the situation? How do you identify which patients are eligible for GBD? If you have a patient with um, highly active disease, or uncontrolled disease, you need to use the, uh, the NP system for uh, administering the medication. You have laws about quality criteria that specify how often you can perform this or that examination or administer this or that procedure. In rheumatology, we don't do uh, joint angiograms every month. System, when just selecting therapy, when you need to initiate GBD or target therapy, if you need to continue the um, therapy, you can use clinical statistical groups um, established by the compulsory medical insurance system to cover the um, cost of treatment. I showed you that for um, that these negotiations, these procedures will require just between one and three days. So the hospitalization in such cases may be really short. For cases uh, with lower quotients, if hospitalization will be less than four days, you um, will provide. You will be provided with just fifty percent of the funding. However, now um, we have a unique opportunity to um, use GBD for um, one to three days, along with uh, the um, minimal examinations required. Thank you very much for your exhaustive question. Uh, for your exhaustive answer. We look forward to collaborating um, with the rheumatology community 
The uh, rheumatology and gastroenterology um, community have um, shown, um, have enjoyed collaborative um, relations um, owing to Akademishan Lazebnik, who um, ensured that this communication takes place. And we do hope that um, this collaboration and our fruitful contacts can continue. Thank you for this well-informed uh, report, because the system of knowledge that you have presented may be a bit difficult to conceive for a practical physician, but we cannot distance ourselves from the economic aspects of therapy. So thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you. Good luck with your work. Um, ladies and gentlemen, and we will continue our um, work, and I would like to present the floor to um, the to Professor Bulganeva of Kazan. Kazan is um, a fantastic place. It's a place uh, to learn from. It's a place that we love interacting with, and it's a place that um, has fantastic traditions in medicine. Uh, it's also a place um, of the, um, uh, the only place where the um, uh, uh, monument to Leo Gomilov, ethno-geographer, um, is installed. Um, it's, um, um, uh, the monument is inscribed with the uh, caption, I was the only person that protected, uh, uh, that defended uh, the Tatars from um, Kolomny. Um, our speaker here is one of the greatest experts in her field. She will talk about the optimal uh, sequence of therapy for patients with IBD. Thank you so much for very good introduction. I am very thankful for this, uh, to the Scientific Commission to participate in the conference with my presentation. After this exhausted uh, presentation as to the financial aspects of biotherapy, uh, the emphasis should be made on the consequence of the therapeutic regimens uh, with uh, uh, patients of IBD. Dear colleagues, when we are talking about suggested way to select the optimal therapy of IBD, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, together with the patients, we go through five steps. Uh, it's the right concept first, because ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease like uh, COBD and uh, arterial hypertension. Uh, it's correct time. We know that the first 18 months after the diagnosis of uh, ulcerative colitis and especially Crohn's disease, it's a time where the minimal damage to the body is being done. It's a very difficult immunological cellular pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, uh, they, they are manageable by current therapy, and we have this instrument at hand. It's a correct goal. We shall achieve endoscopic remission and uh, preferably histological remission in case of ulcerative colitis. It's a right follow-up. We know that uh, proper follow-up, these are the time frame that we have between uh, the relapse of the disease and uh, clinical remission. Three months, and from six to nine months, it's a clinical endoscopic remission. If we doesn't achieve this, we think about the change of uh, medication. The most difficult step out of five is the right patient. Uh, as well as in any other chronic non-infectious disease, arterial hypertension, ischemic uh, heart disease, uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, IBD is not exception. It has a heterogenic symptoms, as bowel symptoms, uh, extra intestinal manifestations, involvement of the colon, um, the stomach. One of the main points in managing a patient is 
forecasting or prognosing. A work of a doctor is different from a work of a nurse or um, other medical workers. Uh, they can uh, correct uh, their uh, arterial blood pressure crisis, but they can't, they, they can't forecast. It's very important to manage patients properly. It's a clinical mastership. When we make a decision of managing a patient with IBD, we have three large blocks, and each of these blocks a doctor analyzes seeing a patient. The first, uh, the, the suffering uh, that the disease uh, causes, uh, the activity of the attack, and the degree of IBD, mild, moderate, severe. The second important point we have in our hands is the instrument that allow us to say whether a patient has uh, factors of non-favorable cause of the disease or not. And the third very important point is localization and complications. When we are talking about the severity of the attack and severity of complications, we uh, formulate this in the diagnosis. The right formulated diagno diagnosis is the right program of the treatment of a patient. According to current clinical guidelines, we reflect not only localization that the severe of the attack, but the cause of the disease, the presence of the hormonal dependence and resistance, and presence of extra intestinal or perianal uh, manifestations. Uh, it's very important for the administration of uh, GERD. When we are talking about the severity of the disease and the severe of the attack, severity of the disease is a more or wider uh, notion. For example, extra intestinal manifestation, uh, the refractory, uh, the long lasting of uh, the disease, they are included into the overall picture of the severity of the disease. We need to remember, while treating patients with IBD, is a notion of hormonal resistance and hormonal dependency. Because in our country, traditionally, glucocorticosteroids, they may be considered as a conventional drug of treatment of the Crohn's disease and uh, ulcerative colitis, because the majority of patients, uh, they took either topical steroids or systemic steroids. And this kind of treatment is widely spread in our country. It's important to distinguish these two points. Hormonal resistance we don't see quite frequent when a patient is resistant to high doses of uh, glucosteroids. These are the patients with severe and extreme severe uh, IBD cause. Mostly in clinical practice, we see patients with the uh, steroid dependency uh, when they are prescribed for a long time our glucocorticosteroids. When we can't reduce the steroids less than 10 milligrams per day, otherwise the patient will relapse. Or, for example, if we discontinue steroids for three months, the patient will relapse. When we talk about risk stratification, it's a second block. Now we are living in quite lucky time, because uh, uh, here annually, and uh, uh, the factors uh, of uh, uh, ulcerative colitis and uh, Crohn's disease, uh, they are being added, uh, they are being upgraded, and they are being amended. There are, uh, the, more, the later the diagnosis is made, uh, the less favorable is cause of the disease, uh, the age, uh, older than 60, 65 years of age uh, resulted in colon colonoctomy. It's endoscopic activity. Uh, the need for corticosteroids, elevation of CRP, CRP and uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, it's uh, severe ulcers and comorbidities. These are the factors uh, that are unfavorable for a cause of the disease. And localization, 
and comorbidity. Comorbidity is an immune associated condition. It has been already mentioned that many problems that are similar uh, patients suffering with IBD and patients suffering with the arthritis. Now we are considering a bit different patients with IBD, especially when we see them at the second part of their life, and uh, the comorbidities that are related to atherosclerosis, oncological diseases, and virus hepatitis B, C, and others. All these points are to be taken into account. When we are talking about current therapy of IBD, we mean four main groups of medications. And we are happy that there are four of them because we worked for a long time with one. It's a TNF factor alpha, vedalizumab, ustekinumab, uh, interleukin, interleukins uh, 12 and 23 and uh, the small molecule galibizumab. When in previous meditation uh, we have had the information about uh, their uh, small molecules and anti-TNF factors. Current therapy of IBD may be concentrated in two blocks. It's uh, the means for clinical remission and induction, and the second block uh, for endoscopic remission, and the second block uh, the maintenance of remission. If you look at uh, all medications, glucocorticosteroids may be used for the induction of remission, but not for maintenance of remission. And it's uh, widely recognized throughout the world. As to the sequence of uh, biomedications in small molecules, regardless uh, our exchange of experience inside the, in the, the country and outside of the country, uh, there are no guidelines as to optimal sequencing of GBD. Some, let's look uh, what now we have in guidelines in ulcerative colitis. It's an upper block in Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. We see the GBD. Uh, TNF alpha, belizumab, ustikunab, and then small molecules. It's continu continuity sequence. What to select first and what to select next. Approved by RIC guidelines. And it's uh, not stipulated in guidelines in 2020. Much questions have been asked as to the prescription of GEBD. The situation is unclear, it's not satisfactory. Why? Because we can see the specificities uh, of uh, this or that medication. The expert council was devoted to the con clinical continuity, clinical sequencing of uh, GBD. We have uh, medications that influence immune comorbidity, we know. It's a TNF alpha inhibitors, interleukin uh, blockers of 12 and 23 small molecules. Patients that have uh, comorbidities at 25 30 percent. In Europe, uh, there are greater numbers 45 50 percent. And when we are talking about use of the GBD with uh, comorbidity in patients with comorbidities, we are, are convinced that the main indicator is uh, the efficacy. 
We well know that interleukin-12 and 23 inhibitors, they influence uh, the psoriasis, uh, the arthritis, uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors, uh, they uh, do influence skin and uh, uh, the joints. Belidazumab is a medication with intestinal bioselectivity. It doesn't influence extra intestinal manifestation. And topacetinib, small molecule, uh, influences arthritis and uh, the skin manifestations. When we are talking about patients with comorbidity and we discuss the uh, sequencing of medication, now we consider about, ethic, about safety. We know uh, uh, their uh, uh, TNF uh, alpha and its uh, side effects as to uh, cardiovascular disease. Also, uh, there may be safety concerns as to the high doses of tofusetinib to patients with a thromboembolic venous event in the past, we know certain points as to as to kinumab and uh, the safety profile of this medication. Vedolizumab, uh, that is uh, strictly intestinal selective, uh, has less side effects. If we looked at uh, the safety profile, this pyramid of safety was uh, formulated one year ago. It's how the the world community see the monitoring of safety of medications. So we can see that Vedalizumab, uh, together with Ustekinumab, is on the top of this pyramid uh, in case of safety. I'd like to share the data uh, that we discussed during the expert council when we are talking about the first trial of uh, uh, biological medication it's very responsible step for any clinician because a patient started to be considered uh, as a patient that is prescribed modern therapy this decision should be made by a clinician then uh, the uh, but because it has uh, the consequences uh, let's look at two points important points when we see a patient who needs GBT, who has a steroid resistance or steroid dependency. We are talking about two large blocks. First of all, about a patient who has early IBD, patients with a debut of the disease that happened not longer than 18 months ago. And we have a other patients, uh, the patients who have suffered for six, seven years uh, with a severe course, uh, with a different regimen, therapeutic regimen, with different medications and high doses of glucocorticosteroids, uh, they are completely different patients. Early IBD is a, a more easily managing situation to stop progression. Quite recently, it has been shown that patients with early IBD with a debut of the disease, it turned out that this cohort of patients with Delizumab may be effective comparing to TNF-alpha inhibitors. Why? Because due to this selective influence on the anti-integrin receptor system, there is no involvement of cytokines pathways. We can uh, more easily achieve histological remission. And another point uh, that was shown as to the early administration of GBD, the first line uh, of treatment of Vesalidumab doesn't influence the effectiveness of the second line of treatment of TNF alpha inhibitors because uh, the efficacy of medication with each con uh, 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 following line loses its efficacy. Vedalizumab influences the migration of uh, leukocytes 
And these guidelines, they started to appear, and they will be laid down in the guidelines further on. As to disadvantages of new ways of treatment of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, it's a different point of talk. In conclusion, I'd like to say that customized uh, tactics of IBD is very important to achieve endoscopic and histological remission because of the choice of uh, GEBD and uh, the sequences of GEBD is very important as well as um, 5ACK medications. Thank you for your attention. Huge thanks, Diana. I have already surprised uh, by your skills to talk about difficult uh, things uh, in a simple words. It's a, a high level of mastership. I'd like to ask questions. Now uh, I'd like to ask you the question about the register. Now in St. Petersburg, uh, and uh, I am talking about Russia and the great territory of Russia, Глубоко уважаемый Юрий Павлович, вы знаете, наверное, вот в Татарстане такие же тенденции, потому что мы ведем такой учет практически пациентов с ВЗК уже не один десяток лет, и даже исходно вот такой резкой границы, допустим, 80 на 20, да, 80 процентов ясного калита, 20 болезней крона у нас не было. У нас всегда было, даже в начале, когда мы занимались, в середине 2000-х годов, еще первое исследование Эскейп у нас проводилось, у нас было где-то, наверное, ну, 70 наверное, 65-70% язвенный колит и, соответственно, 30-35% болезнь крона. Сейчас, наверное, мы приближаемся где-то 45% болезнь крона и 55% язвенный колит. И нам кажется, что это связано, конечно, во-первых, с улучшением обращаемости, потому что язвенный колит – это появление крови в стуле, это пугает, и пациенты приходят раньше, чем пациенты с болезнью крона, у которых, в общем-то, длительное время могут быть жалобы, без наличия крови в стуле, а именно жидкий стул, да, боли в животе, они могут идти с диагнозом тиреотоксикоз, с диагнозом дисбактериоз, с диагнозом, допустим, там варианты у нас были, хроническая дуагональная недостаточность с клиникой. Поэтому это, наверное, заслуга именно того, что диагностика и наличие квалифицированных эндоскопистов и, самое главное, насторожность к молодым пациентам с непонятным синдромом субфибрилитета, непонятными жалобами со стороны желудочно-кишечного тракта, иногда со стороны глаз и суставов, стала приводить к тому, что болезнь крона выявляется действительно чаще с той же тенденцией, что и в северо-западном округе. Диана Эльдаровна, спасибо. Ответ, с моей точки зрения, блестящий. Я абсолютно согласен с тем, что говорит Диана Эльдаровна. Потому что э, эта тенденция, она экстерриториальная, и, наверное, вот действительно улучшение диагностики, в том числе эндоскопической диагностики, и, и имеет очень большое значение. По-моему, вот как раз в Татарстане э, мы получаем рассылку, 4 июня пройдет гастроэнтологический э, э, форум, посвященный в том числе и аспектам э, диагностики заболеваний. Да, Диана Ильдаровна? Я да, прав... совершенно верно. У нас очень сильная эндоскопическая школа, заложенная профессором 
Муравьевым в середине 70-х годов. Она базируется в рамках Республиканского клинического онкодиспансера, это медакадемия, ГИДУФ, филиал ГИДУФ, где обучаются врачи. И вот такой очень э, дружеский тандем эндоскопистов и клиницистов, очень сильные эндоскописты, и сейчас подтягиваются у нас морфологи по разным направлениям, потому что морфология она тоже имеет свои особенности. С эндоскопистами, конечно, мы разговариваем на одном языке, и мы понимаем, что пациент с ВЗК, он нуждается не в проходном исследовании, а мы посылаем в реперные точки, там, где мы уверены в глазах и, так скажем, в широте кругозора наших коллег-эндоскопистов. Спасибо вам огромное, Диана Эльдаровна. Будем сотрудничать с вами, будем у вас учиться. Вот наши балеоптические хирурги ездят к вам тоже учиться вашим выдающимся достижениям. Поэтому Казань, она всегда с нами. Огромный вам респект, огромная благодарность и надежду на новых встреч. Всего вам самого Спасибо доброго. большое. Да, большое спасибо. Наш привет Оксане Борисовне. Мы видим уже на экране. Еще раз, да, уважаемый Оксана Юрий Павлович, большое спасибо за приглашение принять участие в конференции. Спасибо Хорошего огромное. продолжения конференции. Спасибо огромное. Всего доброго. Спасибо. Уважаемые коллеги, ну, завершая симпозиум, хотелось бы сказать все-таки несколько слов и о продукте, которому бы находился в фокусе внимания, который представлен, который представлен компанией Такеда, генно-инженерно-биологический селективный препарат Антивио. Ну, об Антивио. Ведолизумаби – оригинальное название, Вентивию – торговое название. Можно говорить с любого экрана, с любой точки, не вступая ни в какие противоречия с, со своими клиническими, профессиональными и морально-нравственными этическими соображениями. Потому что на самом деле препарат, препарат безопасный, безопасность колоссальная, едва ли не выше, нежели чем у плацебо, что позволяет использовать его и в том числе и у беременных, и у кормящих оффлейбл. Препарат, который очень любят наши специалисты, который также оффлейбл пока еще не зарегистрирован для педиатрической практики, но с учетом селективности высокой оффлейбл педиатрами активно назначается, об этом мы говорили в том числе и с главным нештатным специалистом, гастроэнтерологом Еленой Александровной Корниенко о безопасности назначения этого лекарственного средства. И мне бы хотелось and costs can be compromised by adverse events, which would require shifting therapy and changing the dose. This medication enables patients to stay adherent to therapy because compared to um, earlier generation TNF um, alpha inhibitors, um, this medication is much more safe. Our clinical practice is developing rapidly. Infleximab um, was registered um, at the start of the millennium. 2010s saw Intivia, and now we cannot imagine our clinical practice without new, safe and effective GPD medications. At present, the strategy of 
um, the company um, uh, involves producing medications um, that uh, with excellent safety profiles. And this is um, a value that the company has shared um, for a long time. This uh, is to do with different classes of drugs, including uh, the um, proton pump inhibitors. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, let us continue our work today. Diana has um, announced uh, that the next um, talk we will listen to today will be by Aksana Shukina. And we have been talking a lot today about the feats, um, with, uh, the achievements um, that you can take credit for in terms of patient routing as the um, head of the department for um, IBD treatment at the University of Pavlov. Under the leadership of uh, Rector uh, Professor Bagnenko, Oksana will talk about the personalized approach to the choice of um, treatment for patients with IBD. The symposium um, will be supported by Johnson and Johnson. Thank you very much, Yuri. Thank, uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues. I would like to carry on with the subject of uh, the individualized, customized approach in choosing IBG treatment. And a lot of those concerns will resonate with um, something that Diana has been sharing with us today. The patient with a Crohn disease may um, often present with uncomplicated forms of the disease, and we have 18 months, nearly two years, um, for um, us to achieve remission and to prevent ulcers from forming. Outside of this period, the patient will be running a heightened risk of strictures. As far as vetalizumab is concerned, it is highly effective at this stage of Crohn's disease. Um, mild Crohn's uh, disease without systemic manifestation. And these patients amount uh, to 60% of the total IBD patient population. As far as ulcerative colitis is concerned, there is no 18 month window of opportunity. The disease will progress unless the um, mucosa inflammation is controlled. And it is our duty to prevent colorectal cancer and to achieve clinical and endoscopic remission. And to the individualized approach to therapy. Our patient should be approached in terms of the rate of disease progression. We also have to consider the uh, poor prognostic um, factors for Crohn's disease. We need to forecast uh, the patient's um, projected need for um, colectomy. 
сопутствующие тяжелые патологии с годами, да, с возрастом, с факторами внешней среды, то есть пациенты, different risk factors, environmental risk factors, account for more severe cases. Somatically severe. So we need to evaluate to what extent the disease impacts the patient's lifestyle and quality of life. We need to consider the potentially unfavorable scenario and prognosis of the disease. And that elizumab, unfortunately, which is um, excellent for ulcerative colitis as a first-line medication in Crohn's disease, this isn't the case, particularly if the um, medication is used as a first-line regimen. We need to consider if the um, patient uh, finds it more convenient to take the medication intravenously or Subdermally. We need to consider the potential comorbidities um, in the form of extra-intestinal manifestations, of which there are many. Crohn disease is associated with extra-intestinal complications quite strongly, so treatment should be initiated early. To induce the patient with a Crohn disease, um, it is recommended to use budgesonid. Supporting therapy is fully studied in case of um, the mild severity Crohn disease. There are no guidelines, there are no recommendations. То есть мы в этих исследованиях, в общем-то, нуждаемся, говорит консенсус ЭКО. ЭКО консенсус показывает, что мы нуждаемся в таких исследованиях. Как раз по прогностическим факторам, если они присутствуют, то нужно начинать с того, что мы нуждаемся в таких исследованиях. Если они присутствуют, то нужно начинать с того, что мы нуждаемся в таких исследованиях. Если они присутствуют, то нужно начинать с того, что мы нуждаемся в таких исследованиях. Let us focus on the indications. We cannot prescribe biological um, drugs to all our patients. Because of the cost concerns. Vitalizumab and Ustikinumab are much more costly compared with the available hormonal treatments. But cost concerns are of importance. In all recommendations, in all guidelines, the prognostic um, factors include early treatment. The risk factors um, for um, unfavorable prognosis include the um, young age for Crohn disease and the involvement of um, small intestines, as well as the terminal department of the um, ileum. They are always associated with the risk of a severe attack and um, are associated with the risk of colectomy. The symptoms um, here are not very um, dramatic. For ulcerative colitis, Extensive ulcers, extensive ulceration is an indicator that the um, patient will need coloprotectomy. Smokers develop a lot of adverse, uh, adverse effects while on therapy. Professor Silvio Tenese spoke a lot about adverse effects on steroids. Steroids 
are always associated with infections of some sort. So, steroids present a very high risk of opportunistic infections compared with um, biologic drugs. The lymphoma um, risk is um, also very high. Severe opportunistic infections are uh, particularly um, uh, likely in case of um, combination combined regimens with TNF inhibitors. When we select medication, we need to consider how tolerant the patient will be of uh, the combination and monotherapy. If the patient tolerates monotherapy, uh, immunosuppressors need to be excluded. TB risks is particularly high for ITNF users. Many territories across Russia are high risk in terms of um, TB. Latent TB um, can persist, can linger in the body system for a long time. And activation of latent TB is, of course, a risk that needs to be prevented. And this risk is higher for patients with ITNF. As far as interleukin-23 uh, inhibition is concerned, it is not related, it is not associated with any additional risk of bacterial, viral or fungal infections. The risk is comparable to um, vetalizumab. Use. And of course, safety also includes some uh, concerns relating to the use of eustachinumab without immune suppressors as monotherapy. If it works, if it can be retained without suppressors, this is very inspiring. As for ulcerative colitis, a good effect of tofacitinib was demonstrated. But vedulizumab is still preferable because it is safer. And it's associated with lower risks of um, embolism, coagulopathy, and heart deficiency, heart insufficiency. Comorbidities in patients with vetalizumab, with, um, sorry, with um, IBD. They include psoriasis, particularly in patients with Crohn's disease. So our patients with IBD at high risk of comorbidities want us to think about that. Because the risk of sequelae um, for the um, CBD is really very high. On the whole, IBD um, are associated with um, a high risk of um, many diseases such as psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis. And this is um, the problem that needs to um, be approached from multidisciplinary positions. Extra-intestinal manifestations are present in half of the patients with IBD. 
единый патогенез да, появления и артралгии, и спондилоартритов, и каких-то... And uh, it's the same situation that can be observed in Europe. Fifty percent of European patients, as we know, have comorbidities. The list of um, comorbidities is present here, and um, as you understand, it uh, covers and affects most of the biological systems. Comorbidities need to be considered when administering and se selecting and administering um, a therapy for IBD. One of such comorbidities is um, uveitis, resulting in the loss of eyesight. Ustekinumab doesn't work for axial spondyl arthritis, but is good for peripheral spondyl, spondyl arthritis. But elithiumab is good when um, the patient has a mild stage of uh, a mild severity of IBD. For peripheral spondyl arthritis, it just doesn't work. The studies of extra-intestinal manifestations of IBD have shown that patients receiving betalizumab showed reliably higher likelihood of extra-intestinal manifestations. Indeed, patients that uh, received ITNF and were shifted to vetalizumab in these patients, uh, all intestinal uh, manifestations were uh, relieved. Uh, Extra-intestinal um, manifestations were not um, effectively controlled, and this requires um, additional medication. So patients on vetalizumab um, in 26% uh, of the cases developed um, extra-intestinal manifestations de novo, such as astralgia, um, nodular erythema, uveitis, spondylitis, a number of um, other um, diseases that are poorly controlled uh, systemically. ITNF can heal uh, mucosa, but it's also capable of causing dermatitis. This is, um, these are photographs um, of um, our patients uh, that um, had to be transformed to istikinumab. 37% of our patients with ITNF must discontinue their therapy and uh, shift to topical treatment. Half of the patients need to shift therapy. Second line therapy. As far as uh, uh, Kenomab is, uh, is concerned, um, most of um, our patients are um, those who get used to Kenomab um, having displayed poor clinical response to other medications. The shift of medication within the class is ineffective. Vetalizumab was ineffective um, as a second-line drug. 
Ustekinumab proved more effective as a first and second line drug. This is really um, uh, a health-saving therapy, it's salvation therapy. Many of our patients um, receive um, the um, medication off-label. Um, particularly the patients with a short gut syndrome. A number of um, centers, five centers in France, explode shifts from vitalizumab to stricinumab. And they showed clinical remission on stricinumab as well as the survival rate was better. Patients with Crohn's disease on vetalizumab normally had their regimen reduced to four weeks. So we need more medications to treat patients on vetalizumab. If we talk about non-responders, non-responders will need to have their dosages optimized. Ustikinumab displayed a better survival profile. It was superior to vetalizumab. Ustikinumab also works better than steroids in terms of uh, clinical efficacy, safety profile. If we talk about selective medications, the safety profile is uh, the same as uh, that of selective medications. It's comparable to placebo, sometimes lower compared to placebo. The therapy does not require um, immune suppressors to be administered because the um, medication retains its um, efficiency long term. Bionaive patients as follows from head-to-head -head trial, indicates that Ustekinumab is not inferior to Humira in terms of efficacy, but the survival was better for Ustekinumab. Vetalizumab as a first-line medication um, uh, it's better for patients with colitis, but as far as the second-line medication, ustekinumab is the uh, is the drug of choice because vetalizumab doesn't work as a second-line drug. As a first-line drug, we uh, um, are guided by comorbidities, intestinal manifestations. And we need the um, therapy to uh, last us for a continued period of time. So ITNF plus um, vetalizumab um, could be considered. If it is a Crohn's disease, uh, we prescribe ustekinumab. So every expert uh, needs uh, to um, play this game of chess. How to handle the therapy? What to prescribe? Thank you very much, Oksana. A number of um, questions from our audience. So let me bring them to you. Oksana, you mentioned tofacetinib and that it is associated with the risk of thrombi and embolism. Does that mean that if the patient um, uh, has COVID-19, tofacetinib needs to be discontinued? No, I don't think so. I don't have this data. Moreover, to the best of my knowledge, to, um, this medication was part of um, treatment prescribed to patients with COVID. 
I think this was a comment made by FDA in the middle of 2019 about safety, and I do believe that this comment needs revising. Because Tofacetinib was discussed at a panel of experts, Russian and international, and it was discussed that small molecules um, uh, could be used as a treatment um, to um, uh, relieve uh, fast attacks. However, there should be some guidelines. If a patient has some provoked episodes, um, uh, I don't think uh, the um, uh, medication should be administered. Uh, Dr. Molostova, thank, thanks you for the lecture. Oksana, does your institution have uh, biological um, drugs? Do you prescribe GBD to patients? Yes, we do. We do receive patients, we do um, um, provide follow-up care to IBD patients. There is an IBD nurse uh, that um, maintains close contact with the patients. So we're building gradually a multidisciplinary team with um, eye specialists, coloproctologists, surgeons. Oksana, I would like to add some comment. At present, Oksana and myself, under the leadership of Akademi Shen Bagnenko, or uh, rector of um, the medical university, we're developing a program for proactive um, inclusion um, of uh, the um, university as a uh, leading reference referral institution for IVD patients for the North um, Western Federal District. The Congress that took um, place um, before the COVID pandemic um, started held at the medical university where Oksana made a fantastic uh, presentation together with Akademishan Bagnenko. Um, the report focused on, uh, focused on um, patient routing between healthcare institutions um, and the presentation was fantastic. Let us carry on with our work, dear colleagues. Our next speaker is Professor Shevret, who, um, uh, Professor Shifrin, I'm sorry, who um, represents the, um, health, uh, the Ministry of Public Health, Russian Federation. And who um, also um, represents a section of University of Moscow. Oleg Shifrin often supports our events that we conduct in St. Petersburg. I have known Oleg for quite some time, and I am proud to call him his friend because Oleg is indeed a unique expert combining the features of a great researcher and a great clinician because uh, he also heads the academician Ivashkin clinic and he deals with uh, very complex cases, uh, including uh, those cases um, that feature patients with IBD on a daily basis. Professor Schifrin uh, will focus on the role of precise control of inflammation and the prevention of oncological uh, complications in IBD patients. I'll start my presentation. IBD is a very frequent disease. The incidence rate of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease amounts to 300-400 per 1,000 of population. 100,000 of population. 
more frequent uh, than the incidence rate of chronic pancreatitis uh, that sometimes is overdiagnosed. A severe debut suggests a severe cause of the disease further on. Uh, in Dr. Ivanshkin Hospital, there was the dissipation as to the assessment of the debut and the further cause of the disease. It was shown that the therapy, adequate therapy, that was started in the beginning of the disease, it's possible only if it's diagnosed properly, will change the natural cause of the disease. The disease uh, causes mild, there is no severe complications, ensure colorectal cancer, including colorectal cancer. There is no disability, no risk of premature death. What are the goals when, of clinician when he uh, manages uh, the IBD patient? These goals uh, have changed drastically during uh, the last uh, 60, 70 years. If in the beginning of the 20th century clinicians suggested that it's a lock to reduce clinical symptoms, to reduce our diarrhea and other symptoms, up to the end of the 20th century, the goals were to achieve clinical remission. Now, in the 21st century, it's not sufficient. Our task is to achieve clinical endoscopic remission. It's a final or end point. And if we are successful, it's a kind of a super task, but we have to thrive for this. It's an achievement of a histological remission, both in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Although this condition, especially in Crohn's disease, is difficult to prove due to the uh, involvement of the deeper layers of the uh, mucosa and uh, involvement of many segments, this work shows that endoscopic remission achievement uh, drastically reduced the risk of life-threatening complications uh, that requires colectomy. Several times, we can see several times reduction of colectomy and necessity of colectomy if we reach endoscopic remission, the healing of the mucosa. In case of the healing of the mucosa or of the intestines uh, in uh, ulcerative colitis, the risk of the cancer reduces twofold. And in case of a histological remission, or uh, even uh, it reduces five times, it's very impressive and very uh, impressive and reliable figures. During the recent decades, uh, during the recent 15 years, as to cancer prevention, both uh, medical and endoscopic cancer prevention, much uh, has been achieved. New drugs emerge, new regimen appeared, more rational one. Uh, the incidence rate of colorectal cancer in case of ulcerative colitis is going down. Undoubtedly, we do have to continue working, achieving more and more successes in uh, reducing colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer is not the complication only of UC, but it's uh, the Crohn's disease complication, quite frequent one. In the overall population of Crohn's patient, uh, the frequency of colorectal cancer 2.5, uh, three times higher than in population. And in group of patients with the involvement of colon, this figure is higher 4.5 times. In case of Crohn's disease, only lymphoma may happen. This kind of notion is incorrect. Colorectal cancer in, space of, uh, in, space, in the case of involvement of colon is quite frequent. Predisposing factors of colorectal cancer 
they are, are included in the Russian guidelines of 2020. It's undoubtedly the duration of the disease. For example, in uh, 30 years of duration, uh, the uh, incidence rate of colorectal cancer is high. Uh, the debut of the disease in childhood or in uh, adolescence, if the disease, uh, the onset of the disease happened in early childhood, the duration of the disease is longer as well. Uh, their uh, length of the involvement of the colon. Uh, if uh, we talk about total colitis or subtotal colitis, the presence of the primary sclerosis and colangitis is a factor. Uh, this increases the risk of colorectal cancer four times if there is such uh, associated disease as a primary sclerosis and colitis. And paradigm, sporadic family colorectal cancer. If in relative of a patient uh, with the UC sporadic cancer happened in a younger age, I mean in mother, father, sister, brother, the risk of uh, the colorectal cancer in patient of UC is going up. The age of a relative does matter, and non-adequate management of a patient, uh, maybe due to the natural course of the disease or um, because of inadequate therapeutic regimen, late diagnosis, if the relapses, uh, if the relapses are long and remission short or absent, the risk of colorectal cancer in such long-lasting inflammation, intensive inflammation, is going up, and also inflammatory polyposes, pseudopolyps, they may be the sources of colorectal cancer. There are different groups, two groups of patients in case of probability of cancer. Total colitis, long lasting persistent inflammation, family history, inflammatory polyposis. Each of these criteria is assessed as one point. If a patient has more than two criteria, uh, this patient in a high risk group. And for this patient, diagnostic endoscopy, colonoscopy should be conducted annually. Uh, the cancer prevention, drug cancer prevention, it's our task of gas, as gastroenterologists. Uh, adequate maintenance therapy by any medication that can be effective as a cancer preventer. If you manage to suppress the inflammation, if you manage to have remission, it's cancer prevention, 5 amino salicylic acid, huge experience of using uh, this medication as a cancer preventer, immunosuppressor, and of course biological medication. I'd like to point out the role of ursa desoxyolive acid. It doesn't prolong the life of patients with UC, but in case of uh, uh, the uh, primary sclerosis in cholangitis and UC, it reduces the risk of cancer drastically. Biological medication. During the last decade of the previous century, when infliximab emerged, revolution happened in treatment of patients with IBD. An effective and promising uh, drug emerged, uh, but expensive. Later, new drugs uh, emerged. The, uh, TNF blockers, but did they change the problem? No, because of the primary inefficiency of therapy by TNF blockers is high uh, from 
one fifth up to the whole group of patients. The secondary ineffectiveness of the therapy, uh, even if during the first phase uh, the therapy is successful, but later on TNF blockers turned out to be ineffective. Intolerance, quite frequent, infectious, complications, TB, abscesses, and so on. Uh, all these uh, results in discontinuation of medication. Of course, I agree completely with Oksana. Hormones are more dangerous comparing to TNF alpha blockers, but the risk of infections uh, shall be should be taken into account when we prescribe TNF blockers. Quite frequently, we have to escalate the dose of medications and taking into account the cost of this medication, it may be not possible and uh, may uh, result in some uh, difficulties uh, for a patient and uh, society, economic ones. I'd like to give you a clinical case that will show the difficulty of the problem and how can we overcome this. In our hospital, hospital named by Vasilenko, a patient, female patient of 36, uh, we saw loose stool 10 times with blood, uh, there's spasmodic pain in the left iliac region, the relief after defecation and fatigue. Uh, there are some specificities in family history. A mother of a patient at the age of 47 was operated due to the sporadic cancer of the colon. The danger of uh, cancer of the colon uh, with the diagnosed uh, ulcerative colitis is going up. Anamnesis, the history of the disease, not long, considerably, not con conditionally not long. Uh, she, in 2018, a patient had diarrhea, hematotesia, uh, the pain in the low abdomen, abdomen uh, pain. Uh, abdomen pains may happen in Crohn's disease, in ulcerative colitis as well. But usually in ulcerative colitis, so they are localized in the left abdomen, in the left iliac region. Uh, the diagnosis was made quite quickly. Colonoscopy was performed. The colonoscopy showed subtotal ulcerative colitis. The therapy was administered. Right, correct therapy. I'd like to remind you that according to their guidelines, the induction methylazine course should be not less than four. But uh, with the correct administration of steroids as a first phase of treatment of a patient with ulcerative colitis. Uh, uh, she, was, she was one milligram per kilo, 80 kilograms plus enemas. No effective. The therapy was not to be effective. Then in Fleximab. She was administered 5 mg for kilo and azotioprine that had to be uh, discontinued due to leukopenia. The dose on infleximab was uh, increased uh, once uh, in four weeks with no effect. She continued to have hematochesia, diarrhea, a fever happened in the stool samples, toxins of clostridia difficulty was detected, vancomycin uh, prescription uh, administration uh, was um, temporarily effective, but then patient relapsed. The patient lost weight for two months. She lost, uh, she lost five kilos before admission to the hospital, and with this therapeutic regimen, non-effective, she was admitted to our clinic.
uh, in colonoscopy, the diagnosis of UC subtotal form was confirmed. We see the changes in the mucosa erosion, hematasia, the clinical diagnosis, main disease, ulcerative colitis, subtotal form, uh, continuously relapsed, uh, uh, nearly no uh, remission, active to true love with 3, and relapsing cause of the disease of clostridia difficulty associated disease. Once again, what are the end points of our therapy? What we want to achieve? Uh, managing patient with uh, IBD. Uh, the improvement of the condition is not sufficient. We need to achieve clinical remission. We have to no, no, no uh, normalization of lab values. Uh, these are not the end point. In any cases, apart from clinical remission, we have to achieve endoscopic healing of uh, uh, ulcers or better histological remission or a condition that is that is close to histological remission. It's our goal. We will start from these suggestions. I'd like to remind you that our female patient received TNF-alpha blockers and it wasn't effective. Currently we have the choice of other biological medications, anti-antigreen, uh, vedalizumab, uh, the action is based on the, of the restriction of penetration of T lymphocytes into the mucosa of the bowel and uh, a blocker of the interleukin 12 and 23, ustekinumab. What medication shall we choose and what are the following tactics? According to the guidelines, it's shown that the change of the biological medication in one class, for example, the replacement of infleximab to alimidumab, it, it doesn't have clear clinical effect and healing of the mucosa. If one medication, uh, the TNF blocker, uh, turned out to be ineffective, uh, we expect uh, ineffective uh, use of another TNF alpha blocker. Logically, we shall replace. Uh, uh, infleximab to another biological medication of another group. This approach will be more effective. Let's uh, speak about clostridia difficulty associated diseases. Uh, in our clinic, uh, we see that clostridium difficulty uh, quite frequently associated the cause of the ulcerative colitis. We suggest uh, that a part of the presence of the toxins of clostridia difficulty, uh, uh, their volume of the toxins uh, is important. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, their uh, markers to assess the level of toxemia in the guards associated with the clostridium difficulty. But in some cases, clostridium difficulty Infection, caused infection will lead to the uh, exacerbation of the cause of the disease of the ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. One more point. Clostridia it is a spore forming anaerobe. Uh, the incidence rate of relapses is very high. If after the first relapse, there is a relapse once again. Uh, the frequency of relapses uh, 
increases 50 percent. We have to take this into account while the minister is thinking about another, their continuation therapy. As to uh, TNF alpha blockers, who we have already discussed, in case of TNF blockers, it's high risk to have a systemic and opportunistic infections, uh, including cytomegalovirus infection and Clostridium difficile. Veladuzumarb, uh, quite safe as to systemic infections, infections, for example, in case of TB, but the risk of opportunistic local infections Intestinal infections, Clostridium difficile, cytomegalovirus infection, increases the probability of the development of these infections while administering uh, TNF blockers. And it's expected, uh, taking into account uh, the cause of action, the block of uh, the penetration of T lymphocytes via the mucosal layer, tofacitinib. It has been said by Oksana that this medication quite frequently causes the infection. The safer is Stilara, Ustikinumab, a good profile, safety profile as to systemic infections, uh, infections and opportunistic infections. It doesn't elevate the risk of Clostridium difficile infection or cytomegalovirus infection. Ustikinumab is a safe medication. We see that the frequency of serious adverse events and during long treatment, uh, multi-year uh, multi treatment, doesn't, uh, di doesn't dif is not different uh, comparing to control group or placebo. Ustikinumab is an effective drug. Positive clinical response in eight weeks in more than two-thirds of bio-naive patients, patients who didn't receive biological treatment before, patients who received biological treatment a bit less but quite high percentage of positive response. In 16 weeks, nearly 90% of patients, of bio-naive patients, uh, they have the positive clinical response and uh, a bit uh, low percentage of patients who received previously biological treatment but still they have the positive clinical response. What else is important in case of cancer prevention? Once again, it's uh, achievement of histological and endoscopic remission. Stilara, we can see in a high percentage of cases, uh, uh, it's seen on the slide, it allows to achieve endoscopic and more hysteroscopic remission. As to cancer prevention, I'd like to remind you that the patient is a high risk of colorectal cancer. It's a very good feature of this medication. And at last, the overall review of different biological medications, their effectiveness showed that if we compare patients by a naive with the effectiveness of the LARA, the LARA shows better frequency of the clinical response, clinical remission, and endoscopic healing comparing to other biological medications and tofacitinib. Once again, the regimen of Stellara, the first intravenous introduction uh, on the basis of the weight, 6 mg per kilo, then in two months a patient receives subcutaneously 90 mg fixed dose and Every three months, a patient receives subcutaneously 
90 milligrams of this biological medication. If it's insufficient, Utikinumab can be introduced more frequently in every eight weeks. But uh, it's not the frequent case. We administered Utikinumab to our patient very good clinical effect. We can see that practically uh, there is no diarrhea. Practically, we eradicated hematachysia, lab values are normalized, and we achieved practically endoscopic remission. It's seen on the slide. We achieved end points. The condition that is close to clinical and endoscopic remission is very important, especially uh, in case of effective cancer prevention in this patient. One more point that shows uh, the advantages of Delara. The maintenance therapy uh, we need to conduct quite rarely. Uh, the introduction of the drug every three months. In our century, in the century of pandemics, uh, COVID pandemic, it's a good property that reduces the risk of maintenance, uh, schedule maintenance of Stellara. We reduce the risk of uh, COVID infection. In conclusion, I'd like to say that, once again, when we manage a patient with IBD, not necessarily with a ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, we should remember about the necessity of the effective cancer control. We shall select the medications uh, with a safer profile and adequate in each individual case. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you so much, distinguished Alec. There are questions. The first question. Dr. Mohova, from Dr. Mohova. Uh, distinguished Alex, can uh, we say that it's a complete remission of IBD if we have clinical, histological, endoscopic, and lab remission? Which one of these remissions is more important? The combination of clinical endoscopic and lab and histological remission, it's uh, our dream. But the end point, once again, is clinical and endoscopic remission. Two points. Uh, lab remission is very good. It's a predictor of a long remission further on. Histological remission, brilliant, is a predictor of a uh, lighter cause of the disease. But now, objectively, we have two criteria uh, laid on in the guidelines, national and international ones. One more question. Dr. Kuchitsky, uh, Dialek Samoilovich, is it necessary to hospitalize a patient for induction uh, and uh, the first introduction or introduction of uh, their biological medication? If intravenous induction is required, hospitalization is needed. But if we uh, first, I uh, stress first, if we uh, do the first percutaneous injection, I will suggest hospitalization. But later on, uh, if we uh, do maintenance therapy, subcutaneously, it can be done uh, uh, outpatiently. Thank you so much, Alec. I uh, agree with you completely with all your answers, and I hope for other further uh, contacts, professional and uh, just human contacts. Thank you so much, dear colleagues. We have 
the next lector, lecturer, Alexey Vysilov, uh, who represents uh, the Kola Proctological Association, uh, named by Ryzhik. He has a huge clinical and organizational experience as to solving of difficult issues, uh, clinical, economical ones, uh, uh, managing patients with uh, IBDs. I uh, always uh, learn uh, from uh, Alexey Vysilov how to manage patients clinically and uh, in economics. Ustekinumab uh, therapy in IBD, clinical and economic aspects. Huge thanks for this warm introduction. In fact, Alec uh, has given me a gift because he covered the clinical aspects of the pathology in details. If we are talking about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, we should point out that there is a tendency as to the increase in the number of patients. There is an incidence rate and morbidity of the patients. They are going up. In 10 or 15 years, we will see double fold of patients with IBDs. Undoubtedly, much has been said about ulcerative colitis and the example when given brilliantly as to the Crohn's disease. We shall say that in the first place there is the weight loss and abdomen pain. Blood in stool is typical of only half of patients. We shouldn't forget about, about perianal manifestations, especially in the early phases of Crohn's disease, especially if a patient in young age uh, is seen by a doctor with very anal uh, manifestations. The burden for the whole healthcare system is going up as well. If we, if we see, if we look at uh, their on data from the USA, we have their growth up to 35% of hospitalization, and we have increased from 8,000 up to 14,000 double fold growth. If we speak about uh, the uh, work leave patients, uh, they have more frequently on uh, sick leave comparing to other nosologists. When we are talking about economic aspects of the therapy of IBDs, we should have some starting points. Classically, it's uh, the share of patients who has uh, their, who became uh, permanent, who, uh, who has permanent disability, the number of hospitalizations and uh, that influences the budget. There is uh, the social aspect. We have 17% of patients, according to our foreign colleagues data, they have undoubtedly a very poor experiences to interpersonal relationships and 50% of patients, uh, they notice the negative influence of IBDs on their career growth. It's a problem, and first of all, it's related to the number of uh, disability time or sick leave time, and of course, disability. Today, much has been said about the approaches to therapy. I'd like to point out that a standardized approach that aimed at, first and foremost, to achieve uh, the clinical remission goal. It's not justified as to the strategy. More and more, we are talking about deep remission. Here, the organizational aspect is important. Say, for example, a patient is hospitalized urgently or as a planned hospitalization to the medical establishment, 
and uh, he or she they received right treatment hormonal therapy or 5 ACK basic therapy clinical remission was achieved uh, we have the criterion on the quality of medical care everything is okay but then a patient is referred to GP and unfortunately quite recently we've had uh, the um, Federal Council meeting and I pointed out in my presentation that primary care is not ready to receive these patients. They don't know what to do with this patient. Uh, they again refer patients to the hospitals with reactivation of uh, their IBDs. As a result, we have uh, the increasing uh, financial burden. Uh, deep remission is not only a clinical strategy, it's a strategy of following the patients up. We shall follow patients up in a specialized medical establishments uh, that deal with these patients, uh, IBD patients, multi in multidisciplinary teams in the IBD centers. As to medications and the importance of inhibition of uh, IL-23, it's uh, the importance of the durable and sustainable effect. It's not only the easier uh, from the point of view of patient. Of course, uh, it's a benefit for a patient, but it's important for planning as well. As Alec showed, if we achieve 80, 90 percent of efficacy, these patients uh, a, a year by year receiving this basic therapy, ustekinumab, it uh, we can control our healthcare expenditure. Uh, the goals of therapy are uh, primary, uh, medium, and long term goals of therapy, they have been conceded. We are talking about uh, cancer prevention as well as endoscopic and histological remission. It's an end point of the long-lasting uh, treatment strategy. If we are talking about the risk, risks of uh, development of complications in case of IBD, we shall understand that the more severe uh, complications, it's a col colonectomy, especially in you and the use of medications not every time can enable us to achieve remission using corticosteroids or 5-ACK. If you are talking about sticking them up, the profile for bionave and treated patients, the important point is we are talking about requests. Uh, I am, as a representative of the organizational council, I recommend to uh, analyze the cohort of patients who receive their IL-1223 inhibitors if they have the remission, they are entitled to these drugs, but in other cases, in a negative case, it's uh, not effective. These patients should be considered differently. Another point, if we see patient to be the modern form of uh, IBD and they uh, have hormonal resistance, hormonal dependency, we should ask the question why uh, this patient started to be treated with infleximab. Infleximab, for example, if a patient weights 80 kilos or files of infleximab is needed. It's quite a costly drug and escalation had to be made. It creates an additional burden for the healthcare system. Maybe we shall have started with ustekinumab therapy. In 
It may be an argument when we are discussing this point and when we are with administrative uh, healthcare authorities and when we forward the request, uh, we shall uh, procure medications with a high profile of uh, efficacy and safety. The U.S. Association and our Russian gastroenterology association pointed out that Utikinumab is registered for both the first and second line of therapy. If we are talking about therapy of Crohn's disease, here the situation is a bit different as to the number of medications uh, we have uh, uh, anti-TNF medication, new medication. Clinical guidelines say it's uh, mercapto, purine, methotrexate. But I'd like to point out that unfortunately we do have problems with the registration certificates for these medications. And the similar methotrexate we may uh, prescribe only off label uh, on the decision of the Medical Commission. Now, in the front, front line, as to selection of this of that drug is a, a safety profile of this medication. We understand that anti TNF, uh, they played a huge role and they opened the era of biological medications, but now new drugs emerge. For example, inhibitors of the IL-12 and 23, they have a, a broader safety profile. And of course, it's important to understand uh, as to uh, availability of medications and uh, economic issues. It's a financial, logistic, informative, organizational points are taken to be into account and assortment of the drugs. Uh, because in the region, uh, there may be not this medication available, and uh, we can't uh, ensure the provision of these drugs. As to availability of, in terms of financing, our profession, in our professional community, we made everything possible uh, for the drug to be available both uh, at the prime care, uh, prime care level and in hospital level. Please point out, uh, we uh, don't include uh, the uh, integrating uh, coefficient. Uh, there may be a 1.3, 1.4 coefficient can be used. Uh, the overall cost 150,000, 170,000 rubles. Uh, there are legislation has been amended, and according to uh, the federal law 13, uh, there is no the problem as to interterritorial settlement, financial settlement. Uh, because there are different uh, medical establishments, the federal ones or, and the local ones, uh, the patient may be referred uh, to the federal medical establishment. A huge step has been made by the company Johnson & Johnson as to Stellara Company as to the access to initiation for the first time in case of IBD. Uh, Offer has been made, offer agreement has been made. It's a public commitment of the company to fulfill these or that conditions. The offer agreement has been made, and all the conditions are to be observed. It's agreement for receival or reimbursed intravenous dose of the medication. Their point is the commission should made medical commission should make the decision, should forward the request and to point out uh, the medication that is needed. I'd like to say that we are talking about availability. 
in case of the compulsory medical insurance. In case of disability patients, usually we are talking about diabetes mellitus and uh, oncological patients. As to for pharmaceutical assessment of Crohn's disease, we conducted the study, including patients with the confirmed Crohn patients uh, with their severe and moderate degree. We made retrospective analysis based on the publicized data and uh, the real model. Also, we take into account the increase in the number of patients. Our goal was whether it influences the budget or not. We considered the direct expenditure for the medications. Stilara is one of the most is the one of the cheapest drug as to annual cause of treatment that it's very important for uh, requests for uh, healthcare authorities as to the efficacy it has been described I'd like to point out that uh, the ratio of efficacy and uh, expenditure in case of Stilara, they are very high, and it's true for clinical remission and improvement of the quality of life. If we implement in our routine practice per 1,000 patient, we calculated this, we increase Ustikinumab up to 15%, 150 for initiation. Uh, uh, we will economize and uh, uh, the overall budget 2 billion of rubles for two years economy. We can send this money, we can allocate this money for another patient. Uh, conclusion, Ostikinumab proved uh, the profile of effectiveness and uh, safety, it can be included in uh, the standardized regimen. It won't require additional uh, expenditure. It can help to economize. We shall uh, prescribe more frequently biological medications for moderate forms of uh, uh, not waiting for the deterioration of the disease in the case of uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. It's a window of opportunity that can be missed without this. The medications will lose uh, their effectiveness and increase the risk of surgical treatment. I am ready to answer questions. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. Just two questions. Um, Oksana, today, shared with the audience that if the economic possibilities were there and um, the um, biological drugs were as affordable as um, hormonal medications. It would be possible to treat um, every person with an IBD uh, using these medications. What is your opinion? Well, from my perspective as um, a public health official, we have um, uh, indications. The, um, you think the um, top-down approach is not enough. So our, the question lies in the safety. If we talk about Ustikinumab, using it would be the correct strategy. Um, as far as uh, the ITNF are concerned, uh, given the TB risk, um, it would be uh, the incorrect um, choice. Another question, Alexei. When we treat chronic diseases, more often than not, therapy is lifelong. Discontinuing it will uh, lead to decompensation. And this um, concerns um, hypertension or diabetes mellitus. When we use anti-secretory medications in gastroenterology, 
We know that there are certain indicators for uh, lifelong therapy. What about patients who get GBD? And achieve induced consolidated remission. Have there been any studies that indicate over long-term periods that um, it will be possible to discontinue GBD or do these patients have to receive it for life probably with uh, dose adjustments? So what is your opinion and what do the published sources say? It's a really important question and thank you very much for it. It has um, both a clinical and an economic um, aspect dimension to it. Most outstanding opinion influences from ECHO say that uh, GBD needs to be taken for life. I don't remember ever um, encountering uh, data of randomized trials um, whereby GBD was discontinued um, after three or more years in therapy. However, our clinical uh, therapy is such that uh, many patients discontinue GBT. Um, for example, female patients may do that when planning pregnancy, and this was the case five, seven years ago. As far as ITNF are concerned, um, they resulted in very bad relapses, and um, that made us think that ITNF should probably be taken for life. I have a number, a number of patients who take infleximab, and they have been doing so for 16 years. They were initiated in 2005, and um, they um, are still on the therapy. We have managed to control their disease, and we have never seen any active inflammatory processes. But this is real clinical practice. It shouldn't be extrapolated onto the whole of the patient population. So if you um, draw on the um, guidelines, um, the guidelines um, call for lifelong therapy. Thank you very much, Alexei. We are grateful to you. We're grateful to Akademishen Shurigin, who um, supports um, our initiatives that come from St. Petersburg and who helps our clinical capacities to grow and our plans to become more and, uh, more and more ambitious. Thank you very much and see you soon. Каждое утро мы просыпаемся для того, чтобы сделать возможным то, что еще вчера казалось невероятным. Мы прокладываем путь туда, куда другие боятся смотреть. Изучаем и воссоздаем сам код жизни, чтобы лечить, помогать, исцелять. Мы открываем двери для сотрудничества, а умы и сердца для пациентов чтобы наши успехи в лабораториях спасали жизни. Мы создаем инновации в лекарственной терапии и делаем их доступными для всего мира. Мы – Янсон, фармацевтические компании Джонсон и Джонсон. Это наша жизнь и мечта, в которую мы верим. Мы будем использовать науку для борьбы с заболеваниями, изобретать помочь тем, кто нуждается в помощи, исцелять безнадежность человеческим теплом до тех пор, пока самые тяжелые заболевания не останутся лишь на страницах истории. Янсен. Создаем будущее, где заболевания останутся в прошлом. Okay, colleagues, let us continue our work. I would like to make a brief comment that after, a sh after the symposium by 
um, under the auspices of Johnson & Johnson. We can make a conclusion that Ustikinumab is um, a medication that is unprecedented and has no analogues for patients uh, with um, IBD and comorbidities, offering a lot of clinical and economic benefits. The best choice for um, patients with severe IBD, that was confirmed by the data presented by our esteemed colleagues representing the gastroenterology schools of um, Moscow and St. Petersburg. Oleg Shifrin and Alexei Veselov and Oksana Shukina. It's refreshing to realize that our discussions help to formulate the indications for um, GEBD, for specific GEBD, and that our discussions lead to addressing uh, address many um, questions um, that are relevant to healthcare practitioners. Questions that um, fairly frequently cause opinion differences and the development of consensus on such um, problematic issue um, issues um, is um, our um, key goal. And now let us start our next symposium. Um, it will focus on um, problems and unmet needs in uh, the diagnosis and treatment of IBD. And I would like to inaugurate the presentation by Professor Bogdanov of the Military Medical Academy. We share the same teacher, academician Ivashkin, who in his lectures pointed out that the level of iron and hemoglobin is indicative of the um, civilizational stage in the development of a nation. The lecture is called Anemia in Inflammatory Bowel Disease, Hematologist's View. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, the first slide presents results of a major populational studies whereby Every um, fourth person on the population of the globe um, has anemia. At present, the WHO experts believe that one third of the population suffers from anemia, and more than 50% of all anemias are caused by um, absolute or relative iron deficiency or a combination of both. In the past several years, a new an anemia severity classification has been used. The cutoff between uh, mild and moderate is uh, 110 milligrams per liter, um, uh, grams per liter, and moderate and severe 80 grams per liter. Anemia is the most common extra intestinal manifestation of IBD. The prevalence of anemia differs depending on the patient group as well as on the inpatient outpatient mode of treatment. But the presence of the anemia syndrome affects the quality of life and performance and increases the risk of um, complications and death. In many, patient, uh, in many patients, even on remission, the severity of anemia still persists, which requires utmost attention to the syndrome. The 
existing European guidelines call for screening for anemia uh, every 6 to 12 months, depending on the severity of the disease. Screening includes full blood count and the um, um, detecting the level of um, vitamin B2 and folic acid at least once a year. The key causes of anemia in IBD is absolute or functional iron deficiency, sometimes a combination of both, less often vitamin B2 and folic acid deficiency, hemolysis and myelosuppression. About 90% of anemia in IBD are caused by iron deficiency. Other types of anemia arise less frequently. Additional studies are needed because data are available on just one third of the patients um, uh, and uh, adequate um, iron supplement treatment is provided to just one half of the patients. About 2.5 uh, grams of iron present in um, out of four present in um, the human um, organism are in erythrocytes, others are distributed um, between um, macrophages, um, iron homeostasis involves more than um, 20 proteins. For many years, the mechanisms associated with iron um, homeostasis um, have been conducted to explain processes that are quite remote from each other. In 2000, a regulator called hepcidin was identified. Hepcidin is called so because it's synthesized because um, it, um, uh, it's synthesized predominantly in the uh, liver and has antimicrobial activity. And this is how hepcidin influences um, iron homeostasis. It's induced by the uh, infl uh, inflammation, interleukin-6. Hepcidin level rises, blocking ferroportin. The macrophages retain iron, and uh, the iron fails to reach into the um, bloodstream, a syndrome that is called um, the functional anemia. In the event of absolute iron deficiency, the insorption of iron and uh, its uh, um, discharge from macrophages to blood is increased. Main causes of um, IDA um, are occult blood loss, decreased iron content in food, decreased iron absorption. Sometimes multiple comorbidities of the GIT. Causes of ACD are malignancies, chronic diseases, and autoimmune diseases. In the past few decades, this form of uh, anemic syndrome is um, receiving more and more attention because of the role it plays in aging and the development of renal Failure. The number of patients with this condition exceeds 1 billion. Pathogenesis is induced by the increased level of uh, pro inflammatory cytokines, causing activation of hepcidin and the development of relative iron deficiency. That means that the rate 
of iron in the um, body system is normal, but it's blocked on the necrophagal level. This type of anemia develops frequently in IBD patients and sometimes is combined with um, iron deficiency anemia. Slide presents criteria for iron deficiency versus anemia of chronic diseases. Ferritin um, of less uh, than 30 nanograms per um, milliliters, irrespective of other um, kinetic parameters, is an absolute criterion of iron deficiency. In uh, chronic disease anemia, ferritin um, of um, over 100 um, plus transfer in saturation and CRP of over um, 5 milligrams is uh, the key criterion. Diagnosis is made difficult because every patient with respect to um, is different with respect to absolute or um, relative iron deficiency. It is recommended to use um, soluble transferrin receptor, uh, receptor and increased ferritin index to be used. But due to these differences, the proportion of absolute and uh, relative iron deficiency is different in um, every case, so diagnosis is very difficult. There is no laboratory test standard for diagnosing iron deficiency in patients with inflammation. Treatment approaches include uh, the administration of iron supplements. Achieving remission of IBD is highly desirable, but not sufficient. So uh, uh, iron supplementation is necessary. The mode depends on another um, uh, on um, a number of factors. For uh, mild IBD, um, iron supplements can be taken per However, Iron absorption needs to be considered as well as issues of tolerance and, as you understand, the um, content of absorbed um, iron is much less compared to the content of um, a single salt tablet. In some cases, unabsorbed um, salts can provoke uh, inflammatory um, diseases of the intestines. According to ECHO guidelines, oral iron supplements at a dose of not more than 100 milligrams per day are indicated for mild anemia in the absence of tolerance to these drugs. So new dosage forms have been um, have emerged in the past few years, including sucrosomial iron, which is better tolerated by patients. Daily intake of iron supplements boosts hepcidine levels, so alternating regimens are frequently used, which are effective and have fewer adverse effects. Oral iron supplements can also um, impact the uh, bowel microbiota. So efficacy and safety for oral iron supplements need further studies. 
through randomized trials. Medications that bridges the gap between um, uh, oral and non-oral iron supplements is um, sucrosome. It uh, the sucrosome structure, uh, sucrosomal um, iron, is absorbed by the pyre glands. It's transported with lymph and is delivered to the target site. Sucrosomal iron almost doesn't affect uh, hepcidine and, uh, and can be used in case of elevated hepcidine levels to a certain extent. Iron pyrophosphate does not interact with the duodenal mucosa, and the phospholipid membrane may inhibit, may exhibit anti-inflammatory properties. So, sterile um, forte can be used uh, in patients refractive to other iron supplements. Intravenous iron supplements are being used more actively at present. They are more effective and safer compared to first-generation medications. So patients with severe enemy may benefit from this type of drug, which are a medication of choice. Their effectiveness was displayed in several meta-analyses, and they can be seen as uh, the first line of um, therapy in case of um, hemoglobin of less than uh, 100 per liter. And uh, if uh, erythropoiesis regulators are indicated, this is the ECHO scheme for estimating iron requirements, a standard scheme for IBD patients that depends on the patient's uh, body mass and uh, hemoglobin level. Iron supplements can be divided into uh, three groups, iron sucrose complex drugs, iron maltosate, and iron dextran. Despite the obvious advantages, oral medications still serve as the first-line drugs in patients with IBD in the USA. In Europe, intravenous administration is um, more frequently practiced. So, to conclude this part of my presentation, let me reiterate that um, experts recommend further studies to develop recommendations um, for treatment of iron deficiency in patients with IBD, including oral medications. Due to the fact that iron supplements have shown low efficacy in ACD, it is recommended that erythropoietin should be administered, which improves the treatment Efficacy. In IBD patients, the uh, algorithm for treating iron deficiency includes intravenous iron as the first uh, line therapy plus uh, EPO drugs. So, um, the treatment um, algorithm begins with screening. Iron supplements are uh, prescribed uh, together with EPO, and uh, treatment is uh, uh, conducted 
uh, with compulsory screening. Transfusion of um, erythrocytes is um, uh, indicated in case of hemodynamic uh, instability and severe anemia. Um, patients with um, active inflammation um, uh, uh, Bowel inflammations are not um, uh, eligible for this treatment. Um, MPT patients uh, may have vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiencies uh, uh, in patients with Crohn's disease, involvement of the mucous membrane of the small intestine. Um, is also important. The clinical and laboratory signs are non-specific. They include neurological and, psych uh, and, uh, and psychic mental complaints and conditions, particularly in um, the elderly patients. Every fifth patient is um, uh, one that has neuropsychic complaints and disorders. Another criterion for vitamin 12 deficiency is uh, hyperhomocysteinemia. And in connection with this, recommendations of experts are um, call for the uh, assessment of vitamin B2 and um, folate levels at least once a year. Treatment is uh, conducted um, using the acceptable uh, standards for life. It's a lifelong treatment. Hemolytic anemia and the Fisher syndrome develop fairly rarely. They are uncommon and uh, more often occur with ulcerative colitis. It is attributed to antibodies with cross resistance to erythrocytes or to hemolytic uh, effect of sulfur salicine. Apart from the aggressive treatment of the uh, main disease, the um, treatment includes um, steroids, surgery, immunosuppressants, and biological drugs. Anemia can also be a consequence of myelosuppression caused by leukosis, leukemia, lymphoproliferative diseases. Uh, the frequency of myelodysplastic syndrome in um, uh, IBD patients is uh, five to seven times higher than in the general population. Increase in the frequency of hematologic malignancies can also be attributed to chromosomal um, abnormalities. Anemia is the most uh, frequent uh, extra-intestinal manifestation of the inflammatory bowel disease, which negatively affects the um, prognosis. Screening includes uh, full blood crown, uh, count, um, assessment of the levels of reticulocytes, ferritin, transferrin, saturation, uh, the level of vitamin B12 and folic acid. Most often, Iron uh, deficiency is um, present in, in patients with anemia. It is treated with um, oral um, iron supplements, including sacrosomal iron, erythropoietin, uh, vitamin B2, and folic acid um, replenishment can also be recommended. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexander, for your brilliant presentation. Alexander, I would like to use this opportunity um, and to ask you the following question as an illustrious expert in this field. When a gastroenterologist or um, a therapeutist dealing with uh, patients with IBD and or anemia needs to prescribe iron supplements. 
Is there a level of hemoglobin or erythrocytes when uh, therapy is indicated? When is it not indicated? When is it not compulsory? Thank you, Yuri. It's a very important question. I would like to point out the different criteria Diagnostic criteria can be applied to iron deficiency. The standard WHO criteria are less than 15 grams per milliliter, less than 30 is more is a cutoff that is uh, that has more sensitivity and specificity. Even minus anemia. Iron supplements need to be prescribed in case of iron deficiency. If it's a non-inflammatory bowel disease that we're dealing with, the problem is a diagnostic one, not so much a clinical one. In the presence of anemia, uh, the um, iron deficit without anemia, endoscopic examination is indicated. The 2020 guidelines, national guidelines, require that men of any age and women uh, in the menopausal age colon, uh, should be given colono and gastroscopy. Thank you very much. Since my student years, I remember that if it's B12 deficient anemia, the patient needs Sancobalamine um, as a supplement. What about um, iron deficiency? If uh, we have um, replenished the um, iron levels, does that mean that we should discontinue iron supplements? Or do we need some supporting therapy uh, on a low dose? There is some discrepancy between recommendations that um, existed in 2014 and uh, the current recommendations. The old version, which I like much more, postulated that mild anemia required three months of um, iron supplements, moderate anemia four and a half months, Severe six months. The uh, recent recommendations offer different cutoffs, and they call for normalization of hemoglobin and the attainment of the target uh, levels for ferritin. The difference between uh, Russian and um, international recommendations are that Russian recommendations call for the level of 40, 60. International uh, 100. I suggest using the second control number for discontinuing iron supplements, ferritin of over 100 nanograms per milliliter. And then you need to follow up the patient and, if necessary, repeat the treatment. Thank you very much, Alexander, for this fantastic addition for this fantastic contribution, which is highly relevant to gastroenterologists and to anyone that works with um, the uh, in the field, because anemia is an obligatory component of IBD. Thank you. Dear colleagues, and now let us continue our work. Um, we are looking forward to the presentation by Alexander Smirnov, who has recently joined us. Hello, Alexander. I am giving the floor to Alexander. Alexander. He is the representative of a multidisciplinary team that should follow up IBD patients. He is an endoscopist, as Professor Shifrin Alek mentioned, to judge about the remission of IBD. Oh, we may not achieve histological remission, we may not have uh, lab references, but it's a compulsory to have clinical conclusion and 
and the scorpid conclusion as well. Clinical and endoscopic remissions, uh, they are decisive in this respect. The opportunities of modern endoscopy in the treatment of colonic epithelial tumors associated with IBD. Thank you for the suggestion for offering me the floor. Endoscopy is an inseparable part of both primary diagnostic and following up to assess uh, their treatment. What phases do we need? What phases we go through? It's a discussion and primary preparation. Without this, there won't be the diagnosis of the disease, there won't be the removal of uh, their medication of this uh, tumor. When we first see the patient, we follow up the patients with, uh, uh, that have the diagnosis and then removal of the tumors that uh, we have in the colon in the background of inflammatory disease. It's very important. It's an inseparable part colonoscopy. What do the European uh, Society of Endoscopy say? Some points that are being discussed. It's not recommended to use the diet with the low fiber content, content, uh, content uh, more than uh, in 24 hours before manipulation. It's not recommended to use animals. Semiticone is recommended uh, because. Uh, Bubbles and forms form in more than 50% of patients who come for colonoscopy, and in this case, their diagnosis quality is deteriorating. Very important point, the split mode, we can't do without this. There is no need uh, to prove this, and split dose of a medication will lead to a positive effect, regardless of the volume of the uh, medication. Why it's better to prepare IBD patients with the split mode? Oh. It enhances uh, their percentage of well prepared bowel. It decreased gaggling. Patients usually come to colonoscopy repeatedly. It increased compliance. Patients come to uh, their procedure frequently, and we have to create a good impression about uh, the preparations. Uh, the low volume medications, uh, they are more, they have higher compliance, they significantly less impact on activity of patients at work. For example, these uh, perfect medications, more prep. And of course, it's better tolerated comparing to four liters of medications with the good results. A split dose is recommended in IBD patients sir, together with the patients who is not suffering from IBD, patients with another pathology. This split dose does work in IBD patients. This data, that split mode, when uh, one takes uh, the second dose of uh, medication, 
uh, before several hours, uh, in several hours for endoscopy. Patients may have strictures of their small bowels, they may have uh, the Crohn's disease, this increases their aspiration risks. If the process is active, oral preparation is not indicated because uh, there may be side effects, uh, there may be disease exacerbation and uh, mucosa damage may happen. It amounts to 6%. Mostly medications based on phosphate may lead to this. As to the assessment of the quality of preparation, there are different scales. We use Boston scale that is widely spread to, uh, uh, to assess uh, their quality of preparation. And we have the 0, 1, 2, and 3. The maximum point is 9. If uh, 9 points is given to a patient, uh, their colon is prepared perfectly. 0 is uh, poorly prepared. As to a diet, as to fasting and uh, low fiber, fiber-free diet, there are two groups of patients. On the left, we have patients who follow on a, a watery diet, and on the right, uh, patients with a fiber-free diet. Nausea was more frequent in fasting patients. And moreover, as to the uh, results of bowel preparation, group patients with a fiber-free diet turned out to be better, or 81%, comparing to 52% who were uh, fasting. Uh, there is no need for fasting, it's my, my uh, acquisition uh, in Japan. When I was in Japan, in a drugstore, there may be a, a, one may appear by these ready-made meals without thinking uh, what is uh, prohibited, what is not prohibited. Uh, also, there are devices uh, that allow for rapid uh, cleaning of poorly prepared colons, and we can clean everything uh, that we see in the bowel. And the first meeting, the first visit, it should be said that without endoscopy to make a diagnosis of IBD is impossible. It's a necessary thing, necessary diagnostic tool. We know that there are clear symptoms of uh, UC and uh, Crohn's disease. This endoscopic view in ulcerative colitis is characterized with the diffuse uh, inflammation with granulation. And uh, the Crohn disease has a different picture. There may be strictures. Uh, any parts of the GIT can be involved. Uh, strictures are formed. No one symptom is a specific one. In case of Crohn disease, uh, the upper gastrointestinal tract is involved. Uh, is the esophagus and the duodenum is impaired in, case, uh, in less than 20 percent, but uh, the patient uh, should go uh, through colonoscopy and gastroscopy in case of Crohn's disease. Terminal ileitis is always Crohn's disease. Uh, we can't exclude uh, UC in case of pancolitis. In a high percentage of cases, in a case of Crohn's disease, terminal ileitis was detected, but only in those who had pancolitis. In left side ulcerative colitis, uh, there were no cases of terminal ileitis. It's a ascending ileitis with the involvement of the jejunum. And 
backwash elites. Uh, backwash elites, what's the difference between black backwash elites and Crohn's disease? In osteoritis disease, uh, there is a short part, uh, borderline uh, with the sarcom. In a Crohn disease, mostly uh, there, uh, we have the involvement of the jejunum, ileitis in case of uh, in the case of the absence of pancreatitis and there may be uh, the structures of the ileum it's how the Crohn disease looks like the structure of the ascending part of the colon it's impossible to pass the endoscope through uh, this structure is an isolated structure like the shown on the skin following up recommendation of the European Society of Endoscopy uh, the important thing that is necessary to perform the endoscopy it's recommended it's a recommended chrome endoscopy chrome endoscopy without uh, using difficult system standardized one with indigo carmine or methylene blue why is it necessary to enhance the level of dysplasia especially in case of patients who suffer for colitis for a long time alternative is a random biopsy with the samples of uh, in four quadrants in every 10 centimeters it's a random biopsy it's a scheme how, how many samples are to be taken it's a tendency in bioscopy in a Barrett esophagus as well it's a targeted approach we use high quality device to assess the whole mucosa to use enhancement and to uh, take samples only from the part that is changed not to cover every 10 centimeters of the bowel and it covers less than uh, one percent for one episode of dysplasia oh, we have to take 1266 random biopsies it's a very labor-intensive work and now endoscopy so they suggest not to do this non-target biopsies because it's not productive uh, we are afraid of uh, their uh, malignancies in their colon epithelial one especially or oh, we are concerned uh, when the length of the disease are more than eight ten years if we find these polyps are uh, its endoscopic dissection in a sub mucous layer ESD why dissection because uh, the border lines are not clear margins are not clear uh, we have to remove this end block intensive fibrosis of the sub a mucous layer and it's not always possible to uh, remove uh, this lesion uh, with a loop it's a Japanese definition uh, of their uh, colon and rectal cancer uh, this technology when their uh, lesion is elevated uh, with the injection of the uh, fluid then some mucosal decision uh, removal is made and the whole lesion is removed and blocked why it's a ESD because unlike loop resection uh, 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 this uh, radicality of this operation is higher the relapses uh, may occur in two percent of cases in ESD and in 15 percent of cases if uh, you do conventional resection uh, these methods also exist like a laparoscopic partial resection of the colon it's faster less um, complications so the patients become more active earlier and uh, the cost 
uh, five or uh, six times uh, lower comparing to laparoscopic operations. So we are talking of ESD. In a case of a loop resection, we can see the enhancement of the legion. And we have the reduction the percentage uh, from from 66 up to 12 percentage, uh, depending on their size of the lesion. In ESD, uh, their percentage of success is higher. It's how their uh, specimen looked like. Removed specimen. It's a villous tumor, nine centimeters, and block removal. It's a margin uh, that is marked with green. It's how we slice morphologically. We assess horizontal and vertical margin of the resection uh, to uh, define uh, the depth of invasion of the lesion and how the technique of this operation unclear lesion or all the uh, perilesional mucosa is changed uh, we inject uh, this epithelial lesion developed uh, in Crohn's disease or we use circular incision very thickened mucosa you can see whitish tissues extensive fibrosis all the difficulties uh, they are here, thicker, uh, poor margins, uh, it's extensive fibrosis. Uh, you can't remove this with a conventional loop resection. Initially, what is good, initially, with the help of additional methods, we uh, align uh, the margins with a knife and then we remove everything what is inside of our circular incision the tumor may be up to 15 centimeters it can be removed and blocked according to the guidelines uh, this is the finishing phase of the operation it is some uh, the specimen that we removed we see exophytes, growth, and even rough, changed mucosa. The margins are not clear. It's a typical sign of epithelial lesion that developed against uh, their background of uh, IBD. Our actions, our algorithm that we like assessment of the margin of the legion. If you can't see these border lines, we, uh, we have the proved pathologically proved lesion. It's uh, thought to be endoscopically irresectable, uh, so it should be uh, we should go to open surgery. But if their border lines are clear, uh, we can uh, remove this endoscopically, we make an attempt for endoscopic dissection, and depending on the results, dissection is good, because during diagnosis, uh, we shall to take biopsy uh, to exclude multifocal nature of our dysplasia. And if when we make samples around the lesion in a, a look like healthy tissues, we can uh, define the borderline of the lesion, lesion and uh, we can develop our tactics. Uh, in 25 patients, it's a real uh, uh, trial. In 10, uh, 10 of patients, the uh, colloctomy was made because uh, uh, their borderlines were unclear and they are followed for four or five years. Non lifting symptom. It's our lesion in black, we inject from the bottom 
subcutaneous, submucosal layer. It looks uh, very good. Uh, the lesion is elevated, but if it's not elevated completely, the lesion is still remains uh, where it was. Laterally, we see uh, their bubble. We say that due to some reasons uh, we can't elevate this tumor uh, because uh, when the lifting is good, uh, we remove this uh, very easily. No manigalization, we suspect. There may be full region like a tablet. We elevated this lesion like a tablet. Submucosal sub uh, layer is intact, but problems inside of the lesion. And uh, there is a semi uh, elevated effect when there is uh, their invasion of lesion into the submucosal layer. It's a non lifting symptom, no movement after injection, mostly. It shouldn't be assessed as an easy case. Uh, there may be severe fibrosis or maybe invasion. This kind of patient should be referred to surgeons. Thank you so much, dear colleagues. I have finished the presentation. Thank you, distinguished Alexander. There are several questions. First question. Uh, if a patient on treatment achieved endoscopic remission according to guidelines of the gastro associations and the scientific society, endoscopic society of Russia, how frequently shall he go for control endoscopic uh, manipulations. The situation here, uh, uh, they are needed, endoscopic uh, procedures are needed to a patient. Oh. We know that there is no always direct relation between endoscopic uh, picture and clinical symptoms. Uh, we do need to follow the patient up. Uh, the time frame, I think it's uh, the question to you as a therapist, gastroenterologist, not, uh, it's a question not to endoscopists. Uh, if remission uh, takes place, we shall to control it. The second question, much has been said today about routine of patients. Oksana announced uh, the capability of the first medical university named by Pavlov and initiative made by Professor Bagne Bagnenko as to the improvement of IBD diagnosis uh, treatment. Doctors are asking, are there any opportunities to use Im immunohistochemistry in their university named by Pavlov, because it's necessary and it's laid down in uh, the reimbursement procedure. Thank you. I think it's uh, more for Oksana rather than for me. We don't do this as a routine practice, but if it's necessary, we can do this, or we can uh, perform immunohistochemistry. We have all the capability in our clinic. Thank you, Alexander. You have a very beautiful map behind you uh, with the whole this world. It uh, means uh, that uh, very soon borders will be open, the pandemics of COVID uh, will finish, and it illustrates our hopes and expectations. Thank you for your presentation, for your cooperation, and we hope for new productive meetings. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, we continue our work. And now, uh, with my pleasure, I invite and give the floor to Ruslav Dreval.
repeatedly. Uh, we have met in different fora, in different uh, venues with Ruslan. I am always impressed by his uh, way of presenting of economic aspects of uh, uh, IBD treatment patients uh, with the GBD. And much has been said about this. The economic burden of managing patients with IBD. Of course, it's a very expensive therapeutic regimen quite burdensome for the healthcare system, and Ruslan will show the uh, results, the barriers, and uh, possible solutions to the problem. Уважаемые коллеги, уважаемые профессор, thank you for this introduction. In my brief report, I will concentrate on some of the social and economic aspects of providing GBT to patients with inflammatory bowel diseases. We clearly understand that modern pharmaceutical science has enabled us to expand our treatment opportunities, and GBD has changed the landscape of treatment, changed treatment approaches, and our opportunities for taking control over the disease, as well as improve our patient's prognosis. When addressing social and economic aspects and public health arrangements, I would like to focus on a simple thing, understanding exactly how many patients we have. Unfortunately, at present, the problem of effective uh, patient monitoring and the evaluation, the estimation of the patient population with um, shared pathogenetic processes and mechanisms. We understand that the absence of federal registers the absence of monitoring experience 
It makes it difficult for us to understand where we are. The studies conducted for the past several years have indicated a number of discrepancies between expert assessments and the official statistics. However, the regional registers and the estimates provided by um, studies show that um, our um, population is quite sizable and one that requires further studies so that we are able to better understand the amount of funding that is required to control the disease. Like many other diseases, display a high degree of comorbidity, including skin lesions, joint lesions. And this is also a problem that we need to understand. So interdisciplinary interaction between different groups of physicians is absolutely required because patients with IBD and joint complaints require comprehensive care by gastroenterologists and rheumatologists if we are to choose our management tactic wisely. These studies over the past three years have indicated that IBD such as uh, Crohn's disease and um, ulcerative colitis are a heavy financial burden for the state, comparable to rheumatoid arthritis and closing spondylitis, which proves that effective medical care arrangements, including modern therapeutic options such as GBD, is becoming highly relevant. And this brings us to another problem that is frequently referred to, one of access to GBD and immune depressants. So we need to understand exactly how many patients we need to um, provide the, these medications for. Rheumatological and dermatological problems patients with rheumatological um, problems are covered by GBD just by 6%. However, the actual percentage of patients that need this treatment measures upwards of 10%. So at present, we have a large amount of unmet needs in biological therapy. As far as immunoinflammatory diseases like IBD are concerned, the picture is much more complex because we know that IBD are more severe and um, they are associated with more severe symptoms. So a larger proportion of patients requires GBD. Only 13% um, of um, patients with Crohn's disease uh, receive uh, GBD. However, the overall need in such medication is um, estimated at 20 to 30%. So every fourth or every third patient with Crohn's disease may potentially need GBD. 
уровень финансирования как необходимой From what we know, the um, onset of the disease falls on the productive age, on a young age, and results in severe disability. And correspondingly, economic and social costs. So the state experiences um, a lot of problems as a result. The family experiences a lot of problems as a result. So it's a burden. About 10 billion for each of the uh, nosologies is the money that we catastrophically need to cover um, the treatment gaps for our patients. The IBD burden is comparable to um, that of the um, mammarian gland or lung cancer. And of course, it underscores the importance of providing adequate medical care and treatment treatment to patients with IBD. The tasks that we are facing are to do with resolving issues of um, drug access, drug safety, drug efficacy, and cost effectiveness. So the um, federal funding needs to be adequate and it needs to capture the um, whole patient population that is in need of GBD. At present, we have at our disposal a broad spectrum of um, GBD and selective immunosuppressants in the Russian Federation. The biologic medications can be used to treat a number of diseases, not only gastroenterological, but rheumatological as well. At present, the selection of molecules that we have in our inventory enables us to provide enough opportunities for us to uh, control the disease. What resources do we have to cover our patient population with meds? So, um, the, uh, State guarantees provide for medication reimbursement, uh, scheme number one, and scheme number two is compulsory insurance. Federal law 188, the so-called federal concession, enables us to include patients in the social groups or disability groups and make them eligible for um, receiving adequate treatment. Another decree, Degree 890 from 1994, enables the non-working people with disability group 1 to be provided with medication at the expense of uh, the regional funds, regional budgets. Another channel is the compulsory health insurance, CBD, 
can be prescribed by inpatient and daycare centers. That make it possible to prescribe immunosuppressants and GBD. To patients with IBD in particular. I would also like to talk about the high-tech state-of-the-art medical care with GBD. This year we have seen serious changes in the legal framework applicable to federal and local health care facilities whereby treatment can be provided through the uh, basic um, obligatory health care insurance program. The patients with IBT can have access to treatment. Unfortunately, there are a number of barriers, the most serious of them being the criterion of disability. So the patient has to have a disability status, which I think is unfair. The use of modern GBT enables the healthcare practitioners to prevent patient disability. It's a vicious circle. A lot of discussions uh, have been undertaken. The existing legal framework, however, refers to disability as a key selection criterion for uh, GBT eligibility. So there is another um, treatment channel. Um, hospitals can uh, prescribe GBD um, if the patient can be consistent with the description of uh, um, certain clinical groups. So we see that in general, what in the daycare centers as well as um, inpatient clinics, весомые суммы заложены для компенсации введения лекарственных препаратов биологической терапии, которые компенсируют И в заключение я хотел бы сказать, что конечно, like conclude, одним из таких сложных проблем and I'm not even um, talking about um, HR problems or routing, patient routing problems, which are crucial. Um, I'm not even talking about um, effective diagnosis um, or routing for counseling um, to specialists. Administration of the correct therapy enables uh, the um, healthcare practitioners to preclude patient disability, prevent patient disability. For every subject, it's uh, important to build a system for treatment provision using all possible channels. Initiation of uh, GBD requires serious laboratory diagnostic and instrumental methods and here it, it would be advisable to use uh, the capacities of day, daycare hospitals. And then as you root the patient, you need to understand and evaluate opportunities for further treatment. And whether patients are eligible for GBD.
that the patient has disability status. It will be possible for them to um, receive GBT as part of their outpatient treatment. For younger patients, younger patients can um, be prescribed GBT by daycare centers for as long as necessary, often for life. Outpatient facilities can provide targeted care as part of um, federal law 322 in the presence of serious um, life-threatening indications. The medications can be procured in this case through federal budget. The major problem here is, as I have said, underfinancing, underfunding. The patients need verification to a larger extent. We need to be uh, clearer about the um, size of the patient population. We need more data on that. And I would like to um, switch on to the next slide and go to the conclusions. I would like to conclude by saying that the economic burden of ulcerative colitis, as I have said, amounts to um, around 40 billion rubles a year, of CD um, around 33 billion rubles a year. Patients with IBD are underprovided with GBD. It's it's important to create a federal register. Many regions across Russia have their own local registers. But to be able to establish the uh, level of funding required for treating the patient population, we need to have a good, reliable picture of the um, number and um, of such patients and the severity of the disease. To resolve these organizational and methodological problems, it is advisable to expand a network of uh, the Russian IBD diagnostics and care centers. This organizational model would uh, enable us to create a system of uh, human resource scale-up. And human resource is a major Issue. So, organizational, methodological, and uh, research and development um, works need to support this activity. And this is the problem that I would like the professional community to address because the centralized development of IBT um, centers across the Russian Federation is a dire need which will enable us to prevent disability and to preserve people's health. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, allow me to give the floor to our next presenter, Tatiana Shoshurina, uh, whose, uh, whose presentation is the activity of the, um, the uh, activity of the Society for Support of Patients with IBD confidence. IBD is not a sentence. Together we win. So how do we take control of the disease? How do we provide for the decent quality of life for our patients? Tatiana, you have the floor.
уважаемые коллеги, прежде чем Татьяна начнет Татьяна start her presentation, I'd like to recollect uh, the saying of uh, Professor Almazov, who says uh, that heart can be treated only by heart. IBDs can be treated only by heart as well. Tatiana uh, chairs uh, their public organization, Daveria Confidence. She has the very cordial heart, and her activity is aimed at all the possible barriers to be taken over so that the patients with IBD can receive proper treatment, diagnostic opportunities. It's a well-being, it's a great mission, it's a divine activity. It's not fortuitous that Tatiana is with us, and I can't but say these words from the bottom of my heart. Yuri, I am very thankful for this introduction. Thank you so much for invitation. I'll start uh, to familiarize you with our organization. Our organization was established in 2011. Uh, this year we are celebrating 10 years of anniversary. We are the only organization in Russia uh, who su that supports uh, patients with the IBD and short bowel syndrome. Now, oh, we unite patients from 47 regions of Russia. We have in these regions our uh, representation. Uh, there uh, may be uh, the patients themselves or their relatives. Uh, the confidence organization has uh, the representation in the All Russian Uni Union of Patients, in the All Russian Society of Open Diseases, and in 2018 we joined the European Federation of Crohn's and Ulcerative Colitis Association, EFCA. Uh, we have defined uh, the following purposes, the following tasks that will help our patients to improve their quality of life, uh, will help to achieve uh, the timely diagnosis, and of course, uh, medical provision. It's uh, timely diagnostics, availability of specialists. Much has been said about this by experts before me. We understand that all these purposes, all these tasks, and experts, specialists in IBD, we look at the same direction. We don't contradict each other. We don't contradict. Our tasks are not contradicting uh, their goals that we are to decide together. Are very important. Of course, it is social, psychological, and legal assistance to our patients that uh, at the end will improve the quality of life. Of course, it's consolidation of the patient community, it's uh, raising awareness and media coverage, it's interaction with authorities to resolve the issues of improving medical care and patient routing. Uh, we will provide some solutions to the problems of helping patients, although much has been said about them. Of course, uh, the raising of knowledge, in, uh, knowledge of primary care medical provision as to IBD and short bowel syndrome, SBS, as well as the improvement of diagnostics Right uh, diagnosis, uh, fair diagnosis, will be very important for the quality of life of our patients. A correct therapy at 
certain and proper time, our patients, usually young people, they um, become family uh, members. It's very important that they uh, go up career ladder. Uh, their uh, decision uh, of uh, the problem with medical provision we see uh, through the inclusion of uh, modern medications for treatment of uh, IBD and SBS in the uh, some medical problem programs. Uh, these patients with IBD, they are quite frequent. Uh, we shall incorporate uh, their uh, experience of St. Petersburg. Inclusion of IBD and SBS in regional programs of list of orphan diseases. All our patients, they receive the medications regardless of their disability status. In December 2015, uh, there uh, these IBDs, Crohn disease and uh, ulcerative colitis, we participated in this. And uh, this uh, is considered as a social important disease. Such regional pro programs in other regions, uh, they are being developed uh, in Karelia, in Irkutsk, in Tatarstan. But mostly our patients, they can receive medications, reimburse medications only if they have their disability status. And it's a very surreal pity. Much has been said about uh, their establishment of this single register so that to understand the financing issues, uh, their volume of medical care that is to be provided. Much has been said about this, but because uh, we have been talking much and to, uh, it uh, has been done much about this. Uh, this federal register will be established through all the regions. We uh, raise awareness through the informative schools for our patients up to 13 per year uh, with involvement of different specialists. Uh, for the second year, uh, we uh, organize uh, this schools online, uh, they are registered and they are uploaded to our uh, channel. Uh, these schools are break down according to the topics. Our patients can listen to the specialists and not to give each other advice against this. Inclusion of our regional representatives uh, into their uh, public councils in the subjects of the Russian Federation has given the opportunity to, to put the message across, put the problems across about uh, the medical provisions to the subjects of the medical care of the Russian Federation. Very briefly, I will talk about some main events because our organization uh, is 10 year old, uh, we haven't stopped our activities. In 2014, we started the program Stomach Pain. What if this is IBD aimed uh, to improve diagnosis? On our site, uh, we have the anonymous questionnaire uh, that uh, uh, Every day, a huge amount of people, uh, they answer the question and they, uh, having scored a certain amount of points, they understand that they should uh, 
make an appointment with a gastroenterologist and uh, go through certain diagnostic procedures. We participate in the work of the expert council on IBD under the Council of the Russian Federation on Commu uh, Federation Committee on Social Policy. We participate in annual organization of. Um, we participate in the meetings of the Committee for Public Health of the State Duma of the Russian Federation. Uh, since this year, we are members uh, of the Public Council to protect the right of patients. We have the meeting with the head of the Federal Medical and Social Examination Bureau with Mikhail Dimachka that deal with the um, uh, disability stated provision. And since 2020, we have the order 585M. Uh, as to disability status granting to patients of IBD, uh, there are a list of criteria. The therapeutic regimens are taken into account during this uh, uh, assessment. And I am very grateful to Mr. Shinigin. Uh, because uh, amendments have been made to criteria of classification. Now uh, we have the feedback from the patients if uh, uh, they have uh, if they have their uh, their status of uh, disability to be rejected. Uh, but uh, it's a very very rare case. On the 19th of May, it's a day of a uh, real day of IBD. We have assess, access, assessed. We become members of this uh, activity for five years. We highlight the important uh, social objects with a violet color to attract attention to. Uh, to the problems of IBD patients, to increase the media coverage, to raise awareness at uh, different levels as well as the business levels. We have different requests uh, from uh, the media, from TV, uh, different um, funds uh, have been collected for um, our patients. Uh, we still continue our work. We don't stop. What else I'd like to say in conclusion? We can't prevent the spread of IBD, but we can improve the quality of life of our patients. Thank you so much. I will be happy if you still continue to involve us in these conferences, to invite us to the conferences, because uh, the outlook of a patient is very important to you as a doctors, as, as doctors, as experts and specialists. Uh, distinguished Tatiana, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, the role of Tatiana is very difficult to estimate. It's a very famous person in St. Petersburg in Russia. She has applied a great deal of efforts to uh, make this problem known and to make uh, the voice of IBD patients heard. The right therapy, the right surveillance of a patient is very important. Huge, huge thanks to you, Tatiana, for your support. Uh, for uh, your talk at our meeting, at our event. Dear colleagues, allow me to present the presentation on the clinical characteristics of patients with IBD from St. Petersburg. Of course, St. Petersburg is a city uh, with the it's specific features of routing of patients with IBD and healthcare provision. In St. Petersburg, there are two specialized centers of IBD. The hospital number 31 
And since April this year, uh, the IBD Center has become the hospital uh, by Great Elizabeth. The routine of patients is based on the territorial principle. An important feature of uh, the therapeutic approach to um, patients is that patients can have supporting therapy um, on the concession basis, on the reimbursed basis. In the past few years, the problem of IBD is being paid increasingly more attention by uh, the healthcare committee. In 2020, Chief Gastroenterologist of the um, Healthcare Committee, Professor Uspensky, conducted monitoring of um, specialized healthcare provision to IBD patients. The monitoring included uh, 42 healthcare centers. Data for over a thousand patients um, with IBD were studied that were followed up within the framework of routine care. The uh, uh, IBD um, center of St. Petersburg um, was not evaluated as part of the monitoring because we were interested in uh, the routine care. Three quarters of our patients received outpatient care. A quarter was submitted to inpatient care. The median age for ulcerative colitis was uh, somewhat higher compared to patients with uh, Crohn's disease. The, both diseases are shifting towards the younger age. So it is not possible any longer to say that IBD is a young disease. As far as the gender structure is concerned, Women displayed a small majority. The GIT uh, lesions for Crohn disease and for um, ulcerative colitis were somewhat different. One quarter of the patients had um, terminal ileitis, 36 ileocolitis, 34 colitis. Other lesions were observable in just 3% of the cases. As far as ulcerative colitis is um, concerned, left-sided um, colitis was um, observable in 57% of the patients, 23% uh, um, of the patients uh, had uh, total colitis 21 proctitis. As to the severity of the disease, um, the mild severity was observable in uh, one third of the patients, but um, severe um, progression of the disease, severe forms of the disease were um, present in um, Crohn disease more often than in patients with ulcerative colitis. Operations, um, surgical treatment um, were um, conducted five times more often uh, in patients with Crohn disease compared with ulcerative colitis, which is predictable. Treatment approaches are regulated by guidelines of the Ministry of Health and the Russian Gastroenterological Association. Approaches to therapy are defined by the um, localization 
and uh, the uh, severity of the attack. In case of uh, mild and uh, moderate attacks, um, Fire for ASA was used rectally. For severe attacks, glucocorticosteroids um, were um, used, uh, along with immunosuppressants, if necessary. As far as Crohn disease is concerned, 5 ASA is used much less often, and they're used for um, mild attacks. In other cases, Systemic or topical um, corticosteroids um, should be used, and uh, GBD. This is the um, step up principle in therapy, which implies the pr uh, progression from. Uh, from one form of treatment to the other, progressing uh, from one, uh, from 5 ASA to uh, GBD. The selection of medications is quite uh, considerable, so um, it is almost always possible to choose the medications best suited to the individual conditions of the patient. In terms of uh, alternative colitis, 5 ASA uh, was mostly used orally, less often rectally. Rectal 5 ASA was administered um, mostly um, in outpatient settings compared with inpatient settings. Thetostatics were um, often used in, um, in hospitals, uh, corticosteroids ditto, GBD accounted for only a small proportion of the um, cases, and it was mostly administered in specialized centers. Crohn disease, just as with ulcerative colitis, 5 ASA um, were used orally most of, uh, in most of the cases. Rectally, um, not very commonly. More often, cytostatics and immune suppressants were used because their role in treating Crohn's disease is higher compared with ulcerative colitis. The proportion of um, patients who routinely obtained GBD was also somewhat higher. It is instructive to compare our data with other studies uh, conducted in Russia. Two major studies were conducted, have been conducted in Russia, ESCAPE and ESCAPE-2, ESCAPE in 2011, ESCAPE-2 uh, 2013 14 The uh, patients came from several regions across Russia. So we could compare the data for St. Petersburg and the national data. What we see is that in St. Petersburg, the median, of patient, the median patient age was higher for um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease because um, St. Petersburg has an older population compared with many other regions across Russia. GIT uh, lesions were somewhat different. In our study, total colitis was lower compared to um, that captured by ESCAPE and ESCAPE-2. As far as Crohn uh, disease is concerned, Iliitis was less frequent compared to escape and escape two data. As for the disease development, the proportion of patients with mild stages of the um, disease was 16 for um, colitis, uh, 21 for Crohn's disease, uh, 
um, that um, that escape in St. Petersburg, 38 and 60, uh, 36 respectively. This was probably due to the um, therapy that was adequate to the treatment conditions. Another predictable discovery was that over time, the number of patients on continuous anti-relapse um, therapy is increasing. For escape, this proportion was 50 to um, 60 percent. In our study, 96 percent. Almost all patients were uh, receiving follow-up care and uh, receiving the adequate treatment to ensure high quality of life. Comparison of data across ESCAPE 1, ESCAPE 2 and our study shows that time factors are of importance uh, because over time approaches to treatment and patient routing are improving both in Russia and the world. Patient management is getting better. More effective management patterns are being suggested and validated. What key conclusions can be made on the basis of this study? There are some differ differences and some similarities um, as to the landscape of IBD in St. Petersburg and nationwide. 5-ASA medications are extensively used. Also, they are not, their use is not evidence-based for Crohn's disease. Rectal forms for 5-ASK oh, no, for um, ulcerative colitis are underused. Most of the patients um, receive, uh, receive um, oral and rectal forms of 5 um, ASA. Immunosuppressants are also underused uh, with Crohn's disease. And as Yuri uh, mentioned here today, there is a necessity to create a single register of IBD patients because it will be a powerful tool of data analysis that will make it possible to analyze the um, size of the IBD population, what therapy they get, what approaches uh, work best for what settings. The combination of these um, factors, um, including uh, the severity, of course, has an impact on the patient's prognosis because uh, IBD treatment needs weighted approaches. Ulcerative colitis receives um, much attention in St. Petersburg. One proof is that um, uh, Professor Uspensky, Chief Gastroenterologist of St. Petersburg, developed a set of guidelines, including a section about Crohn disease diagnostic and treatment. The guidelines are based on uh, um, those proposed by the Russian Association of Gastroenterology. And they can be used as a textbook, as um, your routine reading for daily reference uh, to relieve um, any of the doubts um, with regard to treatment and patient management. The guidelines are available online on the um, gastroenterology service of St. Petersburg. You can see the QR code. Um, they are available for download. And um, you, um, so that you can have it on your computers, on your uh, tablets, and consult them if and when necessary. Dear colleagues, this is it. Thank you very much.
Позвольте представить слово Наталье Владимировне Барышниковой, кандидату медицинских наук, доценту. Now I give the floor to Natalia Barishnikova. The changes in intestinal microbiota in patients with IBD. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, to be a part of the conference. Allow me to present the results of our work. It's only the beginning of our work. I think we will continue to assess microbiota in IBD patients. Now I will share with you the results. Uh, first of all, about the relevancy of the uh, disturbances of microbiota in different diseases. The slide shows uh, the hazard that changed microbiota can cause a patient and what kind of diseases are associated with uh, changes in microbiota, obesity, diabetes mellitus, rheumatoid arthritis, colorectal cancer, multiple sclerosis, now the Crohn disease and ulcerative colitis in the pathogenesis has the disturbed microbiota, bowel microbiota. It's not a secret. Much has been said about this. And then, uh, the uh, dysbiotic Dysbiosis is in the pathogenesis of the IBD together with the environmental factors and changes in the immune system. Microbiota is the third trigger that can initiate IBD, both Crohn's disease and UC. Current molecular genetic studies prove that in case of IBD, always we see dysbiosis of GIT namely dysbiosis of the colon. Uh, we haven't seen uh, patients, IBD patients, uh, without dysbiosis of uh, the colon. I think uh, there are no such patients. The treatment to correct uh, the uh, dysfunctions microbiota is proved. What kind of patients to administer what kind of the treatment to administer to these patients, it has been said. The goal of our work is to assess the specific features of microbiota of IBD patients. Under our surveillance, uh, there were 22 patients with UC and Crohn's disease. Uh, they had uh, their stool examined to uh, detect uh, the changes in microbiota, we use PCR and statistic uh, handling of the results. It was not a surprise that in 100% of patients we detected uh, the different changes in, uh, in test, uh, gut microbiota. First of all, we found the changes in the normal flora or obligate flora that changes were the reduction in the lactobacillus in 68 of patient percent of patients in a half patients we saw the increase in a bifida bacterium in 15 patients and it's true not only for gastroenterology but it's uh, true for multiple sclerosis patients or parkinson disease patients we see the uh, changes in function of their uh, overall bacterial mass in 32 patients changes are uh, were seen in uh, in the level of uh, conditionally pathogenic microbes. Always so when we uh, examine patients with IBD, we detect the level of uh, Clostridium difficile, and we were surprised that patients uh, had in 80% uh, of patients they had uh, the Clostridium difficile present. Clostridium difficile infection is to be detected and actively treated. Otherwise, it will introduce changes to the mucus, mucosa of the colon and can deteriorate, exacerbate the diarrhea. Today, it has been said 
about uh, their role of candida in case of IBD and was mentioned by Professor Mikhail Shevekov. Uh, we saw uh, patients with candida in uh, the range of 23%. Of course, we were interested as to their uh, level of uh, conditionally pathogenic bacteria, and we saw Proteus vulgaris 24%, uh, Enterobacter 12%, and Cetobacter 29%. And I'd like to point out uh, the fourth point, Fusobacterium nucleatum and Parvimonas uh, micta. Fusobacterium nucleatum were detected in 18% and uh, the next bacterium in 27% of patients. Uh, let's talk about Fusobacterium nucleatum and Protheonus micrum. Of these two uh, pathogens, uh, they are uh, microbial markers of oncological process. If the person didn't have uh, this kind of bacteria detected, uh, and now it started to reveal this bacteria, uh, it's a case for um, conducting endoscopy and colonoscopy. We had the patient with the villus polypers uh, that were detected uh, during colonoscopy, and they have the level of Fusobacterium nucleatum elevated. The bad of the polyps, uh, they uh, are prone to malignization. Fusobacterium nucleatum, the most well-known oncomarker uh, that is detected in the feces, initially it's uh, the bacteria dominating in 400 types of bacteria of their uh, dental plug, mostly it's seen in the oral cavity, it may be uh, seen in anal, in GIT, and the upper respiratory way, or airways. It can be the reason for different uh, diseases, different diseases. Uh, it may be provoking uh, agent for the development of colorectal carcinoma. Padimonas micra can be the trigger of the oncopathology. Mostly it's aggregated with the uh, Fusobacterium nucleata, but can be seen in isolated form. Uh, this pathogen, uh, firstly, it was detected in the oral cavity and was considered as a microbe that caused inflammation in the oral cavity. What else I'd like you to show the comparison of medications uh, of patients who received biological therapy and those who didn't receive biological therapy. Patients who received biological therapy, even if they started to feel better, it didn't always lead to the restoration of microbiota. Nearly in 90% of patients who, re who were on biological treatment, they had the decreased level of lactobacils, they had bifidobacteria elevated, and bifidobacteria, they are elevated in patients on biological therapy, regardless of the disease, either it's a GIT disease or rheumatology disease, all the conditionally pathogenic microorganisms that we detected, they were increased in patients on biological therapy. Is the level of food, the bacteria nucleatum uh, was considerably high in both groups of patients. Uh, the level of promionus micra uh, was higher in group of patients on biological therapy. I'd like to present you the clinical case of a female patient she had a very interesting uh, symptomatic. Uh, she has suffered uh, the Crohn's disease since 2018. First, she received for short time during uh, examination 5 ASK and glucocorticosteroids without clear positive effect. Then she uh, was shifted to Ustekinumab for a year and a half. She was on remission. She felt good. In a year and a half, uh, their feces were 
examined to assess their microflora, the level of lactobacillus before and uh, before biological therapy of ustekinumab and after uh, the level was uh, decreased uh, beef bacteria are uh, a bit uh, low uh, the level of Escherichia coli uh, has gone up uh, their overall bacterial mass level changed uh, by bacteroides sermicutes on the treatment therapy the conditionally pathogenic microorganisms, Protecus smurgalis virutus, Fusobacterium nucleatus, and Clostridium difficile. All these uh, bacteria, they were elevated. The patient was under close observation. Uh, the endoscopy was performed. Uh, the patient, uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum, uh, in this young patient, maybe a uh, uh, early marker, but we didn't find any polyps or uh, oncological lesions in uh, the colon, uh, but we uh, decided to consider to assess uh, these uh, changes in microbiota. Uh, this patient, uh, we decided to administer meta prebiotics. Uh, they contain prebiotics, oligofructose, uh, that are the substrates for uh, bifidobacteria and lactobacils. If uh, fructose is present uh, during uh, the whole colon, uh, we have uh, their feed substrates for obligate microflora, and it leads to the restoration of microbiota. And these bacteria, they, uh, they are increased in numbers. A metabiotic is the calcium lactate, uh, the derivative of their uh, acid that leave uh, we have the maximum level of colonial resistance uh, the acid uh, defends uh, their bacteria the good bacteria suppressing bad bacteria and provides because microflora has uh, the protective properties it improves uh, the defense of the mucous layer of the colon, redu reduces inflammatory process, and reduces the level of pro-inflammatory cytokines. What we have, patients received the medication during 14 days, two tablets three times a day. We see that we have the elevated levels of bifida bacteria. We restored Escherichia coli. We reduced the overall bacterial burden. The bacteroid farmicutus ratio has restored. Conditionally pathogenic microorganism disappeared and even the clostridium difficulty has reduced the level has gone down we managed to make sure that this patient will never develop oncopathology polyps and other lesions after 14 uh, day of regimen of uh, meta probiotics it says uh, about the fact that patients with IBD should have uh, the medications to correct disturb microbiota. We have to go uh, individually and uh, to know what kind of uh, biotic to prescribe, metaprebiotic or others, to correct uh, the flora of the colon. The typical signs of dysbiosis of the colon, uh, the reduction in the level of lactobacils, uh, the elevation of the level of uh, conditionally pathogenic microorganism. Please uh, notice bacterium nucleatum and proteonus uh, 
fuzio na smisto, if you suspect uh, the changes in microbiota. According to the test results, uh, please provide uh, the certain treatment. If you see the uh, uh, F nucleatum and P micra elevated. Thank you for your attention. Uh, have a good evening. Dear colleagues, this is the end of our symposium. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank you all for your attendance. I would like to thank our fantastic presenters, our committed international colleagues that have made wonderful presentations. Thank you for so generously share, sharing your knowledge with the medical community. We have improved our competences. Now we know better how to diagnose and treat IBD. Thank you all. I would like to wish you success and productive work in our medical field. Thank you.